Hi there. Thank you for choosing to take this course. I'm absolutely convinced that if you have any interest whatsoever in trying out Django, that this course will be a fantastic platform for you to explore and grow. Obviously, I'm making a few assumptions about you as a developer. While these are not prerequisites to this course, it would be helpful for you to know who I think I'm talking to during these lectures. Some of my assumptions include that you have a background in WordPress or development in some capacity, that you have a basic understanding of programming principles, specifically in web development, that you are keen to further your career in web development by exploring other languages, and of course, that you are not afraid to get your hands dirty in some code. With that being said, I feel that it is important for us to jump right in, as the best way to learn is to do. To give you some context, I am using a text editor called Sublime Text for all of my code in this course. I am also working on a Mac, which should have Python and PHP pre-installed. If you are working on a Windows PC, and you do not already have Python installed on your PC, you can download and install Python from python.org forward slash downloads forward slash windows. Something else that will be very important is the command line. Again, if you're on a Windows, some of your commands will be slightly different to the Mac terminal. Because using the command line is such an integral part of Django and web development as a whole, I'm going to be working with this quite a bit. Although I'm going to be going through it at a walking pace, so you should be able to have no problems following along, it could also be a good idea for you to familiarize yourself with basic terminal commands to the point where you feel comfortable navigating between folders before continuing with this course. In this section, I would like to focus on the main differences between PHP and Python. And although I know that WordPress has an emphasis on the event cycle, hooks and filters, as opposed to object oriented principles when it comes to the basic implementation of functionality, whether it is in a theme or a simple plugin paradigm, I'll be discussing WordPress in the context of object oriented programming to fit in with Python and Django, as opposed to the other way around. Hi there. I know that jumping straight into the code may seem a bit daunting at first, but I feel that it is really important for you to have an understanding of the principles that we are going to be discussing at a granular level. Don't worry if you don't understand everything that I'm talking about straight away, because as the lectures go on, so I'll cover more and more pieces of the puzzle while continually refreshing the basics. I hope that by the end of this section that you will have a healthy understanding of the differences and similarities between Python and PHP, and that you are able to apply your knowledge of WordPress to the paradigm of Django and Python. PHP is an extremely flexible coding language that shares a lot of its syntax with the coding language C. It was designed as a web-based language and by implication is easily accessible and easy to learn for anyone on the web. Python, not so much. If I had to describe Python, I would not use the word flexible, but rather robust and extendable. This is because the Python community has a very specific agenda and prides itself on doing things the right way, programmatically, as opposed to however you want. This is not to say that PHP does not do this, but it tends to be more lenient in its application than Python does. Although there are a lot of major differences between the two languages, we'll be focusing on only what is relevant to this course. For me, the big one is syntax. Syntax is basically the key semantic elements of the language that help the interpreter figure out what you as a developer are trying to say. This ranges from where your spaces and indentation are to how to recognize where a line of executable code begins and ends. If you're still not clear about what I mean here, I'm going to give some practical examples in the next lecture. See you there. Hi, let's jump straight into the code. One of the first things that you will notice about Python is the fact that it is a very lean language. Unlike PHP, Python does not have semicolon line endings. Something else that Python does not make use of that is imperative in PHP is opening and closing curly braces. In Python, indentation is the replacement. In our code example, we will be looking at building a to-dos app. So let's start by creating a function called getList for both PHP and Python to demonstrate the differences that we have just spoken about. 
in PHP, you would create a function, e.g. get list, the following way. Now, you will notice that I'm setting a few parameters in Sublime Text specifically for PHP. The first of which is setting my syntax highlighting to PHP in this empty file, and the second being opening my PHP tags. Now, if I was to define a PHP function, I would use the word function, followed by the name of the function, followed by open close brackets, followed by these curly braces that I've been speaking about. Now, there is a lot about this that is specific to PHP, where again, as I mentioned in a previous lecture, lends itself from C. If I was to write the same function in Python, it would look a little bit different. For starters, let me set my syntax highlighting to Python. And secondly, you will notice that when I create my function, I'm doing it slightly differently. Oh, there we go. First mistake. So, what you will notice is for starters, instead of using the word function, I have used the word def, which stands for define or define function. Get list would be the name. Open close brackets as you would in PHP. The assumption here for both PHP and Python is that you may or may not want to pass parameters into this space. Now, what is interesting about Python is that instead of using these curly braces as one would with PHP, we instead simply go to the next line and make sure that this line is indented at least one tab space or two regular spaces in. From here, we can write the rest of our function. Now, what you will also notice which I did not show in the PHP example, was the fact that at the end of this line, we simply hit return and do not pass a semicolon as you would with PHP. Let me just quickly get the PHP function back. So this would be an example of a PHP function returning something. Now you notice it looks a bit funny because I don't have my syntax highlighting on. I always, always like to indent my functions regardless of the programming language. And then in Python, I would define my function as so. Now you will notice there are a few differences between these two function definitions. As we mentioned, the first being the semicolon at the end of every line of functional code. The second being that Python does not use curly braces while PHP does. The third, the word function has now been replaced in PHP versus Python to uh, def. You will also notice that there is a colon at the end of the function definition in Python. Now, the reason for this colon is not for functional functional purposes, but rather for display purposes and to indicate that there is going to be an indented code block following this. We could just as easily remove this followed and as long as our next line of code is indented, we could follow the function like this. I prefer to keep the colon here for the sake of best practices and for legibility. Hi, in this lecture, I'm going to talk briefly about classes and objects. If you do not already know or have an understanding of these concepts, I would highly recommend you doing a bit of your own research on them before moving forward. With that being said, I do feel obliged to give you a basic explanation, as I did say that we would be walking through this process slowly, and I would like this course to stand on its own without you having to do any additional research. So, the basic principle of a class. What is a class? A class is a template or a blueprint, blueprint of something specific. Because of this, it is easy to map a class to an example of something in the real world. 
An object is an instance of a class, or the creation of what is described in the blueprints. DNA is an excellent real-world example of a class, or blueprint, as it specifically defines the attributes of something. Hair color, eye color, number of limbs, etc. As well as what a thing can do. Does it bark? Does it meow? Does it walk or fly? In the paradigm of classes and objects, this would be known as a method. Now, this is something that really confused me when it was first explained to me, and I hope that I'm really not confusing you. But basically, a method is just a function within a class. For the purpose of the examples, I'm going to use Python as much as possible, but also PHP on occasion, as I think it might look a little bit more familiar to you. In the next lecture, I'll be looking at an example of a class, and maybe from there it will become a little bit more clear. Hi there. In this lecture, we will be covering a brief example of how to define a class in Python and how to instantiate an instance of a class in Python by creating an object. Basically, what this means is we are creating a blueprint for something and then we are creating that thing. In this example, I'll be creating a class called cat. What you will notice is that the word cat is uh, capitalized and is followed by open close brackets. Then I'm following this by a colon. Now in our previous example earlier on, we, we noted that a colon was merely an indication that the next lines of code beneath us are going to be indented in a code block relating to the line with the colon at the end. So now everything that we add after this needs to be indented. I'm going to put an extra space in between this and my next bit just to separate the code a bit. And again, I'm now creating a function or within the context of a class, a method. This method allows us to define what a class can do or what the blueprint can do. So a cat can meow. This is something that it can do. Just as a note that this is not an attribute of a class. Maybe the pitch of the meow or the sound of the meow, that might be an attribute. However, this is not an attribute. This is a method. This is something that it can do and not something that it is. Lovely. The next line, we will need to indent that further <coughs> to create the, uh, the content of this method. So what I'm going to do just for test purposes is print out the word meow so that we know that this thing is meowing. Fortunately for us, we don't need to put a semicolon at the end as you would in PHP. And because of this print function, we can now see in our console what is going on here. The print function is fantastic for printing out things to our console for the purpose of testing and for debugging. In this case, it is just part of our program. Now, what you will notice is that I am taking my indentation back to the beginning again. This is because we are now jumping out of the cat class and we are going to, to do something unrelated to the cat class. Well, it's related, but it is not within the paradigm of the cat class. What I'm going to do is I'm going to now create an object of the cat class. So I do this by creating a Python variable. In this case, the Python variable is called Tom. What we will notice between Python variables and PHP variables is that PHP variables are preceded by a dollar sign. Uh, JavaScript, for example, is preceded by a var sign, whereas Python, nice, clean, simple, is just the word. Again, the same way that variables are declared in PHP, we should keep similar things in mind with regards to Python variables. Some of these things include uh, keeping the first letter small, not including spaces. So if we are going to create a variable with more than one word to use camel case or to use underscores like so, Tom the cat. Lovely. Next, let us create our class or our 
from let's create our object from our class so what we need to do to get this right is to actually call our class by saying cat and then and then adding open close brackets to indicate that this is the cat class that we are calling lovely now we have an object of the cat class and because it is an object it is it is has now has access to everything that the cat cat class has access to so now Tom the cat can meow so let us add that so we go Tom the cat dot to indicate we are now calling a method of this class in PHP we would use an arrow a dash arrow like that whereas in Python we use a dot and then we call the name of the method or the function <coughs> Like so. So now what we should get if we save this is a cat printed out to the console. So let's call this something appropriate. Cat.py. And we'll notice py is the Python extension, so everything will be will be called dot py. If we save this, we now have a cat class, and you'll see that our Python syntax has now kicked in. Lovely. So let us try and run this now. So what I've done is I've moved over to my console and I've um, cd'd into a current working directory which is where we are at the moment which is in folder number five and if I do ls which lists the current files inside of a directory you'll see that we have cat.py. Now in order to run a python function we will need to say python or python file rather and then the name of the file. Now I'm expecting this to give me an error, so this is a planned error. And if we hit enter, you will see that we are given an error. So let's go through this error. Trace back, most recent call last. This is not really relevant. What we are looking for is where the error is and how we can fix it. So the error is on line seven in the file cat.py at Tom the cat. So the assumption that I'm making here is that it is something to do with the method meow. So the error that we are getting is a type error. Meow takes no arguments when given. Now, the, what is happening here is when we are calling this method, it is automatically passing the class of cat into this method when we call it. So this is a bit of a problem for us because we don't want to pass any parameters to this because we don't want to use anything in mail other than just printing it out. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add the self variable to the mail method so that now, even though we don't add anything here, self, the self um, instance that is required for this function or method is fulfilled. So now it should be able to run without any errors. If you don't understand what is going on here, I'm going to explain it in a little bit more depth within the next few lectures. Now, if I hit the up arrow, I'll be able to run my last command and hooray, we are now saying mu, which it said over there. Fantastic. In the next lecture, I'll be covering the same functionality in a PHP file, and then we will be moving on to some more advanced class and object techniques. Hi there. In this lecture, we will be talking about doing the same thing as what we did in the last lecture in Python, now in PHP. What I'm going to do is create a new file and call it cats.php. So now we have cat.php. Fantastic. Now, what I'm going to do is start our PHP file as we do with all PHP files with our opening PHP tag. Now, to create our class, we would just say class cat the same way that we would in Python, except instead of using our open close brackets to define our class at the beginning and our colon, as we did in Python, we just open close our curly braces. So now we don't care about our indentation. We just want to make sure that the code blocks that are relevant are contained within our curly braces. I still want to use uh, indentation though for legibility. So the same way that we defined our function in Python by saying def meow, we are now using the word function, which again is a method with is called a method in the uh, context of a class. Lovely. So now we can say meow, open close brackets as we've done before, and then again 
indicating that this function is part of meow by the open close bracket. So anything inside of here, we part of the meow function. I'm going to use the print function again, and I'm going to say meow, followed by a semicolon at the end of the line. Fantastic. So now we have a working class the same way that we did in our Python method, and we can now call that class to create an object. So let us create our variable. What you will notice is we are using the dollar sign at the beginning of the variable declaration um, as opposed to just declaring the variable in Python for our PHP and now we are saying it's equal to and what is very important with PHP um, as opposed to Python is that we need to use the keyword new we are creating a new instance of this cat blueprint or this cat class Python is clever enough to work out that we don't need to do this and now we say cat open close brackets and followed by our semicolon. Fantastic. Now Tom the cat is a new cat. And again, Tom the cat should be able to meow. As I mentioned in the previous lecture, the way that we call a method within our class in Python is with a dot and with PHP is with a dash greater than sign or smaller than sign. And now we can call our meow method similarly to the way that we called it in our Python class. You'll also notice again a semicolon at the end of the line. So now if we go to LS again and we can see here we now have our cat.php file added. In order to run a PHP file we would need to use the words PHP and then say the file that we want to use. So what we, what we want to do here is use our PHP compiler to run a PHP file. In Python, we said python cat.py, which would now run this script, whatever script we select as the first parameter with that compiler. So if we do this, python cat.php, it would break because our syntax would be completely wrong. So we need to now use our PHP compiler to run our PHP code. Fantastic. It is now meowing. That is exactly what we want. Now I want to talk a little bit about an attribute or a variable, a class variable. What we mentioned in the previous lecture is that a method or a function within a class is something that a class can do and not an attribute of that class. An attribute of that class would be something like a cat's color or a cat's, how many eyes does a cat have? What speed can it run? What is the sound of the meow or the pitch at which the meow happens? Something that can be tweaked and altered, usually in the form of a string or an integer or a float, something like that. When I say string, I mean a line of text. When I say integer, I mean a whole number. And when I say a float, it would be a floating point number. So something that's got something, point, etc. So let's quickly define a attribute for our cat class in PHP, and then I'll move on to doing the same thing in Python. Fantastic. So what we need to do is we need to define the color of a cat. Because I'm South African, I'm going to take out the U. Oh, well, I would prefer to have the U here. But I think because we are conforming to American standards, because we are coding, I'm going to keep color without the U. So we are now creating an attribute of our cat. So let us give it a variable name called color is equal to. And then if we would like to have a default value, we can add the default value into here. If not, we just end our line with a semicolon. I do want to add a default value. So I want our cat to be black and I'm going to finish this off with a semicolon. Now what I can do is I can call the color of my cat by saying cat calling something and then, oopsie, not black, color. So because it is an attribute and not a method, we do not need to finish it off with open close brackets. This should now give return as the word uh, black. So if we want to actually print that out, we will need to do this, which should now print out the word black. Now this is again going to give us an error but let's just try and see what happens. Pass error function t expecting function function something 
in here, introduction to uh, Django uh, da, 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 line five. Fantastic. Let's have a look and see what is going on here. Cool. So what is happening here is that we are hitting the issue of scope. Let's clean this up a bit. Scope meaning who can access this variable so or this attribute. So in our cat class, if we went like this, if we did something like this, so the this variable is the same as the self variable in here. So uh, we, we can use this similarly to the way that we use self in Python. So this, and then again, we call our color. Our meow is now printing out this color. So let's try that. Let's say Tom the cat, or we won't even need to print it out. We the function or the method is really printing it for us. We can say Tom the cat calling the meow function. So let's see if this works. So we are now, because of scope, we are now calling the color within this class. So at no point are we attempting to access this color attribute from outside of the class other than just printing it out within the function. We are allowed to do it like this. Let's see what happens. Uh, line five, color black, it's still not letting me do it. So the solution to this would be to add a keyword here. So there are mainly three types of keywords that we can add at the beginning of our uh, attributes within a class. First is public. Public means that it is accessible anywhere within the class and anywhere outside of the class. So ideally this should be public. The next is protected which means that this variable can be accessed within this class and any child classes that uh, may be created from this class. I'm not going to talk about child classes right now. We may talk about them later. And then the final uh, attribute that's the final uh, prefix to this attribute is private, which means that our color black is accessible only within this class. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to change this to public, which means that now anybody can access our color black. So if we now run this, we are now getting black. Fantastic. And the same way, if we want to just call black without having to actually add a function, we should be able to just call the color. Let's call that now. Uh, we are not printing it out. Let's actually print it out. save and we should see black again. Fantastic. So what is the point of this whole class story? Well, the point is that if we wanted to create a new cat called Felix or whatever a cat's name might be, Spot or uh, Tiger or whatever, we can now create an additional instance of that cat, Spot the cat is equal to a new cat. Now, by default, spots color, well, sorry, spot the cat's color will be black and its meow will sound the same. So what we can then do is we can then change various things within this specific instance of the cat so that Tom's color may be different from spots color. Now, this is when on creation or with, with using a method, we can change different attributes of a cat to function differently, but while still keeping all of this code intact. I will be looking at uh, doing this as well as extending our cat function to a point where we can start changing things between classes in the next lecture within the Python class object paradigm. Hi there. In this lecture, we are going to be doing a similar thing in our Python as we did in our PHP by creating a class attributes and some sort of scope. I'll talk a little bit more about that in this lecture, as well as how to handle additional instances of a class or uh, blueprints. So within 
our Python paradigm, let us begin by adding an attribute. So what I'm going to do is again indented in our Python, I'm going to add a variable or a class variable attribute called color and I'm going to give it a default value of black. Fantastic. And we don't have our semicolon at the end, so we just leave it as such. And what you will notice about this is that it is now suddenly accessible. We don't need to add a public, private, or protected a prefix to this color at all. So if we wanted to now echo out the color, we could now use self as opposed to this as we would in PHP. We can use our self and fortunately it is passed into this function which we saw earlier gives us an error if we don't pass it and this is why self dot color. And again we call it the same way with a dot. So we should now print out our self's color which is black. So if we now go python cat to py we should print out black. Fantastic. I hope that this makes sense to you. Now the reason that color is working without our public, private, or protected uh, declaration before the, the myth, uh, before the attribute, is that, as I mentioned in the one of the first lectures, that Python developers are very specific about the way that they do things. And one of the great parts about them being specific is that they assume that you are a cognitive human being and they assume that you are not going to break certain things. So what they do is they, the uh, public private protected does not feature at all in Python. But if you want to suggest to your developers looking at this code in future, not to um, give this particular attribute access to anything outside of the class, you can follow it by two underscores in the attribute name to suggest that this is something specific to this class, the same way that you would write private. But if that developer wanted to break that uh, best case practice that you that you use here, they could very well easily just call that color if they saw fit. So really the, 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 the creators of Python are assuming that they're giving you full access and assuming that with your great power, you will use it responsibly. Fantastic, so now we have a color black. So what I'm going to do now is create Sam the cat. And before it was spot, so let's keep it consistent. Spot, yes it was spot. Spot the cat. And now we are going to create a new cat. So this is great. So now spot the cat can also meow. So now if we run this, Tom the cat should meow and spot the cat should meow. Both of them, oh, oopsie, they don't know. They actually tell you what their color is. So maybe what we can do here is we can pass an additional variable into this and we can say sound. So we, for some reason we, or let's, let's rather rename this to sound and say sound here. So now what we are doing is instead of just meowing, we are actually calling a sound. So it can purr or hiss, whatever the case is. And then in here, we can print out the sound that is passed in. So for Tom the cat, we want to now pass in our second parameter. The first parameter is itself, which is passed in. And the only one that we see here that will get passed in at this point will be the sound. So in our case, it is a string and we will say purr. So now Tom the cat is purring. Now spot the cat, we don't want to purr. We want spot the cat to hiss because spot is a bit of an aggressive furry furball. And let's see what happens now. And we can see that Tom is purring and Spot is hissing. So that's great. Now, what if we wanted to define a different color for Tom and for Spot? It would seem a bit redundant for us to, to, to kind of call the color here. We want to maintain that cat's color within uh, the class and we and we want this to to continue throughout the existence of our program so what I'm going to do uh, what we could easily do is we could create a new function and we could call this set color and then again we would need to pass our self into there and possibly a color into there so now what we can do is we can say self dot 
color because this gets passed in with the self variable is now equal to oopsie is now equal to color so what this would now do is we could now set tom the color tom the cat's color uh tom the cat color dot set color and now we could pass color in here and his color is white and now if we print out our cat's color even though we are passing sound into here well, we will need to actually go self dot color it would now give us white even though we are passing pure into it and would give us black because black is the default for spot let's see so i'm expecting white and black that's fantastic so now this color has been maintained throughout and now tom's color until we change it again has been set to white if we remove this uh, now in uh, Python, a comment, code comment is used with the hash sign. In PHP, you can also use a hash, but there are two other ways in PHP as well to declare comments. I'm not going to co go through them now. Just so that you know, in Python, if you would like to comment out something, just use the hash symbol. And what it will do is this code will not be read. So I could I could write anything that I want into in here, and this code would just not run at all. So it wouldn't throw any errors or anything like that. So now we see that black and black is being run because this code, this line of code is not being run and it is not ever setting the color away from white. Fantastic. Now what I would rather do is when Tom is created, I would like to set his color. So I can do this by adding his color in as a parameter here and spots color in as a parameter here. What seems black and brown for him. So the way that we would do this is we would define a new function which is called a constructor function. And what a constructor function is, is a function that is uh, run when the class is created. And we do this in Python using two underscores, the word init, and then another two underscores, open close brackets, and then a colon. So what we pass into the init function is self, as we do with all of our class functions, and then anything else that we pass into the constructors at this point. So I'm going to pass a color in, and this color would be brown or white. So now at this point, I would rather run our set color function, set color line of code, which will now set the color to the color that we have specified. And now because our sound is echoing out the color, when we echo out Tom's sound, it should echo out the color brown. And when we echo out Spot's sound, it should echo out the color white. I really hope that that makes sense. Let's try. Fantastic. We have these two. So just to iterate, the self.color, which is set to default to black, is now being set to brown in the instance of Tom because the init constructor function is run when the class or when the object is created within the class, and when spot is created, we are setting his default color to white. If we didn't set this, his default color would remain black. So let's run that again. Oopsie, it is giving us an error on the end. So we, we, we need to pass something into this constructor. So when a, a class is created, if, if the constructor is run and it is expecting a second variable of color, we have to pass that variable into this. Lovely, see you in the next lecture. Hi there. In this lecture, we are going to be expanding on our knowledge of Python class and object creation within the paradigm of our to-dos app. We're going to be building a very simple first draft of our to-dos app and hopefully uh, fill in a few of the gaps that we've missed out here with class creation and uh, object instantiation. So for starters, let us create a new file which is going to be specific to the class. So this class is going to be called list item. So the best way that we can map our, our class to a real world object, so for example, a list item, is how we should think about classes when we create them. So we wouldn't necessarily create a class called to-dos, as a to-do would not be a physical thing. However, a list item may well be a physical thing sitting on our to-dos list. So let us now create the class, and this class is going to be called list 
item. And again, open close brackets, followed by a colon. And just make sure to indent this. Let me put a bit, sp bit of space here. And there are four main functions that I would like to create, each of these relating to something called a CRUD. Now, CRUD is a very common computer um, computer science term used to a well acronym used to describe the main functions of a class or a very specific type of class. So these functions would be create, read, update, delete, C R U D. So I would like to to create functions for each of these. So define create, define, read, let's put a second line, define, update, define, delete. Great stuff. Now within the paradigm of our to-dos list, I think it may be better for us to create different function names for each of these. So the assumption is that when we create our list item, I would rather use our constructor function as we did before in when we created our cat. So we would do this by instead of saying define init, we would use two underscores, keyword init, and then two underscores again, remembering that we always pass in the self variable as the first uh, parameter in all of our class functions. So now when we create a list item, this is going to be what is created. That is fantastic. So some things that we want to set about our list item when we create it before moving on would be attributes. So is complete, I think would be a good attribute. So is complete by default should be equal to false. Now, what you will notice with Python is that there is a Boolean value that can be set. So by Boolean, I mean something that is either true or false. And these are the only two values that can be set for this specific uh, variable. So this can never have any other value other than true or false. It can never be null. It can never be zero. It can never be a string. It could never be a number, it can only ever be true or false. So this keyword is obviously not happy here, even though I'm writing out the word false. So the way that we correct this in Python is to capitalize our booleans. Now this is fine in Python because we will never be using anything else other than true or false. Fantastic. So by default, false is perfectly okay for is complete because we are assuming that when we create our new list item, this new list item is not yet complete. The next thing that I would like to create is a string called title. Now this is the title of our task. So by default, I don't think that this should have a value. We should set the value when we create the list item in our init function. So let's do this by adding an additional value to our title. Uh, additional parameter to our init and called title and then we can now set our self dot title equal to our title this is great so later on when we actually create our list item so we will say list item is equal to list item knowing now that this list item is set to this also remembering that we need to keep the first letter of our variable declaration small while we can make the first letter of our class declaration large. Now what we will need to do is we will need to set our title as the parameter in here. So let's say wash the dishes. So we are now setting that wash the dishes. So now we obviously don't want to mark this list item as complete straight away within this. So if we ever want to set the dishes to now be washed, it's not going to happen when we create the task. So we need a separate function or method for setting wash the dishes to complete. So let's create that method while we're here. So I'm going to define a new method and say 
completed set let's say set set is always a good keyword set as complete so what you will notice is I can put sentences inside of my method definitions I like to keep these as descriptive as possible without going too overboard so set as complete is a perfectly valid method name and what this will do is set the self dot is complete equal to true and now we have set this specific um, uh, instance of a list item to true when we run this function so we would run this function by saying list item dot set as complete and that would now set this as complete um, we just need to remember to pass the self variable into this so that we can use it and because it is required with all class variables or sorry, with all class functions uh, or class methods lovely in our read list what we would ideally like to get out of this is to read multiple instances of our list however there is only one list here so we should have a function called get all list items or something like that but we are talking about a specific list item here so what we should say then is get single list item now this may be a bit long so i think single might be a bit redundant so get list item could be a good a uh, good name for this method and all we want to do here is to return and now return is a keyword which returns something and what I want to return is self so this is now not just the title this is returning the entire instance of this thing's self so if we were to echo that out we would get two things we would get all of the attributes which would be is complete which is either set to true or false and we would get the title which would be set to wash the dishes so maybe let's do that and see what happens with list item dot get list item because it is oops because it is returning the entire instance uh, we should be able to see everything inside of our list item as it is currently set so what we are doing is firstly creating an instance of the list item blueprint or class and setting the title to wash the dishes by default is complete is going to be set to false then we are taking this newly created list item and running the set as complete method on this which what it does is sets the is complete uh, attribute of this to true so again because it is a boolean it can only be true or false so now is complete is equal to true and then we are printing out the list item get and list item so whatever is returned from this is getting printed out and what is returned is everything contained within our current instance of our list item which is fantastic let's test this and see if we get out is complete true because it is being set to true and i'll wash the dishes title so i'm going to head over to our console again ls and see we have list item.py and uh, possibly an old file that i was working on uh, previously to this so that is not relevant and let's run list item.py and see what happens what are we getting oh we are getting indentation errors here this is great so i think the best thing to do here would be to remove these two functions for now uh, actually it might be better just to comment them out so that we know we still need to write our update function and we still need to write our delete function so let us see we are getting some more errors name title is not defined this is on line one we are getting the issue and on line four we are getting the issue class list item that is correct title 
I think we need to set a default value for title. Let's just see. Main list item instance. Yes, we are now successfully returning an instance of our list item. Great. So now if we want to get something specific from our list item, we may need to call um, an additional parameter uh, to this function here so that it actually gives us whatever we want. So two ways we could do this. The first way is we could pass a second parameter into this function. So we could say a title or is complete and then just pass that back when it is returned. A better way, possibly a better way, is to chain or pipe our uh, variable that we want to get out of this to the end of our function that we, to our method that we call here. So we could say list item, which is now getting our list item instance, dot get list item, which is now returning self, dot title, which is now getting our title. This does seem a bit redundant because we could actually just say list item dot title and it would give us our current title. But let's just do this to see what actually happens to see if this works. And there we go, our title is returned. That is great. Hi, in this lecture we are going to be cleaning up this list item file a little bit and what we are going to do is think a bit about how to create multiple instances of our list item and how to make it seem as if it is one long list as opposed to individual list items while still maintaining this single list item class. So for starters, one thing that I have noticed is my WordPress PHP background is has come back to haunt me and I've added a semicolon there. We do not need semicolons at the end of our lines in Python. Fantastic. So what I'm going to do uh, to start off with this lecture is to add a new list at the top of my file. So this is above where the blueprint of the class is created. The reason that I'm doing this above where the class is created is because I want to use this code above my class within my class. So just a little bit of background behind Python. In PHP, the way that you would create a list of objects would be known as an array, and we would declare an array like that. And we can put multiple things into this array. Now, I don't want to get too much into what an array is, and uh, I have made the assumption here that you do have a general understanding of an array. If not, I will be covering it in the next few lectures within the Python paradigm, so don't worry about it. With that being said, Python uh, strictly does not call an array an array, but rather calls an array something called a list or a dictionary. Now, I'm not going to get into the difference between a list and a dictionary but uh, right now, but it is helpful for you to understand that there is a difference between the two. So what I'm going to be creating is a list um, because we are creating list items, and this list is going to have a numeric, numeric value attached to something. So the way that this would visually be represented would be something like at position zero, we want to have the value of something. Then within that same variable, we want something to be added at position one. And this would be another thing, etc., etc and then at position two. So some important things to notice about this is that the indexes start at zero, so zero, one, two, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And the length of this would now be three because there are three uh, compartments to this array, which I'll, I'll be using the word list and array interchangeably, just knowing that array and list and dictionary are all essentially the same thing. So this can all be saved as one variable. And if I want to now call this variable, I will call whatever the name of the variable is at position zero, which would now give me something. If I called at position one, it would give me another thing. So this is a nice way for us to save up 
groups of lists. So in our Python example, we are going to create a new list. So let's create that new list variable now. So the variable is called list. And the way that we create a new list in Python is simply by saying list. So list is equal to a new list. So now Python knows that there are going to be multiple variables, sa variables saved inside of this. So what we can essentially do now is, is when our list item is created, we can append that specific instance of the list item to the list variable. It may be better to call this list items. So we know uh, that it is a list, that it is a, mu a multiple list items. So let's, uh, let's write some code here just so that it makes a little bit more sense. So what I'm going to do is say list items, and then I want to run a function on list items that basically appends a value to this list, as we saw um, the way that arrays or lists or dictionaries save multiple values. So obviously we want to append a new value. So I use the keyword append. And what that does is it will now allow me to pass something into this as a value. And if I wanted to append something else to that, test or again, etc., etc., I could then print out that this list items um, as such. So what, what I'm going to do here is every time we create a new list item, we're going to add that list item to our list items list. Now, I hope that makes sense. I'm using a lot of the same words and there's a lot of jargon thrown in there. Hopefully it will make more sense when I start typing, when, I, when, when this starts coming together and we start testing it. So what I'm going to do um, as to, to, to pass into our list items is the variable self, which is coming in when we create this instance. So I'm actually passing the physical object of this list item. So everything affiliated to this specific list item. So that would include title, is complete, and, and all of the methods attached to that as well into this particular list. So now we have a, at position zero of our list, or our arrayed list, um, we have our first instance of our object. So what I'm going to do is maybe just change this up a bit and say list item one so that we know that it is list item one. Uh, and list item one would be wash the dishes. So now list item two is going to be something else. And let's say list item two is wash the floor. I suppose that makes sense. So wash the dishes, wash the floor. These are now two separate list items that have been added. So I want you to try and guess what would happen now if we had to print out our list items. So yeah, just something for you to think about. I'm going to run this code now and see what happens and then explain the process. So uh, let's make sure we're in the right directory. LS. Yes, we've got list item there. Python list item.py. If you, if you tab, it should automatically find what you're looking for to the best of its ability. So I just typed out uh, Python and then I went L and pressed tab and it automatically picked up that I was trying to find list item, fortunately, because it was the only file in this folder. Cool. And what is it giving us? List item is not defined. Uh, oh, here we go. We have not defined list item. I'm going to comment out this line of code for now because we're not using list item at all. So we, we, we are using list item one and list item two. So list item really has become redundant at this point. Let's try that again. And what it is doing here, it is returning an array. You can see it's going square brackets. And this is an instance of our list item and another instance of our list item. So in, in essence, what we want to do, because really this means very little to us, is we want to get attributes out of our list items. So what we would really need to do then is iterate through each of these and then find the title or find is completed. So the way we do that is by using a for loop. So I'm sure you've, you've used for loops before in PHP, 
uh, and in WordPress, the WordPress has the, the main loop that is used to loop through posts is a for loop. So the way that we would create a for loop in Python and for Django would be to write the keyword for underneath that. And then we want to pass in what our each iteration item will be. So for, for each item in and then list items for each item in list items and I'm going to continue putting a colon there just to for best practice and to show that the next piece of code is going to be indented we don't really need to put the colon there but yes yeah, just something to keep in mind and then I'm going to for every single list item saved as an item so within this code block everything that is indented inside of the for loop so anything that would be in there um, is now going to be an item. So for the purpose of everything inside of here, we now have a single item. So that would be this item on the first iteration and the second item on the second iteration. So this would be the first item at position zero because we started zero in the first iteration. And then list item two would be um, at position one, which is the second iteration of item. So if we print out item now, we should get out this section, this first main list item instance, and then this main list item instance underneath it. Let's run that. And yes, we have our two list item instances. Again, that doesn't really mean anything to us. So why don't we now access the title of our list item, and we should be able to iterate through each of our list items and print out the title. So what I want to see now is wash the dishes followed by wash the floor. Let's see if that works. Fantastic. That is working like a charm. This is really, really good. So just to, to iterate what we were speaking about uh, before moving on to the next lecture is we are first creating our new list called list items. We create a list by using the keyword and function list. Uh, we are now creating our class. Um, so this is a blueprint. This doesn't explicitly get run unless we call it. So we are calling the first uh, one down here. We are saying variable list item one is equal to a new list item and we're passing in wash the dishes into that. So now it goes into our class. It sets is complete default to false, title equal to nothing, and then it runs our init constructor function. Firstly, it passes in the self variable and then it passes in the title, which would be wash the dishes. So then we are now using the special function append uh, on our list items list to append uh, the value to our list items, which is self. And then we are actually setting the, the, the title of this particular instance to the title there. So self the title equal to the title that's coming in. So this here that's getting passed is, is, in, is the entire uh, instance into this particular list. Then we are doing our functions. We're not running them. Um, we've commented one of them out here. So we're not, we're not using these, but we could use them if we want to. These two are commented out, so we're not using them at the moment. And then the same thing happens when, so we, we jump out of that class when it's created. And then we do the same thing for our next list item two, where we create that. It's now setting this particular instance to uh, appending it to the list of items and setting the title to the title title. Then we jump out of this and we say for every single item in the list items, we want to print out that specific list item title. So that, that, that one's title. So if we want to set them all as complete, we would, we could just as easily just say, um, set as complete and it would iterate through both of these and it would set them both to complete. Fantastic. Hi there. In this lecture, we will be completing our to do's apps main functionality by uh, completing these two final methods here. So in essence, what we want is we want our update method to update a particular instance and we want our delete method to delete an instance. So I'm going to cheat a little bit and I'm not actually going to delete the instance when I use delete, but rather I'm going to delete the reference in the list items list to that particular instance. Uh, this is not the most efficient way of doing things, but it will work for the purpose of purposes of what we want to do. So let's start with our uh, deletes method as I think this one is a little bit easier than the update one. So 
what we want to do with our delete method is we essentially want to just pass a parameter, let's call it index, into this delete method, and then we want to delete uh, we want to delete the list items index at this position index. So what we would do in Python to delete a reference to a specific a particular index would be to say del and then the name of the list items so list or the, the list which would be list items and then we specify the position which in this case is index so now what we're doing is we're passing an index into our delete method and then we are actually deleting the reference at that specific index in our list items uh, from the list items. So when we actually print out our list items, you'll notice that it has disappeared. So let's maybe just say title here. So what it will do is we'll now print out the item or title. Uh, and then what we need to do is we need to call this delete method. So two things to notice here. The first thing to notice is that self is not being passed into our delete method. We don't say self in here at all. We just call the index. This is because delete is what we call a static method. Now what on earth is a static method? Basically a static method is a method that's within a class that knows nothing about the current instance of the class. So it doesn't have an inco is complete uh, attribute. It doesn't have a specific title other than what is set as the default. Uh, we, we do not instantiate a, st a, 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 a static instance of a class. So the way that we would call this particular method, even because we, well, because we don't have any instances attached to them, is we just call the class, which is list item, and then we can call the method straight onto that class, which is great. But again, we don't have any uh, reference to these two particular instances at all within this. So I want to call. I want to delete our uh, our reference at position zero. So position zero is getting passed in at the index, and because there's no reference to the instance itself, we are only referencing the list item list. We can now happily delete the list items um, the list items index at position index, which in this case is zero. So I want you to maybe take a few moments just to think about what would happen if we had to run this code, if we had to now print out this code in our console. So just think about that. I'll give you a few seconds and then I'll run it and let's see if you are right. Cool, welcome back. So let's run this code and see what happens. Oh, lovely. Unbound method delete must be called with list item instance as first argument. Got ins int instance instead. Basically, what this, this error is telling us is that there is no instance attached to this specific delete uh, method. And that is because we have not told Python, or we have not told this class, that this is a static method. Now that is very important because we are explicitly telling Python that we do not want an instance to be uh, related to this method at all. So there is a special special keyword which is the at sign and then static method which we use to tell Python that whatever code block comes next is going to be static. So let's run this. So, so just, just to be aware, static method uh, and then the method underneath that is now telling us that this needs to be static. Great, let's run this and see what happens. Fantastic, so wash the floor is the only thing that we have now. So that means that wash the dishes has been deleted. Let's test this uh, and use one. So now uh, wash the dishes should remain because it is at list item position zero and wash the floor should be deleted. Great, and we have washed the dishes. So we are successfully deleting the reference to our list items using a static method in our list item class. That is great. Next, let's look at our delete uh, method. So we know that, sorry, our update method. We know that um, 
delete is passing in an index, uh, and then we are just deleting it. So the only real difference in terms of uh, the functionality of our class would be that we want to pass in an index, and then we want to update something in that index. So updates, the word update isn't really sufficient for us. We want to be able to update something. So we want to be able to update the is complete attribute or the title attribute. So let's stick with title because uh, it, it just seems like the easiest for now. Um, and we are going to rename this function to update title. So we are updating the specific title. So this this is great. So now we can actually uh, let's let's add our, our static keyword so that Python knows that it is a static method. And then we also want to pass the title into this method. So let's just call it title here. Great. So now what we can do is we can call our list items uh, list variable again inside of this uh, method. And we can say list items at position index. And because we've passed the entire object reference uh, into every single list items uh, 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 index, we can actually just now say list items at position index, and it will return the entire um, instance of that object. So we can just as easily say dot title, and it will now get the title for that specific instance, which is great. So I want to make that title equal to the title that we have just passed into our newly called function that we well, we haven't called it yet, but the function that we are going to call. And what it will do is it will set the title of that instance equal to title. This is great. So it's not, it's not creating any type of referential links, but it is rather actually fetching the self. So if there was an instance here, we should, we, we could easily just say, self uh, self dot title so it is actually calling the the instance inside of this list item although it is found within a static method which doesn't actually know which um which instance it is relating to other than the index that we've passed in great so now let's actually call that so again because it's a static method we will be calling list item and then i want to say update title and I want to pass in firstly the um, the uh, index, and secondly I want to pass in the string of the title that is now going to be updated. So let's say wash the kitchen. Great. So we are now passing wash the kitchen in the title, and we are getting the index. So at position zero here, our index is equal to uh, the 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 instance of wash the dishes, and we are getting the title of that, which is wash the dishes, and we are now changing the title, updating the title to pass to, to what the second parameter is in our uh, static method, which is watch wash the kitchen. So now if we run this, we should see wash the kitchen. Fantastic. So now uh, if, we, if we take this out, this delete function, we just uncomment it for now, uh, and we set this now to one, we should have wash the dishes, and now we are updating the uh, list items index at position one, which is wash the floor, because this is uh, position zero, and this is uh, wash the dishes is position zero, and wash the floor is position one. Wash the floor should now become wash the kitchen. Great. Wash the dishes, wash the kitchen. That is exactly what we want. And now we have a basic to do app that functions, which can create. Uh, we can read by, by using uh, uh, referencing our, our list items. We can update and we can delete. That is great. Well done, everyone. Hi there. In our last section, we looked at creating a to do app using pure vanilla Python. Uh, we, however, do want more functionality than what Python offers us. Um, without any type of code generation. And this is where Django comes in. Django is a complete uh, web framework written in Python that allows us to generate code really quickly and has uh, an exceptional amount of really, really robust uh, libraries and functionality, uh, some of which include its own built-in web server, its own virtual environment setup, as well as its own REST API framework. Now, these are some things that are really helpful to have when uh, 
making the transition from an uh, intermediate to a, an advanced web developer where you really can um, exercise flexibility and do really whatever you want to. Um, so in this, in this lecture, we're going to be covering how to set up Django. So one of the uh, main things to notice about Python and Django uh, is that it functions within a virtual environment setup. Well, what is a virtual environment? In the context of Python, a virtual environment is a sandbox environment where different versions of libraries can be stored and called. So for the example of Django, Django 1.9 and Django 1.10 would be two separate uh, libraries that would run in two separate sandboxed virtual environments. So if I had a web application running on Django 1.9, I would have that in one virtual environment and then another uh, Django uh, application running on Django 1.10, I could have that in its own virtual environment. And this is really nice because we can have multiple libraries um, with different versions running on different environments, which keeps our code nice and clean and separates um, separates libraries so that we don't have version conflicts. So how do we create a virtual environment? You do this in uh, by going to the command line and making sure that you have Python installed. I assume at this point you have Python installed. Um, and we use a Python command virtual env which is a keyword for creating a virtual environment and i'm going to create a virtual environment called env test and if i hit return you will now see that it is successfully creating that virtual environment now what i want to do is i want to activate this virtual environment so we've only created it we haven't actually activated it so if we list what is currently in our folder you'll see that it has created this virtual environment for us so if we cd into env and then we see e into the bin folder, which is inside of that. Um, no such file as, oopsie, it's uh, env test. So cd into env test and then cd into bin. You'll see that we have the activate file, which we can run in our, uh, in our command uh, when I'm in our terminal. So I'm going to cd back into our the root of what I consider to be the, the project working directory. Um, and I am going to run a special command which activates or source, which runs the activate file and it will activate our virtual environment. So what I need to do is I need to run the activate file, which can be found in env test in the folder bin. Uh, and then the file activate. So if I run this, what you'll notice is env test has now been activated. And you can see this because at the beginning um, of our line, um, the, 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 the sandbox uh, env test uh, is showing up over there. So that's great. So from here, we can install any uh, Python libraries that we want to using Python's package manager, uh, which is called pip, and it's spelled like that. Uh, and uh, it, those libraries will only exist within that virtual environment. So the next thing that we need to do is actually install the Django library into this environment that has been activated. So we do this by saying pip install, and then we tell Python or tell pip what, uh, which library we would like to install into that virtual environment. So Django is really great. We just say Django. And now we just need to tell pip which version of Django. So we do that by uh, uh, saying equals equals. And then the latest version uh, as from the recording of this video is 1.10. So here we are going uh, pip install Django equals equals 1.10. And this should install Django 1.10 onto our uh, virtual environment env test. So I hit return. You'll notice it's, it's now going onto the web and finding all of the packages that are required for Django, and it is actually installing them onto this virtual environment. So a great way that we can test to see if Python has, or Django has actually been installed is by running Python dash m Django, and then dash dash version. And this will tell us if Django is installed, and if so, what version? And great, we can see that Django 1.10 
has been installed. So now we usually have quite a few libraries that we would need to install the same way as this and it does become a bit uh, long-winded to have to do this for every single library especially when you are running on multiple setups. So for example if you're working with a colleague and collaborating on the same project using version control uh, if you have a local environment which is separate from your staging environment which is separate from your production environment it really becomes a hassle to have to run uh, the installation of your packages on every single setup and you don't necessarily want to keep these packages on a version controlled server you'd rather just run pip install and let pip go and fetch the package every time you set it up as opposed to just leaving it uh, redundantly and taking up space unnecessarily within a version control environment. So the way that we get around this is we create a requirements.txt file. So I'm going to go into sublime text and then I'm already in the Django folder and I'm going to create requirements.txt uh, and, and essentially what I'm going to do here is I'm going to list uh, all of the required libraries that I want for my installation. So the only one that I want at the moment is Django 1.10. So I can put Django and then equal to equal to uh, 1.10. So this is great. Now we can add any other libraries that we need to below this. Uh, there are many, many Python libraries that you can install on here. Um, so the, the way that we would do this is by actually now running pip install the same way that we did and then recursive or r and then requirements of txt, txt and if we run that it's going to give us requirements already satisfied. So Django has already been installed. We don't need to install it again. So for the purposes of this video, what I'm going to do is create another virtual environment and I'm going to call that test. So not env test, just test. And now, even though we have created this virtual environment called test, this new one that I've just created now, we are still setting, sitting in env test, which is our original virtual environment. And then I'm going to go source and then I want to go into the test virtual environment not the env test bin and activate and now what it should do is it should activate our test virtual environment so this is great we have two virtual environments running um, not at the same time but I can switch between them if I want to so if I want if I'm working on an old version of Django and I want to upgrade it at some stage but I don't want to up upgrade it right now I can now switch between my two virtual environments by running source and then activating it. So this is great. Now if I do the same Django version test as we did before, so if I say python m Django dash dash version, if I copy that and I paste it, what you will notice is it says no module name Django, which means within the context of this virtual environment, Django has not yet been installed. Well this is where the requirements.txt comes to the rescue. I can literally just uh, type out pip install dash our requirements of txt and now it will go and read our requirements of txt file c django and 1.10 and it will go and install that and now if we run our python django version you will see that 1.10 has successfully been installed hi there in our last lecture, we looked at creating a virtual environment as well as how to install uh, libraries within the virtual environment, and one of those being Django. In this lecture, we will look at how uh, we can use uh, Django's powerful shell commands to generate code for us. So essentially, we can generate an entire application uh, and just pass in the placeholders for uh, what we want to call it. Um, I also want to give you a brief introduction into migrations as well as into how um, you can use Django Shell to create a super user for you to log into the admin area. Now, just one thing to remember is that although Django is not strictly a content management system, the same way that WordPress uh, is specifically a content management system, Django 
functions as a framework. So you don't need to have an admin area when creating a, a Django site. But if you want Django to function as a content management system, as well as a powerful framework, you can create an admin interface for Django um, very, very easily. So that is what we're going to be looking at now. And this is going to create the basis for what will be our quote unquote blog uh, uh, initial application that we create. Cool. So the first thing that we would like to do is just make sure that we are in our virtual environment. So we can see that we're in virtual environments uh, test, which is fine for now. I really don't care what the name of the virtual environment is, as long as we have Django installed. So what we did in the previous um, lecture is we installed Django into this virtual environment. So if I run Python dash M space, the name of the library, uh, which we want to check, which is Django dash dash version, uh, it should show us the version of this. So now we have full access to Django shell commands within this virtual environment. So let's create a Django admin area. So this is a special command called Django admin. And this is now specifically for the Django admin. Uh, and then we run uh, the function within that called start project. And then we want to pass in the name of our project. So I'm just going to call this my blog. So we're saying Django admin start project and then we're creating my blog. So if I hit return now, it has now created my blog. So if we go ls, we will see my blog is sitting inside of the Django admin area. So if I go back to Sublime Text, I can now see that my blog exists. And this is great. We now have my blog and we have a manage.py file. Something to note is that the manage.py file is the file that runs all of the shell commands. So you don't have to worry too much about what is inside of this file for now, but just know that manage.py is what we, we use to run all of our uh, shell commands. Cool, the next thing that I would like to do is for us just to cd into my blog. Uh, and it will give us the same uh, file structure that we saw in Sublime Text. So my blog, uh, my blog app, and then manage.py. And what I want to do is I want to now make use of this manage.py that we talk about. And what you'll notice with my blog is that it really just has a, a couple of smaller things in here. What it does have is a settings.py file. Now this is a very important file because what this does is it tells Django what settings you obviously want to set and more importantly, what apps you want to use. So at the moment you can see we've got these apps here installed, but now we need to somehow map these to a database. So how do we do this? Well, the way that we do that is with something called migrations. And what that will allow us to do is it will allow us to create a set of instructions that tell Django uh, how uh, or, or what tables and what columns and rows within tables to create in a database. By default, Django uses the MySQL Lite database or SQL Lite 3 database. So this is these settings here are the default database settings. If we would like to use something like fully fledged MySQL, we can definitely do that. If we would like to use something like uh, MongoDB, we can do that as well. Django is really flexible with what kind of database um, you, you use, what kind of uh, model structure you use. But, but just to remember that, uh, that this is only possible because Django's separation of concerns and the way that it's been written, that it has been written is very, very verbose. So you can really use any database that you want to on this. Cool. So now let's create our migration so that we at least have some sort of an admin area to work with. And the way that we do this is we go back to our console again. And now, like I mentioned before, we make use of our manage.py file. So we run it, it's a Python command, so we need to run it through the Python compiler as we did before, manage.py, and then we run migrate. 
And what this should do now is this should migrate all of our um, our settings and uh, map them to uh, some sort of database um, instance. Cool. And what it is now doing is it is now applying all of these migrations. So if we now go back to our uh, file, you'll see it has now created a DB SQL Lite 3, and this is unreadable as it's just a binary file, and we, we can't read it, but we know that this database has been created. And at a later stage, if we, if we use a database administration program, we should be able to actually see what is being created within this um, migration. So this is really, really nice for us. We now actually have uh, migrations running, and we can see um, that it is now creating usernames, it's now creating all sorts of, of nice things for us. Cool. So the next thing which is uh, very important is for us to actually create a backend user. So at the moment we don't have a backend user. So what I want to do is run the same python manage.py and then create super user. So this is how we get around uh, username and password. Initially, if we have access to the console, we can create super users. Uh, lovely. And we can choose what we want our name to be. So uh, I don't really want to use my full name. It's a bit long, so I'm just going to say admin. Uh, email address is richloydmiles at gmail.com. Awesome. And I'm going to enter in my password and my password again. So this is a really nice, neat way of creating users. Cool. So now we've created our user and our Django project is ready to rock and roll. Hi there. In the last lecture, we looked at how to create a Django app as well as how to create uh, migrations to an SQLite 3 database and how to create a super user. In this lecture I would like I would like to discuss how we can make more or, or more use than we've had before with uh, using Django's code creation uh, shell framework to create an application for us. So when I say application I'm talking specifically about an application in the context of a Django program. Now Django, so one Django uh, program can have multiple applications within it. So um, I prefer to call these models because they make more sense to me. Uh, this is because an application will usually be mapped to a single model which is a single database. You can have multiple models within one application uh, but this is really only for the sake of creating relational connections between your models. So um, I'm going to just to demonstrate how to create uh, an app quickly in Django. Um, and then I'm going to move through how you can expand upon the default code that is created and hopefully all this talk of models and applications will make more sense as I go along. So again, we are going to run our python manage.py um, uh, file with the Python compiler as we've done before. And then I'm going to, to run the start app function within that. And then I'm going to give my app a name. So as we discussed before, um, basically what Django does is it has a base uh, application or base program and then you can create apps within that program. So what you will notice is when I create my app, it will give us a new folder and then it will neatly set up everything similarly to the way that it has set up my blog, which is the default core app that is created when a new Django project is created. So I'm just going to call this app blog. Uh, and then a whole set of models and views and uh, a whole lot of extra goodies are going to be generated. So 
uh, this is basically I can call this app whatever I want to because it's a blog I'm obviously calling it blog so there's no special reference to anything here if I hit return it's now going to create the blog app so we can now see there's a blog app and within the blog app folder there is a migrations folder which is great because this is where all of our migrations will sit there is an admin uh, file which anything relating to our admin area of the site will sit there is um, an apps file so this this relates to the apps that are inside of uh, the, the blog uh, and then the the three folders that we are going to be looking the most at is the models.py file now this is where all of your models which get mapped to the database uh, within your app will sit so we'll we will define all of our database tables etc etc in here and then they will be mapped to the database when we migrate the models um, tests is if you want any tests we, we're not going to be do, using tests sorry this is not an important file for us at this stage and then views is also an important file this is where we actually see stuff on our app uh, on the front end of the site so cool let's um, let's add this particular app to our settings.py file so if we open up my blog and go into settings.py you'll see we've got the section for installed apps so it is really as simple as just saying blog in here so we can just say blog and now Django knows that we have the blog app so this is really really great now the next thing that we want to do um, I think is to run this application or run this uh, Django program and actually see what happens. So I'm going to go back into my console, I'm going to run manage.py and then the special command called run server. And what this will do is this will activate Django's built-in web server which is really really powerful. So if I hit return, what it's doing is performing system checks, uh, it's, it's uh, doing date, etc, etc, and then it's telling us where our server is running. Now what is really great is because this is a server, anytime somebody accesses the server, um, we, we, we can see what they are accessing here in our console. So if I go to my wonderful browser and I run this, we could just as easily just say localhost because that is the local host uh, and then we're running it on port 8000 all of this stuff is configurable so if you have something else running on port 8000 uh, 8, you can change that um, we're not going to go into that right now and you'll see it has worked congratulations on your first Django powered page this is amazing of course you haven't actually done any work yet next you'll start your um, first app by running Python manage start app label. Now we've already created our first app, so that's cool, but unfortunately we haven't linked it to the front of the site yet. Before we link anything to the front of the site, I just want to quickly take you to the back end of the site, just so that we can see what's going on there. Now if you'll remember, we created our super user. So if we go for 8000 forward slash admin, you will now see that we can log into our Django administration area and I made my username admin and my password my password and not now please and now we have uh, access to our Django backend this is really nice because it gives us users and groups by default so I can change anything about my user here if I want to and I can add my user to a specific group hi there in the last lecture, we chatted a little bit about generating our application and then actually generated uh, our application called blog. Uh, and then we added it to our settings file and then actually ran our Django server. And we noticed we now have our Django server running, which is really cool. And we logged into the backend where we saw we had our users and our groups. Now what I would like to do is I would actually like to add um, our posts uh, to the back-end content management system and then somehow pull those posts through to the front-end. So this is really nice because this is a bit of a parallel to WordPress where you can create posts except the difference being that we have complete control over what we create. So the way that we would create posts obviously 
uh, because we are linking to the content management system in on the back end and then we want to link to something on the front end we need a database um, model to be the glue between the two so anything we create in the database model in terms of structure needs to to remain um, need, needs to stay there throughout uh, so so when we hit save we want it to save to the database so that it uh, that it remains constant so uh, what, what is really cool about that is that we can actually define exactly what we want to have in our post. So let's do that. Let's go to our models.py file and um, I'm going to delete this first line here because I don't want it. All I'm really interested in is uh, the Django DB models uh, uh, class or library. This is helpful because it pulls in everything model related into this file which is really nice because I want to use some stuff from the model. So what we're now going to do is we're now going to create a Django class and then in the same way that we did in our previous lectures uh, we added when we added attributes to our classes so in our to do's app we added it is complete boolean attribute and a title string attribute we can now add attributes to our post class. So I'm going to create a post class. So let's go class and then uh, post, uh, open close brackets and colon. And now we can add our attributes to our class. Now this is really nice because what Django does is it will allow you to create a class and then you can create a migration on this class and then run that migration and it will map this class to the database and what you'll notice is when we when once we've created this and we go back to our admin area uh, the these uh, fields will or attributes will um, will be created and we can fill those in every single time we create a post so that is really really helpful um, before we actually create our class I want to add one more library so this is how we add multiple libraries so I'm going to select the um, section of Django that um, I want you to pull in the library from. So it, it is from the Django base library. And then there is a special library, a uh, sub library in that called utils. And then from that, I want to import the time zone class. So the reason that I'm importing the time zone class is because we are working with posts, I would like to set a publish date to our posts. Um, and I don't want to have to worry about coding something like a uh, date and time manually. I would rather let Django handle this. So that is where this utility function comes in and other utility functions come in really, really handy. Cool. Let us now create our uh, class. So what I would like to do is I would like to create a post as a child class of the base model class which sits in Django, which will then give us access to everything that that model class has. Now, we spoke briefly about child classes. Uh, we didn't really discuss any examples earlier on in the uh, previous section, but I will be covering them briefly now, and hopefully they'll make a little bit more sense to you. So the way that you, you uh, create a reference to a parent class within a child class is you actually have to call that class as um, in in the in the parameters uh, of the child class, so we need to go to look in the models library, and we want there is a class in the models library called, oopsie, uh, called model, and this is now going to tell uh, Django that we want the post class to be a child of the base model class. Now this is really useful because it gives us access to everything that the base model class has, uh, which you will see now. So the first thing that I would like to do is I would actually like to create an author for this post. So the way that we can create an author is by just creating the attribute called author and then saying author is equal to something. Now I want to use something called a foreign key. So a foreign key is something that is built in to the base model class of Django. So I can simply just call foreign key here and Django will know what I'm talking about. 
so so when I say foreign key, I mean a, a referencing key to another table. So the other table that I'm talking about is this users table or this this users application because I want to link my post author to an actual user. So if we had to go into my admin account now, you would see that my user has got an ID of one. Now, while I was testing this earlier, I created another user ID uh, just so that you could uh, see what I'm talking about. And what you will notice is if I create a, another user ID after this, this number will now increment. But at the same time, this will never change. So if I created a first user, his user ID or her user ID would be one. And the second user that I created, user ID would be two. Even if I delete that user, that ID will, own, will be the only user ID that is ever two. So now if I create a third user, even though the second user has been deleted, that two will stay constant and this will now increment to three. So there we go, user three. So this is the ID that I want to pull in and this is what is the foreign key. If you are not sure what the foreign key is for a specific thing, go into that model in the backend or admin area and you'll be able to see it as an identifier here. So user ID three, cool. So uh, in here, what I would like to do is I would like to refer to that somehow. So this is actually a function. And then I'm going to call, let's see what library users from. It's from the auth library. I'm sure you can see that. The auth library. Uh, and then it's just the user. So the, the user class. So we want to go auth dot user. And now we should have a user created. Now, what you will notice as well is that if we suddenly had to refresh up, I think we're already getting an error there. Name model isn't defined. Uh, it's models. There we go, because we imported it from models. Uh, okay, lovely. Uh, Django is really good with that. If we make a mistake, the console will tell us very quickly. So if we now had to refresh this, you will still notice that we don't have any posts here. Why not? Well, the reason for that is that we have not yet created any migration. So we have not mapped this model to the database at all. So I think as a, a an exercise, um, we will do that quickly and then we will create the rest of our post uh, and then we will map those to the database. Uh, as well after that. So we've we've already got something to work with here. So this is great. Um, I, I don't think we need anything else other than this to create our model. So let's run it and then let's see what happens. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, control C to, to just, just cancel that server for now. And then what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to create that migration. So the way that we do that, as we do with any of the shell commands, is we say python uh, manage.py, and then we run a, a function that we've never seen before, which is make migrations. And this doesn't actually do the migration, but it makes a migration file and, t and, and sets up the migration so that we can do the migration if we want to. And uh, if you don't pass a parameter into here, it'll assume that you want to migrate everything on the site. We don't because we have already migrated our uh, users and some of our base things. So I would like to keep this as specific as possible. As a rule of thumb, you should try to keep this as specific as possible as well. So I want to s specifically migrate the blog application. So if I hit return now, it's going to create our blog migration. So if we go back into blogs and we go into migrations, you'll see it's added a new file here. And it's actually telling the Django database what you create. We want to create an ID, which it does by default, which is our auto incremented ID. And we want to create an author, which is a foreign key. So this will now get mapped to our database. We don't have to touch this file at all. This is purely for Django 
to, to have a look at and to create the database connection. So now that we've actually made uh, some sort of uh, provision for the migration, we can actually now go and make the migration. And this is a command that you should recognize. Uh, if I go back, you should, no, it's not back. So it's, and this command is just migrate. And again, I want to now pass the name of my app into this migrate. So here it's making, uh, my, make migrations is making provision for the migration. And then the migrate command is actually creating the migration. So if I hit enter here, it is actually performing the migrations, running the migrations. So now if we go back to the admin area of our site, this migration has been created. So if we refresh our pay, oopsie, uh, we need to first uh, run our server again. No errors. If we refresh this page, uh, we will not see anything. Yes, sorry. So so now so now uh, if we if we had to look in a database client, we would see that that migration has been created, but we haven't linked it up to the admin area yet. Now I know at this stage it might seem a bit tedious to have to constantly link everything, but what what you'll see now is that it is really quite a simple uh, process to link up our model to the admin area. And basically all we do to link it up to the admin area is we just keep that um, admin in there. And then what we want to do is we just want to pull our posts model into this. So we say from uh, dot models import post. And now it's pulling in our post from the models. Lovely. So now we have access to our post class. Then all we want to do is we just need to register that model in the uh, admin area. So we do that by saying admin dot site, which is an attribute, and then we have to call the function which is register. Cool. And what you just need to remember about this is that that uh, the Django admin area is not something that is set up default by Django. Django, you actually have to set up the Django area yourself. So we've done that now. We've we've set up that admin area. So if you want Django to function as a content management system, as I did mention before, this is how you would do it. So I'm passing the post uh, class into this uh, register function, and now it is creating. Uh, or giving the admin area access to this post class. So we can have models sitting within our application that you can't see in the admin area. Sometimes this is useful for various things. Uh, still nothing, let us run our server again. Sometimes you need to reset your Django server for these changes to take effect. Uh, Still nothing. I am a little bit confused about this. Uh, I think the final thing admin dot site dot register uh, admin uh, from models dot post. Let's remove the dot there. That is still not. Ah, there we go. Sorry, 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 sorry. I'm sitting in the authorization section and not the main section. So, so now you can see that we have our posts here and we can create a new post. This is really, really cool. So we now have access to our blog application and then our posts model. Um, if we go into our post model and we add a new post, you can now see that we have access to our author and we can choose which uh, user we want as our author and when we select this it will pre-select that foreign key field that we spoke about. You don't really have to worry about that as a Django administrator because all you see is the name of the admin. Hi there. In the last uh, tutorial lecture we looked at creating our uh, first iteration of the post class and we just added the author attribute to that. And then when we went to our actual uh, admin area, we were able to add a post with just the author. 
So that is great. But what if we want to have more than just an author? Well, let's have a look at that now. So I think that some other fields that we should have, which would be interesting, uh, should be title. And then uh, let's call the models a library as before. And then there, here we can define what type of attribute we want it to be. And this will be mapped to a very specific type of field in the database. So we want to map this to a var char field in the database, which is a char field here. And this tells Django that we want it, when we make the migration, that we want it to be a char field or a character field. And I'm going to pass the max length uh, value into this as well. And what that's going to do is that's obviously going to set a max length to this title. So the title can never be longer than 150 characters. Something else that I also want to set to true is uh, null. Now this is probably not the greatest idea um, for this point, but for some reason, if we want our title field to, to possibly be null, then we can set this to true, which means that we don't have to set our title uh, field. Uh, okay, cool. Then the next field that I want to set is the text field. And I want the text field to be equal to something very similar to the uh, char field, except it is actually a special type of field called text. And uh, this is slightly different to the char field uh, and used in a slightly different way. Uh, text fields are usually used when you have long descriptions and long pieces of text where you have a very, very um, high uh, number of characters, then you can use a text field. A char field is usually when it is a bit shorter and you want to limit it uh, for the sake of space and you know it's not really going to get that big. Cool. So uh, that is good enough for us. Let's also set the null here uh, equal to true so that we know that it can be something that is empty. Then the last thing that I want to add for now is the created date. Now this is something that we won't be able to manually set when we create our post because all it's going to do is it's just going to um, pull in the date time from, from when it is actually saved initially. And that is a special type of field again, which is a date time field. And this is specific to uh, how it is mapped to the database once again. And now we can make use of our lovely time zone function. So we can push this default value, which uh, we, we can pull in here. So, so any of these other ones can also have a default value. And we want the default value to be time zone dot now. And what this will do is it will set the default time zone to now. So what I want to do, uh, now, I mean, there's a couple of other things that we could do to improve this, but I just want to run the migrations on this particular model uh, and see what happens. So let's first close down our server and let's run our make migrations for our blog. Fantastic. So we've added these uh, three fields to our blog and we are going to now actually make that migration as we've done before. And it successfully made our migration. So what you'll notice now as well is if we go to our migrations folder, there's a new uh, migration that is created and it has a dependency on our first one. So if somebody now had to set this project up or we had to set this project up on a different uh, environment, so on a, on a development server, on a different development server, on a production server, we could just run this migration and it would run through all of our migrations and just add the, the relevant database fields uh, and tables and columns um, as it needs to. So that is really convenient for us. So now we've run that. Let's just run our server again run server, no errors, and let's refresh this posts and see what happens when you add a new post. Great, now we have a title, a text field, and a created date. This is not really something that we want to be able to change, but we can deal with that later if we need to. So now, if we set the admin, and we set the title to hello world, and this is some text. We can actually just hit save here. 
that's very happy to do that and now we have our post being saved now something that I don't really like about this which I feel that we need to to uh, sort out now is that post object is really not the greatest way to um, define this uh, I would I would rather have the title being pulled in so I would rather have it say hello world then as opposed to post object this is the flexibility that Django gives you it allows you to set these various things but if you don't set it it, it more than likely is going to default to something uh, quite quite ugly looking so let's go back to our model and what we need to do now is we need to create something called a two string function and what a two string function means is when we call our object so uh, obviously it's being called here what is going to be returned so in this case the post object is going to be returned I would much rather return the post title as opposed to the whole object because it just looks a lot cleaner so let's create a new uh, method in our function and the way that we create this two string method is double underscore the same way that we did our double underscore in it for um, our constructor method uh, in earlier lectures we go double underscore and then str for string and then open close brackets colon and then because we're dealing with the instance of uh, a class we have to pass the self variable in and then by default um, and this is actually coming from the default model class uh, this this two string function we want to now uh, create our own variation so instead of just returning self as the default function would look we want to return self dot title and this is now going to return the title so hopefully if we let me just refresh the server sometimes it is good to just reload your server to make sure everything is working as it should and you refresh this you can now see that we are pulling in the title here as opposed to just self so if we change this back to self I have no doubt that this is going to look terrible yep and it is even giving us an error so so yeah it's saying that we are returning something that is a non-string so I mean if, if we wanted to change this to the text for example we could very well do that and this is some text so I think I'm going to keep it for the, to the title for now and then we are going to expand on this a little bit and have a look at how we can bring this into the front end in our next lecture hi there in the last lecture, we looked at creating posts within our Jagman, Django admin area. In this lecture, we are going to be looking at how to pull something through to the front end of our site. So the way that we do this is using Django's powerful routing or routing system. And what that does is it looks for a specific route in the URL uh, and then Django tries to decipher that and match it to either a regular expression or a static string and then render something back to the user. So the way that we would do this in Django is by opening up our urls.py file and, and um, creating a set of urls that Django can try and find. So what you'll notice firstly is that we have a list called URL patterns and then um, it, it will then create a list of URL patterns. So uh, what we want to do to create our own route would be to call this URL pattern as they, um, that as it has been done before and then we want to pass something in here. So what you will notice is that our admin area URL has already been created for us and that route or route is passed in as the first parameter to this URL function. The second parameter uh, for the sake of this example is uh, the name of an application as well as the file as well as the um, as well as the function within that file so uh, the only application that we've created at this point is the blog application and we want to pull the views.py file into this blog application so uh, well, well into this uh, urls.py from the blog, blog application so the way that we would do this is to firstly create the route that we are that we are looking for I'm going to keep the route empty because I wanted to load when no parameters are set 
So that would be if we had to refresh this page where there are no additional parameters in the URL. The second thing that I want to do is I want to pass the name of the view uh, and the function that we are looking for. Now at the moment we don't have access to our blog application and the views file and any functions inside of this file because we have not imported it into this file. So the way that we import it into our URLs file is we say from and then we need to call the application which is the blog application and then we need to say import and then the name of the file that we want to import which is the views file. Now we may well have a, a lot more applications than just the blog application so using the keyword views here uh, may be a bit ambiguous so I'm going to say as blog views and what this will do is it will give more specificity to our, um, our blog views. So now that we've got this file I can now call this file as the, the second parameter and now I want to call a function from within this file. Now if we had to open up our views file within our blog application you will see that, there, that uh, no functions have been created. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a function and I'm going to call this function home. Now what you'll notice about this is that we don't need to pass the self variable uh, or parameter into this function because it does not exist within the context of a class. It is a standalone function. Something that we do however need to pass into this function is the request parameter. Now you don't have to worry too much about that at this stage. Um, what the request parameter basically is, is it holds any get or post requests that might be sent with the root uh, to this particular view. Uh, the next thing that we want to do is we just want to return something back to the user when they request this specific URL, which is nothing, uh, and it is calling our home function, which we have just created. So what we want to return is a page template. And the way that we create page templates and we turn them back to the users is by creating a folder within our application called templates. And then um, within our render function, which we've just imported, we can call that function. We pass our uh, root from within our templates folder. So we are now assuming that this is the base of our templates folder. Um, and, and we are calling the file within that. So I'm going to create a new folder within our templates folder called pages and then a new file called home.html. And I'm going to save this and now I'm going to create the new folder called pages. And I'm sure you can see how this is being mapped. And then a new file called home html great so now we should ideally we want to see home.html echoed out uh, on the front end in our browser one last thing that we do need to do is to pass the request into this uh, function as well now the reason for this is that if we want to to pull anything into our template from our request we can do that here it is a compulsory parameter within the render function so it will give us an error if we don't pass it in. Now when we save this let's just quickly run through this process again and then we can uh, maybe I'll let you guess what happens when uh, we refresh the front end of the site without passing in any any routes uh, to the URL. So uh, we are adding a new uh, instance of our uh, URLs to this URL patterns. We are creating a base instance with no parameters in it. So if we just load the site without any um, uh, parameters in the root. And then we are loading the blog views uh, file, which is the views file because we've set the views file within the blog application as blog views. And then we are calling the home function within that and the home function is passing in the request as a parameter and then it's returning the render function which renders pages forward slash home.html within our templates folder that is sitting in our application and that's going to look something like that. So now if we had to refresh this page you will now see that we have how home.html file successfully re uh, rendered. Well done guys. 
as just to to uh, make my points a little bit clearer i'm going to now change this to something static so let's say uh, test so now if we had to refresh the front page of our site you will notice that our our empty route no longer exists however it does tell us uh, that there are two other possible routes that we could use so if we had to now say forward slash test we should get our home.html file registered or rendered great well done guys um yeah see you in the next lecture hi uh welcome back to uh th this uh next part of the lecture. So in the last lecture we discussed how to pull something into the front end of our site using uh, Django's advanced routing system uh, and connecting to our views and then rendering a template. So um, I want to create a short lecture on regular expressions and how regular expressions work. The reason that I'm mentioning regular expressions uh, which are usually seen as a bit of uh, a boogeyman of the uh, of the web development industry. Uh, the reason that I mention them is because they are extremely useful when it comes to creating patterns for URLs within Django's routing system. Now, I'm going to talk about a very specific type of regular expression or a very specific pattern. Now, what a, a regular expression is, is if you don't understand uh, what I'm talking about, is basically just a pattern that gets uh, passed through uh, so, so a specific string or a, a set of numbers or something will get passed into a regular expression and it will either return true or false to see if that specific string matches the pattern or the conditions set out by the regular expression. So now I'm just going to talk a little bit about uh, the regular expression that I want to use and hopefully it will make a little bit more sense. So the regular expression uh, that I want to use, I'm going to paste it on the screen quickly, quickly is let's call this, I actually copied this from a previous project of mine. So this is a regular expression here. So what we would do uh, is we would pass this regular expression into the um, into the parameter of the first parameter of our URL, and we would try and get uh, our root to match this regular expression. So what on earth does this mean? It really just looks like a bunch of random characters. Well. Uh, I have opened up the Python reg regex uh, regular expression cheat sheet um, up on my Mac and I'm going to paste the regular expression up into the uh, URL bar over here and let's see if we can find uh, everything that this regular expression matches. So the first thing in our regular expression is the open brackets. Now, what you'll notice is they coincide with closing brackets uh, over here on the other side of our regular expression, basically indicating that within these two brackets, we have a regular expression group. Now, if you look throughout, uh, well, here is, is, the, is the example we're looking for, uh, open close brackets indicates a regular expression group or something inside uh, of a group. So, that is what the, the brackets part of this means. Uh, I want to just quickly jump to the end of this regular expression just so that we can so that I can show you uh, what indicates the end of a regular expression. So we've got this forward slash and then we've got the dollar sign. So if we have a look at our uh, regular expressions, you'll see that the dollar sign indicates the end of the string. So basically we are looking for a group of characters followed by a forward slash, and then followed by nothing afterwards, because the forward slash will be the last thing in our regular expression because this dollar indicates the end of the string. Cool, so let's go back to the beginning of our regular expression again. What does this question mark P mean? So if you look here at this particular example, the question mark P followed by something inside of our um, angle brackets, uh, which in this case is username, indicates 
a group named something. So y in this case would be the placeholder y that is inside of these angle brackets. So we are calling this particular group uh, usernames. Then the next thing which, which actually relates to matching our regular expression is these square brackets, uh, the dash, and then this backslash w. Now what does that mean? So what happens when we use square brackets in a regular expression? It means that we should match something in our regular expression. So um, let's have a look at this example here. So a, b, dash, d means match one character of a, b, c, d. So it goes alphabetically from a, b, and then all the other letters up to d. So this, um, this uh, up arrow uh, or up chevron is, uh, is the accept character. So um, this particular regular exp expression matches one character except for a, b, c, or, uh, a, b, and then everything up to d. So c will be included in that. So that's what these square brackets mean. These square brackets mean to match something. So that's something that we match is the dash um, and then this backslash w. So backslash w is one word character, which basically means that this needs to be a specific word. And this dash means that it can also contain a dash. So a specific word that contains um, a dash. So, so this, this is really matching any one word. Okay, so what we're doing here is we're creating a group um, called username that contains one word uh, that, that ends when we see our forward slash uh, and then you don't actually, you don't actually count the dollar sign, uh, it's just an indicator that we don't need to match anything after the dollar sign. Then what does this plus mean? Let's have a look uh, over here and you'll see uh, one or more. So one or more instances of the last pattern that we found, which was everything inside of the square brackets. So what this means for us is that we can have multiple instances of one word, which means we can have more than one word um, with dashes in them. So really what this regular expression is matching is a group of words uh, which collectively will be called username um, followed by a forward slash and then nothing after that. So an example of something that would match this could be something like test forward slash and this would match our regular expression. Something like test dash would also match our regular expression. Something like test dash test would also match our regular expression. So this is a very very ambiguous regular expression as it matches uh, a whole lot of things but it, the, with the only exceptions being that it needs to to uh, be URL like in structure. Cool, uh, in the next lecture we will talk about how to apply this regular expression uh, to our uh, Django site. If you didn't understand uh, what I'm t what I speak what I was speaking about in this lecture. If none of this made sense to you and you were completely confused, don't worry too much about it. We are not going to come back to regular expressions uh, within this series. Um, it is just helpful to know that they are around and that they are used to match uh, patterns in Django and in the URL system. Uh, hi there, welcome back. Cool, so in this lecture we are going to be covering uh, how we can add variables to what is rendered uh, in our templates. So this relates very close to um, what we were speaking about in the last lecture with regards to regular expressions. Now something that I just want to point out that I missed is that uh, this uh, dollar sign indicates the end of the string while the uh, up chevron uh, by itself indicates the start of a string. So as you can see in, in the example above this for the admin area, this is actually matching a regular expression where admin is the start of the string. So there, so there's nothing in front of the word admin. If we removed this and we typed out something like radmin, 
uh, it would it would match this particular regular expression. But because we've got this chevron here, it, it only starts matching our regular expression from the beginning of our string. Lovely. So this is our regular expression that we've created. And this is really going to match anything on our site because it's going to be any valid uh, URL string, really. So what I want to do is I want to make this a little bit more specific and then just say username here. So now what this will do, actually we need to pass this at the beginning of our string because we we always want to put the beginning of our string regular expression indicator at the beginning of our string. So we are now calling a regular expression that contains the static string of username forward slash and then anything that is matched so this is really uh, what we spoke about in the last lecture followed by another forward slash and then the end of our regular expression so the example um, an example that would match that would be something like username rich forward slash this would match our regular expression something like ss username forward slash rich would not match our regular expression because uh, this ss would not match it because it is not the start of our string and it is not followed by a forward slash because the forward slash is required in our regular expression and if we added anything after this it wouldn't match our regular expression either because uh, this dollar sign is saying end the pattern match uh, at the end of the forward slash Awesome. So now, um, what is the reason for this? Well, now we can pass in username forward slash anything, and it should be able to render our blog views. So if we refresh this page, again, it's going to give us nothing. And it's actually showing us our regular expression that we can match as a pattern to render a root. So I'm going to say forward slash username forward slash rich and then make sure we have our final forward slash and uh, home got an unexpected keyword argument username. Well, this is exactly the kind of error that we want. So basically what's happening is username is now getting passed into our view or our, our, our home um, function within our view. This is really cool, which means that we can actually use our username, so in this case rich, uh, to render something in our view. So if we are creating a, a user login system, we can say, hi, username, and it would echo out the word rich. Now, Django has a very specific templating language that we are going to speak about later on in this lecture, but I just want to um, sort out everything in our URLs file before we move on to that. So, um, in our URL function, we can pass a third parameter into this function. And that parameter um, will have a name. So we say name is equal to, and then we need to pass something in here. So I want to pass the username that we've just received in our regular expression. Uh, and, and the username is the group of um, all of our, our um, characters between the username forward slash and the final forward slash. So everything in between uh, these two will now get passed into our view. So that's great. Now what we can do in our, uh, our views.py file is we can create provision to receive that username. And let's call that username. And now we have access to our username variable within this particular um, function. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a um, what well, well, what is essentially uh, an array called context that we can pass into our um, into our view. And the reason that I am creating this array is because we may well want to pass more than just the username into this at a later stage. So uh, then what we can do is we can 
uh, pass our context variable as a third parameter into our render function and anything that is within our context array will now be rendered uh, to the home.html so we can use that using Django's special templating, templating language so what I'm going to do here is I'm actually going to set uh, a variable which I can call whatever I want uh, it actually needs to be a string so I'm going to say current user no current user and then I'm going to give current user so this is the the uh, the key here or the index here and the value of that is going to be our username uh, which is passed in through our URL parameter so now we should have access to our current user key in our template uh, and that will have the value of our username which has just been passed in into our template so this is all working great except we are not actually using our uh, our username at all within our home.html template so what you can see is now we have the username regular expression being matched if we add anything after this you'll see that it doesn't work because it's no longer matching our regular expression so now let's add our um, let's 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 make use of Django's powerful templating engine and add our username to the template so I'm going to copy this username and now what is really cool about this is we can use two curly braces like that which is Django's special templating uh, language indicator to say uh, we want you to now jump out of the HTML and we want you to jump into uh, Django's templating language it, it is almost the same as within WordPress uh, when you when you put PHP tags inside of a an HTML file except uh, that would be uh, an example dot PHP file where this is an actual HTML file that's where the entire contents are getting passed into Django and then the templating engine is rendering um, the the uh, the Django um, content as part of the HTML file. Now this is really nice if you are working with somebody who is specifically a front-end developer and they don't want to worry about any of this Django stuff. You can just give them this file and show them how to uh, how to use these uh, tags and how and what variables that need to be passed in and they can simply use this and wrap HTML around it however they see fit. So if I had to create an H1 tag and I had to put this inside of the H1 tag, we should now just get the current user echoed out, which is really, really cool. So let me say uh, hi, comma, current user. So uh, this, this should say hi, comma, rich. So let's refresh this page. Fantastic, and now we have hi, comma, rich. And with that being said, if we wanted to now change this to something else, we could do that and we could say uh, test or whatever we wanted to here. Again, if we didn't match a regular expression, this would not work. Hi there. In our previous lecture, we looked at how uh, to use Django's templating language and how to pull dynamic values into our site's front end uh, using Django's routing system. We also made use of regular expressions and we created a uh, function that generates, uh, that, that, that renders an HTML page. In this lecture, we are going to be focusing more on the blog side of things. So what we are going to be doing is pulling our blog posts into the front end um, of our site. So that is quite exciting. That's something new that we've never done before. And this is the first time that we're going to be linking the back end and the front end of the site together. So the way that Django does this is by, um, well, what we all need to do is uh, to import the, the model into this views file. So the model from the blog application to the model in the views uh, file within the blog application. So we do that by saying from... And then what we want to do is we want to call the application which our uh, model can be found in. Let me say blog dot 
models. So now we are searching through all of the models uh, from from all of the models within our blog application, and we want to import the post model. And this brings in everything relating to the post model, including the database record. So if we go to our model, so you can see we have our post model, which is uh, in the form of a class. So that's really cool. So now we have access to this post model and we can run functions on the class that gets pulled in. So if we go post and then we can say dot objects, which is a special attribute that uh, is, is now telling Django that we want to query all of the objects on the post class or and then we need to specify what function we're going to run on all the the um, objects and the all function is just going to return every single instance of every single object saved into our database of the post class or the post model so that's really nice um, now what we want to do is we want to be able to pass all of these um, posts into our template so what we'll do is I'll create a new variable called posts and I will say it's equal to that and then I'll pass the posts variable into our template. So I'll do that by saying posts is equal to posts. So there's nothing really special about this. This is the standard way of uh, pulling models into a Django template. Uh, if we wanting to add, wanted to add any special parameters to this, we would use a different function and we could actually pull those parameters in through our URL. Uh, which we'll be looking at a little bit later. So here you can see we're actually pulling the posts into the template, which is going into our context uh, variable. So what we should be able to do now is just call our posts uh, variable in our template. Now, one thing that uh, is, is a little bit tricky about this is that posts is returning a set of records and not a single value. So this is in essence going to try and print out an array. So if we had to refresh this page, you would see that this would not work at all. Uh, it would say uh, the reason that it's not working, post is equal to open post that view. Da, 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 da. Let's have a look. That might not be what the problem is. Post is equal to posts. That is, oh, we are using the equal sign here. We are not supposed to use the equal sign. We're supposed to use a colon. Okay, let's see what happens if we refresh the site. And you'll see that we get a query set returned. So this is great. That It doesn't really uh, look fantastic from a semantic point of view, but it is pulling in something. So if we had to now create another another post so let's say another admin and this is a test post and this is test 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 and we had to save this and we had to refresh the front of our page we would now have access to that post as well and the same way that within our model when we return the post we are returning the title the title is now being returned here so if we had to now change this to for example text and we had to refresh the front page, you will see that the text now comes in. So that's where this uh, two string method that we spoke about a few lectures ago comes in. But this is not really ideal. We don't want to just return the title. We would like to return more than just that. So what we would need to do here is actually create a loop and loop through every single instance of our posts. So within the Django templating, templating language, there is a special way to create conditional logic or to uh, create our loop functionality. So the way that we do that is instead of using two curly braces uh, or two sets of curly braces, we will use one set of curly braces and then have the percentage sign on either side. So now what this indicates is that there's going to be a block of functionality in here. So what we're going to do here is say, for because it's a for loop and then say for post which is now going to be the single item in posts and now this is really just Django's templating language um, 
a way of doing things. So uh, this is this is brand new. I've never shown you this before, um, and I'm just copying this line of code just for the sake of um, simplicity. So four posts in posts, and then we just need to end our for loop. So we can just say end for, and now we should be able to echo out our posts. So the same way that we did before with our double curly brackets. So now we can just say post. Now what I want to do as well, uh, just to make this look a bit nicer, is to create an unordered list tag to put this inside of here, uh, and then to create our list item inside of the for loop. So every new item will be, every new post will be a list item. So if we are to refresh this now, it would print out these uh, two posts. Now this is still not the greatest because we don't want to, to, this is returning the entire post, we just want to return the title and although the title is being displayed here, it is only working because within our model uh, when we return the entire post the title is being returned. So we want to say post.title and now we are specifically querying the title of the post. Great, and now we're getting the title. So what I want to be able to do from here is to actually link through to the single post. So the way that we would do that is by creating an anchor tag and putting our post title inside of the anchor tag. So what is really nice about this as well is that we can actually call our post's ID, the identifier that is created. So even though in our model we did not explicitly specify an ID, we still have an ID um, that is auto-incremented and is created with every single model. So we can actually just say uh, links to post.id and then we can save that. And now when we refresh it, if we look, if we click on this, even though it's, it's saying nothing, we can see that that ID of one is being pulled through. So maybe a better way of doing this is to, just for the sake of our example is to uh, say dash one. So when we uh, go back to our previous page, you can see this is one and this is equal to two. So although uh, the, the ID doesn't really have any relevance to us, it is great for when we want to query a specific post. Now in the next lecture, we are gonna talk about how to create a single view for these posts using this ID as a reference. Hi there. In the last lecture, we looked at how to pull posts into our um, view using Django's model import and using the query uh, as well as passing it in as a variable and then using a for loop within our template to iterate through uh, the results that were returned. In this lecture, I want to go over how to create a single post view and how to link that through on our, uh, on our archive view, which is now kind of our home uh, template, and, and how to pull in the title, the text, the author, um, etc. into our single posts view. So the first thing that I want to do is to go back into our URLs file and create a specific URL that is going to match our single templates view. So let's just copy this one for now. Uh, and then I'm going to replace some of these variables. So the first thing is here, instead of saying username, I'm just going to say post. So Ideally, we need to clean this up a little bit. We, we, we don't necessarily want this to be a username. We may want to call it posts or post archive or home or, or, or nothing at all here. Uh, and I, as we did before, just, just uh, having the, the blank view. But we're not going to worry about that now. So we're creating a new one called post. And this is going to pull in a single post ID. So let's call this single because we know that it's a single post. So this regular expression group is going to be called single. And likewise, we're going to pass single into, um, into this new function that we are going to create. And when we actually link 
uh, the post in our anchor tag, um, the the single group that's going to be pulled in is going to be the ID of that post because the ID is the best way to uh, to distinguish that post in the URL. Um, this is because you may have more than one post with the same title. So uh, an another way that might be better um, for SEO reasons is to create an additional uh, model var char field called slug and then possibly pass the slug in and then just make sure that your slugs are unique for every single post so that no post has the same slug but for the purposes of this I'm just going to use the ID so it's not really going to look great in the URL but it will get the job done. So if we go back to our URLs file uh, we now need to call a function uh, which which I think would still be good uh, from our blog views perspective I don't think it's necessary for us to create anything new um, at that point other than a new function in our views file uh, called single. So what this is going to do is when when this particular URL regular expression is matched it's going to try and find the single function within our blog's views. So let's actually go ahead and create that function. So let's say uh, define and then our function is single. Open close brackets colon and then just remember to pass the request variable into this and now the new variable that we can pass in here as we did with username before is now single and now single is going to be mapped to the ID which is great so now we have access to that ID so we might as well finish off this function uh, so what I'm going to do then is I'm actually going to now try get our single post so I'm going to create a new a variable called single and then this is going to be equal to something uh, and then we are going to create our context variable again over here so let's just copy our context well let's not copy it because it's going to be completely different uh, context is equal to uh, this new array and then we are going to have let's call it post so that we know that it's a post and posts value is going to be the value that is passed in for uh, this single over here. So this is really the ID and then I'm reassigning the ID here to, to what I would expect to, to get back as the entire post. Then the final thing that we need to do in here before we uh, query our single post is to return a view. So let's just copy or return a template. Let's just copy this particular one for now. Uh, and, it's, and we're going to go pages, home.html. I don't want it to be home.html. I want it to be single.html. Uh, I've already created single.html. So let's delete that and we can uh, recreate it again. Um, and uh, you'll see inside of here, we still need to pass the context variable into this. So what do we need? To what query do we call to, to get our single to now have the instance of a single post with the ID of the single uh, parameter that's being passed into this function via the URL. So the way that we do this is again we target the, the uh, post uh, object. So we will say post and then we say dot objects again because now we want to run this on, on all of the objects and then we're going to run again another specific function. This function is going to be slightly different because we don't want to return all of the objects. We want to get an object that matches a specific parameter. So I'm going to use the get function and what I can do in here is I can pass conditions into this get function. So if we go back to our models we can see we have author, title, text, created date and the implicit uh, auto incremented ID. So we can actually say ID in here is equal to something, an integer. So we can easily just pass our single variable here which will be passed in through uh, into this function and it's going to be called here in our URL. So for example if this was uh, let's see in the context of this this regular expression would match 
post forward slash one. And what this would do is it would pass in one as the single uh, variable here where ID is now equal to this one. Great. So now we are able to uh, create, we are, we are able to, to render a single page if the ID is passed in. So as I had earlier, um, what I had previously created was the single.html file. So let's just create that again, single.html, and uh, we can save this, single.html. And, and what I want to do here is because we're just passing the, the post variable in here as a single, we can easily just say, as I did earlier, we can easily just say post dot title. Now, I think it would be really cool is if we wrap this in h1 tag uh, for the title. And because we have access to everything in this post now, we can easily just say p and then we can put our post description in here. So post, sorry, it's not actually description, I think it's called text. So that's coming from here. Uh, we can also put our author in here. So let's put the author in here as well. So by, and then we are going to say post dot author. Now the chances are that this is going to return a, an author object or an author ID. So what I want to do here is just have a look quickly in our back end and go to our uh, users. And it's going to be the username field that we're looking for. So let me just say, uh, going to this, say admin, for example, and it is the username field. So I'm going to pass author dot username. And let's see if that works. Then the next thing that we are going to do is to actually test to see if this works. So we don't really need to create our anchor tag just yet. We, we are going to create it as soon um, over here so that so that, it, that it, it will actually link to the correct place. But we could just as easily pass it into our URL uh, manually. So we could say post equal to one. And there we go. This is great. We now have our, our post equal to one and we are echoing out our uh, h1 by admin and then we're echoing out some text so that is really really cool we we have a a functioning single post system so the last thing that we really need to do in this file is to fix up our anchor tag over here so what you might think is we should be able to just say post forward slash post id and then another forward slash so I mean, I mean, this this kind of makes sense uh, that that this would work. So if we went to the front end of our site, went back to our page, and now when we click on this, for some reason this does not work. Why is that? Because it is going localhost, and then it is using a relative path. So because we are already on the username test path, as you can see here, all it's doing is it's just appending. Let me click on this. It's just appending post one onto that. Now this is not what we want. We want post one to, to be right at the beginning of our URL and we want to completely scrap username and test for now. So this is quite difficult to do um, with, without having to jump between directories. So what Django does have is a, a great utility function called URL. And what that allows you to do is to grab the base URL and pass uh, the view into that uh, that you want to call. So um, we can actually just call that straight in our Django templates. So because it is a functional piece of code and not echoing out something, we use our um, percentage signs. If we were echoing out something straight out, then we would use our double curly braces. Um, and then the utility function is called URL. So we, we're just calling that utility function and the um, view parameter that we're passing in is called single. 
uh, and then that that single links to uh, will automatically find this single um, URL here and will automatically find this single uh, function so that's that's really really great so we are echoing out the single well sorry we, we're getting the single view here and then we're passing a parameter into that single view and the parameter that we're passing in you guessed it well did you guess it I guess that's the question is post ID so if we click on this it's 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 going to find the uh, regular expression that matches this function um, and it's going to pass the post ID into that so if we save this and we refresh our uh, what is effectively our home page and we click on this you can now see that we are getting the correct URL this is great this is exactly what we want uh, well done for getting this far guys uh, see you in the next lecture hey again in this section I want to briefly clean up our uh, blog that we've set up a little bit and what I would like to talk about is separating templates into more than one file as well as adding some sort of CSS uh, and JavaScript framework to our site to make it look a little bit nicer. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, install the bootstrap framework into our uh, blog uh, system. So what I'm going to do for starters is to open up a new tab in my web browser and go to uh, do a Google search for Bootstrap. And that'll bring up the Bootstrap uh, CSS, HTML and JavaScript framework. So uh, what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to install this framework uh, on our uh, blog so that we can yeah so that it can look a little bit nicer so what I'm going to do is go to the get started page and then scroll down to the content delivery network section or the CDN section and what I'm do what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab the CSS uh, and the themed CSS as well as the JavaScript so I'm just going to copy uh, these two links here uh, go back to our home.html, paste in the, actually maybe better to format our HTML a little bit. So fortunately in Sublime Text there is a way by which you can generate uh, HTML tags. We're not going to get into that now, but just, just to add some sort of proper HTML formatting uh, to our new website. So let me put this just above the start of the body tag and then I'm going to copy the rest of my content to within the body tag. I just want to uh, format this just a little bit. Uh, and then I'm going to go back uh, into the Bootstrap website and I'm going to grab the JavaScript section. So what you'll notice here is that I'm loading my CSS at the beginning of the site and I'm loading my JavaScript at the end of the site. This is uh, best practice for HTML and CSS because uh, CSS needs to be set before anything is declared and it's best to run JavaScript at the end of your file so that if your JavaScript is trying to target any HTML elements um, it, it makes sure that they already exist before it tries to find them um, because it may throw an error saying this particular element does not exist and we're trying to target it uh, because it is declared after the JavaScript and that's why we put the JavaScript right at the bottom of our page. Cool, so let's go back to our site. Um, we shouldn't really see, we don't need Bootstrap anymore, we shouldn't really see too much changing here so if you will remember from our previous lecture uh, we need to pass username in and you'll see that uh, a bit of formatting has already taken place here. This is great. So we, we just have a new font and it just looks a little bit cleaner. Now if we had to click on hello world you would now see that our formatting goes back to the default formatting uh, that the fonts change it doesn't look as slick. So 
uh, what we would need to do here to get this to work is we would need to copy all of this into our single.html file. Now this is really not practical because what that what that really means is that we will have to copy and paste everything um, in this file into every single other file as well and then just swap out the um, content section. Now this really defeats the point of a content management system as what we are trying to do is to try uh, create as little static um, elements or as little static stuff on our site as possible um, and, and just keep it all dynamic if we can. So the way that I'm going to do that is I'm going to separate this uh, file into separate files and then I'm going to apply a, a, a partial template to, uh, well, well that separate file will be a partial template and then I'll apply that partial template to each of my other larger templates and, and then we should be able to avoid creating redundant code. So what I'm going to do is inside of my templates folder I'm going to create a new folder, folder and not folder, uh, new folder called partials. I hope I've spelled that correctly. Uh, and within partials, I'm going to create a file called header.html. Now, what you'll notice is if you've ever worked with themes in WordPress, that we are following a very similar um, structure here because WordPress by default has a header.php file. Uh, within the theme as well as a footer.php file. So we are going to create a header.html file and a footer.html file. And then what we can do, which is really great, is we can just grab the top section all the way up to the opening of the body tag um, and just cut that and uh, put that into our header.html file and then oops go back to our home.html and cut the bottom section and paste that into our footer.html file. So now we have access to these two files. That's great. And ideally what we want to do is we want to somehow include uh, header.html in here, oopsie, header.html, and uh, footer.html in here. Uh, and, and then the same thing will go for this. We will want a header.html here and then footer at the bottom. So the way that we do that is we use another special template function that Django has built in called the include uh, function. And what, what we will do is because um, we are now using functional code and not echoing out something like uh, we've, we've discussed in the past, we are going to start with our curly braces with the percentage signs in the middle, and then use the include keyword. Now, that this is basically a function um, within the, the syntax of Django's templating language, and this is followed by a parameter, and the parameter will be the name of the template that we want to pull in, with the templates folder being the root of this. So what we will need to do is we will need to call the partials path, and then the name of the file, which is header.html. Lovely, and we can save this. Uh, and then what we would need to do now is just uh, replicate that, except uh, have it pull in footer.html in the footer section. So include partials and then footer.html. Now what's really great about this is that we can copy this and paste it into our single .html file. We'll copy the footer and paste that into our single .html file. Great. Let's refresh the front page, uh, the front end of our site, and see what happens. Fantastic. You'll see that we still have our, our formatting retained here. And if we click on uh, the post, you'll see that this formatting is retained uh, throughout. So this is really great and something very useful about the way that Django works. Hi, in our previous lecture, we looked at how to separate our templates into partials so that we don't have to repeat ourselves when we are creating code. In this uh, next set of lectures, I want to chat about how to make our entire blog a little bit more WordPressy or bloggy. Uh, some concepts, concepts that I would like to discuss 
include categorization, uh, implementing a basic menu system, as well as pagination. Now, the first one of these three that I would like to talk about is pagination. So pagination is usually a very um, uh, underrated aspect of a, a website that, that has got multiple um, posts in an archive, but is still a very important part. So uh, fortunately for us, Django has got a great built-in pagination system, which we can pull into our view and which we would want to use in our uh, home view. So the first thing that I want to do, and something that has been uh, irritating me for a bit, is just to clean up our view a little bit so that when we load our home page, uh, our, our home page doesn't have to have that username parameter attached to it. So we can just pull in a uh, blog.home, and then within our views here, we can now remove this username parameter. Uh, we can delete it from here. And although it is great to have a context variable, uh, I'm going to show you how to pass this post variable straight into our render function. Then the next thing that we just make and uh, need to make sure that we do is to remove the current user. So I'm just going to put a home into here so that we know that it is on the home page. And if we had to now go to our base root of our site, we would now see home. Great. And this is exactly what we want. This is looking a lot cleaner than it did before. Cool. Um, maybe just add an HR tag here as well. And now we can see already it is looking a lot better. So um, within the context of uh, pagination, oh yes, I was also going to show you how to remove the context variable here. So all this is at the end of the day is, um, it's, it's actually um, an example of a dictionary, but I'm, I'm using the words dictionary lists and arrays interchangeably. Uh, the main difference between a dictionary and a list is the key a pair system and the fact that in a list you would use square brackets within it, whereas within a dictionary you use curly braces. This is not really too important. So really what we can do is we can just copy this and instead of calling our context variable, we can just open and close our, our curly braces and pass the, the um, dictionary straight into our render function. So really we can just do it like, like this. And if we refresh our front page, you'll notice that it all still works. So that's great. So we don't really need our context variable, but it, it does help just to, if we have a lot of variables, to, to pass it in at this point, as opposed to passing in a whole lot of variables uh, into our return function. So we don't really have a lot here, so we can do it like this. So the first thing that I want to discuss is how to pull in Django's pagination library into this file. So the way that we're going to do that as is how we have always imported libraries. We say from, and this is a Django core library. So Django.core, and then the library that we're looking for is the paginator library. So that's paginator. Great, and then we are going to import the paginator class from within that library. Because it is a class, it needs to be a capital letter, as it has been with um, Im importing classes in the past. So now we have access to this paginator class, and we can create an instance of the paginator class, and that is exactly what we are going to do. So uh, the first thing that I want to do is I want to change the name of this posts um, object here, because uh, when we return the posts to the to the, the template or through the view, we don't want to pass all of the posts in. We only want to pass the paginated post in. So let's say, for example, if we had six posts and we wanted to make them paginate on every two, we only want to send two posts at a time. And then we would divide uh, the six posts by three, which would give us three pages and two po uh, posts per page, as opposed to just returning all six. So I'm going to rename this to post list. And now we, we actually have a list of all of our posts, but we still want to return our, our posts here, which is, which is going to be a different variable that has access 
to uh, more than just the, the default objects. So the way that we give this posts variable access to to the, uh, the broader spectrum of what's going on in the pagination is to actually create an instance of the pagination and make our posts variable that instance. And it is clever enough, clever enough to work out to give us all of the functionality that we have within our a post object as well as everything that is attached to the paginator as well. So the way that we do that is by creating our posts uh, variable. So we say posts is equal to, and now we need to create a new uh, pagination instance. So um, I think the best way to do that is actually going to first be to create our paginator variable. So we say paginator is equal to, and then we create a class of paginator. And then um, we need to pass some variables into this in order to create it, so or parameters into it. So the first parameter is that we pass into the paginator when we create a new instance of the paginator class is the object um, that we want to paginate, which in this case is our list of posts. So we will pull that in there. And then the second parameter that we want to pull in is the number of posts to paginate on. So I'm going to do two for this example. So that means that we're going to paginate every two posts. So um, that might be a, a bit difficult for us at this point because we only have two posts. So um, before I go and create more posts, I think it for the, for the sake of ease, I'm just going to make it paginate on one, which means that we only ever see one post on every page and we can paginate through posts uh, one post at a time. Cool. So the next thing that we want to do is to make use of our request variable, which we've never done before. And the reason for this is because we want to fetch the, the get variable that would currently be sitting in the URL. So ideally our posts, um, our, our posts URL variable would look something like this. So let's say page is equal to one, and then we can get the pagination result at page one. And then when we click next or previous in our links, ideally that would go to page two and to page three or back to page two and back to page one. And that's how a basic paginator works. And if you would like to share a specific page or, or, or uh, paginated results with your friends online, you can copy the paginated uh, variable in as well, and it will give you that exact page which makes pagination very useful. So um, in, in that case, we are going to get the, uh, the page variable. So that we do that is we create a new variable called page, and then we can now call our request uh, variable, which was pulled in as a parameter into this. And now we choose what type of re uh, request we want to get. So our two options here really are get and post. So uh, if you are familiar with how HTML, um, uh, how HTML get and post requests work, you, you will know that posts get sent within the browser header and get uh, variables get sent within the URL. So we want a URL variable because it is a lot easier to pass a URL um, variable when, when going between states, between different browsers, between different people, saving bookmarks, uh, while a post variable is only maintained on the page's next refresh because it is passed into the header and it's not something that we can see. So maybe just a little bit too much information on that subject. Um, if you would like to find out more, you can always research get and post uh, variables or get and post HTML variables. Cool. So we want to run uh, a function to get a specific get variable and that'll be the get function. And the specific variable that we want to get is the page variable. So what this will now give us is uh, where we said question mark page is equal to one. This will now make our page variable here equal to one. And if we had to change that to two, uh, this would now pass in two. Cool. So now uh, the next thing that we need to do is to, uh, we have our page here, sorry. The next thing that we need to do is create something called a try uh, accept um, statement. So in PHP, it would be called a try catch statement. At the end of the day, uh, an accept uh, clause and a catch clause is really the same thing. So the way that a try accept statement works is we would write out the keyword try 
uh, and then again we put a colon and then we run a, a line of code here and then we would put uh, as many accept statements underneath that as as uh, as we like actually and what that'll do is it will say does this particular line match this exception that's given to us if so then run the exception underneath it um, Otherwise, if it doesn't match it, then just try, uh, just, just keep this as it is. So if it matches, and we can add multiple exceptions. If it matches any of these exceptions, then rather uh, run that code as opposed to this try code here. So this is very useful for if we are trying to um, display useful errors to our, um, to our users. So let's say this particular a code here returned a 404 error or a 500 error or whatever the case is then in here we can in a in a nice um, aesthetically pleasing way we can we can send a message back to our user so we aren't going to be using it for the sake of that at this point but rather to set our posts uh, variable so what we're going to try is we're going to try and set our posts variable equal to and now we are going to run a function on our newly created paginator object so this is going to be paginator dot page which is a function and then what this does is it says okay cool we this this is the list of posts that we want uh, which will eventually be passed into our template and uh, what we want to do is we want to get a specific page of those posts, bearing in mind that we only have one post per paginated result. So what this is going to do is this is actually going to return our paginated results. So we are going to try and see if we can get the paginated result at variable page, which will be the paginated result for one in this case. Lovely. And then we are going to write some exceptions uh, to see if if this doesn't pass for some reason, if this uh, posts page doesn't, if, if it matches one of these exceptions, then we want to do something else. So the first exception is a special uh, Django pagination exception called page not an integer. And basically what that does is that will get triggered if we put something in here that is not an integer, or if we put something in here that is not an integer so if we had to call page is equal to some random gibberish so that is a special uh, Django uh, pagination library and we call it by saying page not oopsie uh, not an integer and this is great uh, because we can literally just pull this library straight into our um, view from the core paginator class. So we would just go page not an integer, pull that in, and then um, it, will, it will just match it against uh, the, the, the function that's, or, or the logic that is run here. So in this case, uh, we just want to put our page variable in there, so now it's trying to get our page variable. In this case, if the page variable is not an integer, we want to set our posts to something else. And the thing that we want to set our posts to is the default paginated results that are returned. And that would be whatever is returned in page one. So if page here is not an integer for some reason, we just want to return page one or the paginated results in page one. Then the next exception that we want to uh, create here to, to see if it matches against that, to see if the results that are returned don't have any page or don't have any posts in them. And that is called using the empty page uh, uh, class. And that is also passed in as a core Django paginator uh, with core Django paginator functionality. So we just need to make sure we put our, our colons at the end here. Uh, and then what we want to do, if the result set that is returned is empty, basically meaning if, um, what is returned here, we've run out of posts. Uh, I think the best thing to do there would be to load the the last page that has results in it because that is the closest to what we are looking for. So in that case, we are going to make posts. Uh, again, we can just copy this line of code. And then uh, what the paginator class has, which is really nice, 
is a, a static variable that can be called, which uh, checks to see how many pages uh, we have in our current uh, paginated set of results. And that is the num pages. So this is really cool because we can return the last page by by merely counting the number of pages. So let's say, for example, uh, we, we, we know now that there are going to be two pages because it's one set of paginated results per page. Um, so it's going to be page number one, page number two. So if we, if we go to page number two, we will get the last set of results. If we had three posts, obviously uh, page three would be the last page that has results on them. So if we had to try run page number four here, so or, or in this example, page equal to three, it would actually return pages equal to, and then the total number of uh, paginated results, which would be two, and it would return page number two, which would give us test two. Great, just, just remembering that this one and two uh, is, is just the post ID and doesn't coincide to the pagination at all. Lovely, so that was quite a lot to take in uh, for one lecture. Let's run this um, manually and see if it works, uh, I'm going to just uh, refresh page two and let's see what happens. Fantastic. And now we have page two results, page two results being displayed. If we put one in here, we have page one's results being displayed. And before I finish off the lecture, I just want to test these two exceptions to see what happens. So if we enter something that is not an integer, we want it to default to page one. So let's say page is equal to something random. Great, it is now defaulting to page one. And if we enter something that returns as an empty page, so uh, I think page zero may even work here. Yes, page zero also would return an empty page. So page two, uh, which is the, the, the number of our pages set as the page, the page variable here, would return there. And if we set this to something uh, like page five, the same thing would happen. Hi, in the last lecture we looked at how to implement a manual form of pagination within our posts uh, and how to handle exceptions for uh, for uh, un unexpected values within our page get variable. In this lecture we'll be looking at how to actually create the pagination links in our home.html template. So the first thing that I want to do is to create a container div called pagination. Pagination. Um, and then within that, I want to create three things. The first thing will be the uh, next and previous posts links. Um, the second thing being uh, the conditionals for that. So we don't want to show the next post if there are no next posts, and we don't want to show the previous if there are no previous posts. And then the final thing that I want to do is uh, to, to uh, give us some sort of in, an indication as to which uh, post um, page result number we are on and how many there are in total. So let's start with the next and previous posts. So I'm going to create an anchor tag for this. And then as you guessed, may have guessed, um, we are just going to pull in the page variable there. Now the reason that we aren't using this URL function, uh, templating language function, is because we don't want to pull in the absolute path of the website, but rather we just want to append something to the URL. So regardless of what else is in here, we always just want to say page equal to five, because it may well be a different URL that we are working with. So um, from here, what we need to do is we need to pull in our posts variable, um, which now is more than just the result set because we have created it using the paginator object. It now has uh, access to some other special variables. One of those which include uh, the previous page number and another one is the next page number. So let's pull those variables in here. So if we are currently on post number one, posts dot previous page number will pull in two, if that makes sense. If we're on one, uh, two will be pulled in. Uh, pre oops, not previous page page previous page number. Cool. And because we're actually echoing something else, we need to use our double curly brackets for that. 
fantastic. And then just make sure within our anchor tag, we actually say previous. Now, if we had to refresh our, uh, if we had to refresh our front page now, the chances are is that it's going to give us an error. And that is because this post previous page number is currently not putting in anything. So we don't have a page variable, so there's no point of reference, uh, which is why this particular a, a variable here is failing. So what we want to do is we want to add some sort of a condition to uh, this template so that the anchor tag variable here is only displayed if the condition um, matched is true. So we're going to add a piece of functional template code which we always use with our, uh, our set of curly braces and our percentage sign and then we are going to call our posts variable which we know has access to more than just the list of posts now. And there is a special condition that returns true or false, which is called, or a special attribute called has previous. And this will say if, um, if there is a previous result set, return true. If not, then return false. So this function here should ideally be enclosed. Uh, let's just finish this, has previous. Should I, oh, this, this anchor tag should, ideally be enclosed within this has previous um, condition. So again, we, what we need to do, and I don't know if we've used if statements in our um, conditions before, I can't remember, but just but just so that you know, uh, what, what this is doing is, it, oh, let's just put the if in here, that would also help. We are saying if um, has previous post, which is going to return true or false. So we're going to say if either true or uh, if false, if true, then run this code. And then we want to indicate where the end of the if statement is. So we write end if. So this is only going to be rendered, this line here, if there are previous posts that we can select. So if we run this now, we won't see anything because there aren't any previous posts. If we had to now say forward slash page is equal to two, we will have previous posts, which means that this does show up. And if we click on it, it will take us to our previous post. So we can essentially just copy this entire thing and paste it for our next post. So as you guessed it, has previous has a counterpart condition, which we can call, which is has next. Then within this uh, condition here, we can say, next page number. And this should allow us to navigate between our list of paginated posts. So, uh, oopsie, we don't want to say previous there, we want to say next. Fantastic. So now we say next, we want to go to next. If we say previous, we want to go to previous, previous, next, previous, next. And all the while updating this page here. So page one, we click next. Uh, click next. It's now going to change to page two. Then the last thing that I want to do in this lecture is just to give us some sort of indication as to which page we are on. And the way that we use this is by using the, um, the, the number of pages as well as the current page. So what we can say is we are currently on page and then um, we're going to get our, our current page that we are on, which is a special variable called uh, posts.number, which will give us uh, the current posts. So that will be uh, two, hopefully, page two, lovely. And this is effectively mimicking our page variable. And then we want to get our, uh, as we did before here, where we called our uh, paginator num posts, we can now actually just say uh, posts, uh, sorry, not in this file, in this file, we can say of posts dot, and now we're calling this paginator uh, um, attribute as we did before, and then we can just say num pages again. Uh, sorry, dot num pages and it now should say 
page something of total number of pages. So if we refresh this, page two of two, page one of two. This is great and we now have a functioning pagination. If you would like to see this uh, in, in more detail, I'm going to just create a couple more posts here, uh, just so that, that we can confirm that this is working correctly. Uh, if you are now uh, bored of this lecture and want to move on to the next one, p please feel free to do so. Uh, I'm not going to talk about anything new uh, in this lecture over and above, just adding some random content, uh, to add some random pages uh, or posts to our uh, site so that we can see our pagination in action a bit more clearly. So I'm just going to create two more posts and um, just refresh this page. And now we have four pages, great. Two, and we can see that our next and our previous buttons are now appearing and now our next button disappears because we are on the maximum number of pages. Great, this pagination seems to be working exactly how we would like it to. In the previous lecture, we looked at how to uh, create our navigation buttons within our pagination so that the front end user can easily uh, navigate between uh, result sets returned by our pagination. In this lecture, I would like to talk about adding a category element to the posts on our blog site. So the first thing that uh, we will need to do is have a look in our models file. And what we will need here is two things. The first thing being an additional field uh, to our, that, we, that we add to our post model, which will allow us to select a category for our post. And the second thing that we will need to do is actually create the category model itself. Now, uh, the two things that I feel should be important uh, within the context of the category model is the title and the slug. Something else that we're also going to add is um, a self-referencing foreign key. So basically what that is, is a foreign key as we have uh, created for our author, except it will reference um, back to another category and we will create that as a parent category. So uh, by adding that particular attribute, it will allow our categories to have parents and children and function in a hierarchical way. So if that doesn't make sense right now, uh, let's dive into the code and hopefully it will make more sense then. Cool. So the first thing that I want to do is actually create our category class. So we create a new class, oopsie, we create a new class and we call it category. Uh, I'll close brackets. And this category is going to inherit from the base class, uh, base model uh, class here, uh, the same way that the post did. And we want to add two fields to this class, the first being title, and we are going to add title. Let's just copy this because it's a bit easier that way. So title is going to be added the same way that we've added title in the model, and then slug the same way uh, there. So let us actually create this slug in a similar way. So before we go ahead and create uh, any links or create our self-referencing uh, field, which I spoke about earlier, I just want to clean up these, um, these, these null values quickly. So for the title on the post, we will never want this title to be null. We will always want it to be something. So I'm going to remove that null on the title and remove the null on the text as we, we want these two fields to be compulsory. And in the same way, I'm going to do that on the title for a category and the slug from the category. So now we have to have a title and we have to have text for our post and we have to have a title and we have to have slug for our category. Cool. Now let's add our foreign key field to our uh, post, which is going to reference our category. So I'm just going to copy the author field for now and I will call it a category with a, a small c. And in here we are going to 
reference the name of the application and then the model within that application uh, or the class so the blog application is the application that we're calling and then it's going to be the category class within that model so now we can actually just copy this because most of it is going to remain the same when we create our parent field so when we spoke about the self-referencing key foreign key this is what we're speaking about so we're speaking about a foreign key that references back to a different category so this category so we can pull in a different category of the same type into this category so to, to, so it can match to another category of itself so this is all looking good yeah i'm happy with this uh, the last thing that i want to do is to just add this uh, two string method to our category the title field matches the title field here and i'm happy for the title field to be um the string that is returned when we call this category object so this 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 function is fine like this this method is fine like this lovely so now what we need to do is we need to create our migrations so if we go back to our console and we say uh, python and then we say uh, let's just ls to see if we're in the right folder no oh it looks as though we were actually uh, running our server so um, <coughs> What we're going to run here is python manage.py and then we are going to make our migrations and I want to call our specific application uh, migrations that we want to make so let's see what happens it says you are trying to add a non nunnable field category to post without a default we can't do that so basically what it is telling us is that the field category uh, is something that needs to be required but unfortunately we don't have anything to set for any posts that um, possibly already exist so I'm going to quit this so select option number two and go back into my model again and then I want to create functionality uh, in here and in here where the category and the parent of a category do not need to be selected. Now, when we are talking about something that is a string field or a character field, we refer to uh, the parameter null is equal to true. In this case, we are not referring to that. We are referring to whether or not uh, this is a blank value or not. So it is very similar to null is equal to true, except the keyword that we use is blank. So here we are saying, blank is equal to true so this can have a blank field the difference between null and blank is that uh, null is is a value that contains nothing whereas blank is there just isn't a value at all so a text field can just be an empty string whereas a parent um, self-referencing foreign key won't have any value so it won't be an empty string it'll just be nothing which is blank Okay, lovely. So we've set these these two things up now, and let's go back and make our migrations again. So we are going to say make migrations blog. Okay, cool. And it says you're trying again. We are trying to add a non-nullable field. Let, let's let's add the uh, null equal to true here, just to be safe, because I feel that I may have. Uh, confused what is actually going on here so we have blank is equal to true and null is equal to true on, to true on both just to be safe let's go back here and let's try that one more time it's giving us the same please provide a once off default value now ah yes okay cool so it is working except this time it is referring to the text field so I'm just going to put the string null into this for now just, uh, we don't actually want to do that. We want to provide a once off default value. So we're going to provide a value and that value is going to be a string of null. So this shouldn't affect anything because all of the current posts that we have, have got values in our text field. So if we hit enter, it's happy with that. Now it's trying to do the same thing with the title. So 
I'm going to do the same thing with the title again. So any uh, posts that have the field title uh, that, that don't contain any uh, value, we're going to set to null. Great, and this is only because we've we've changed these uh, this title and this text field here from from having the possible value of null to now not um, that that not being a possibility. There has to be something in here. So every instance where it could possibly now it's be null, it is now set to that null string. Great. So now we've we have created our migrations, and now we need to run the migrations on the server. So we do that by running the migrations command. So python and then manage.py and then the migrate command and we want to call the application to run the migrations on. And it is successfully run our migrations. That's great. So now if we go to, uh, we actually need to run our server. Again, so python manage.py run server. And we refresh this page. We add a new post and it now has this category field here that we can create. Now what you'll notice is that we don't have any posts. Now this is me going and clearing out all of the posts because um, I wanted to start with a fresh set of data so that when we work with our categories we're not working with uh, any faulty data from our previous lectures. So if we now go to our blog section you'll see that, well our blog app, you'll see that our category um, model has not yet been added to the administration section. So this is something that we need to do. We need to now go to our admin.py file and as we registered our post before we now need to register our category. Category. Great and we just need to also remember to uh, make sure that the category uh, class is also being pulled into this file so now uh, the category is being registered in the admin area so now if we refresh this page great now we have access to our categories hi there in this lecture i just want to talk a little bit about uh, the implications of adding a category to our blog administration area now what you will notice by default is that categories is not spelled correctly that is because what django is doing is it is automatically just adding an S to uh, the end of our model and assuming that that is the plural. There are ways for us to change this, uh, but I'm not going to get into that right now. So let us create a category. So we go into our, our category section in the administration area and we let's call our category weather. So we're going to have blog post with the category of weather. And then we are able to select a parent here if we want to. This is really nice because what we can do is if we have not yet created a parent, we can now hit the plus sign and it will open up a new tab and allow us to create a parent. Now because it is a self-referencing foreign key, it will open up the creation of a new category. And when we hit save, it will then reference that a new category back to uh, this one as the parent. So let's make a parent category called news because news seems like uh, a nice parent for uh, the weather category. And if we really wanted to create a parent of news, we could do the same thing. Uh, okay, cool. So it seems to have just deleted that. So let's go and create a new one called news and save that. And now news has been selected as the parent category of our weather category. So if we save it, you'll now see that we have news and that we have weather. So news does not have a parent. Uh, if we wanted to add a parent, we could have a three-tier hierarchical uh, category system. Now to the fun part of this. If we go into our posts and we add a new post, you will notice that it has now given us the option to add a category. So if we now select weather, um, weather is now an option for us so we can go uh, we can now define our post by weather uh, error below and now you'll notice that the uh, text field is a required field so let's go lorem epsom in here and let's save this and this is great now we actually have a category that is um, a post that is referencing a specific category
In the next few lectures, I want to look at how we can uh, filter posts by category on the front end of our website. Hi there. In the last lecture, we discussed how to link posts to categories. Um, and in this lecture, we are going to discuss how to pull those categories through to the front end of the site. Now, uh, in a previous lecture, I spoke about implementing a basic menu system. So in this lecture, I would like to actually go ahead and do that. So the first thing that I'd like to do is to improve our mock-up a little bit and make it a little bit nicer. So um, the first thing that I'm going to do is to head back over to the uh, getbootstrap.com site. Uh, I've actually already selected it here, but I've gone to the component section and then I've gone to navbar and then uh, I want you to just select all of this this code if you're following along so that's everything from uh, for this example here with the uh, a large variety of different uh, navbar options and just select all of that lovely then what we're going to do is head back over into our code and open up our header.html file and then what I'm going to do is I'm just going to paste all of this code in here. And now we can clean it up a bit. So the first thing that I want to do is uh, I just want to delete the right, uh, the right hand nav bar. So uh, let's have a look and see where that is. That's this whole section here. So where it says nav, nav bar, nav, nav bar right. So that entire UL or unordered list. So I'm going to remove that. I also want to remove the form, so the whole form inside of there, as well as the drop down li. And what you'll notice is uh, all we have left now is our two links over here. So if we had to save this page and refresh, we can now exit uh, getbootstrap.com and refresh our home page, you will notice that we now have these. Uh, this this nav bar at the top of our page looking great. So uh, let's just maybe clean this up a little bit. Um, if we go here, we can delete this one for now because we're not going to use it. Uh, and within the brand section here, I just want to say my blog because this is my blog. Great stuff. So let's refresh this page again. And yes, now we can uh, select various things. So the first thing that I want to do is I want to set our home URL. And what that is going to do is that is actually just going to uh, take us to the base of our site. So if we refresh this, you can now see that, oopsie, if we click on uh, my blog, it takes us to the base of our site, um, to, the, to, the, to the root of our site. Cool. Now what I want to do is add our categories uh, as menu links. So the, the best way to do that, firstly, is to actually uh, create a function that returns a, a list of all of our categories. So I'm actually going to do this in the models file because uh, for me it, it kind of makes sense that um, we should create a function within here and then call this function in our view. So um, as we discussed at the beginning of our um, the beginning of the series, um, and we spoke a little bit about static methods, I'm going to create a static method. So the static method is going to go know nothing about the instance of the current category that's being related, and we can call that method straight on the category class. So um, if you remember, the way that we declare a static method is by saying static method as a special keyword. Uh, and then just make sure to indent this. And then underneath that, we create a function. So I'm going to call the function, and this is going to be called list categories. And this is just going to list all of our categories. So because it is a static method, we're not going to pass any parameters into this, into this. And all we're going to do is just return something. So I'm just going to say return, and then, um, we can, because we already have the category here, we can say return category dot objects. So getting the uh, list of all the objects and then just calling the all method on that. And that will return 
uh, all of our categories to us. So if you go back to the views file, uh, you remember the way that we get all the posts is a very similar way, uh, is in a very similar way. So now we, we're basically just doing the same, the, the same thing, but we are calling it in a static function. So now I can copy this, uh, this function here, and every time we have the category library um, in a file, we can now call list categories as well. So I'm just going to jump over to my views.html file, uh, and I'm going to inside of my home um, inside of my home function. I'm just going to call that. So I'm going to say categories. Uh, categories is equal to and then we can call our list categories function uh, the one thing that we do need to to do though is actually call the category class first and now you'll notice that we don't currently have the category class pulled into this file so I want to do that category and because it comes from the blog model as well we can simply just say comma and then add it as we have with our Django call paginator uh, libraries. Super. So now we should have a list of all of our categories. So uh, I mean in essence this function may be a bit redundant because we could easily just go category.objects.all and that would do the same thing but this is really just for an example. So say if we wanted to edit this uh, function somehow and we wanted to break it up into a separate method um, well, if we want to break break the function functionality up to more than just a return statement, and we wanted to use it in multiple files, then this is a great place for us to put this categ uh, list categories method. For the sake of our example, it may just be quicker to say dot objects uh, dot all, but I'm going to leave it in here, in here now, just so that I can uh, so that I can uh, continue with the example and show you that it does actually work. Cool. So now we have our list of categories returned. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to add that to our uh, list of returned variables. And I'm going to say categories and then colon and then name of the variable. Great stuff. So now we have access to our categories um, uh, uh, or a list of categories when we load the home um, view. So that's great. So let's go back to our header.html now. Uh, and I'm going to create a loop in which we can um, access our categories. So what I want to do is I want to do that inside of our unordered list. And I'm going to put this in the form of a for loop. So the way that I'm going to do that, as we've done before with our for loops, is to say uh, open curly braces and then open um, and, then, and then there's uh, two sets of percentage signs. And then I'm going to say for category in categories, uh, so now for every single category in our list of categories, uh, do something uh, with that will we'll create a category. And then um, I'm just going to end our for loop. So I'm just going to say end for. Great. And now we can just push out our category over here. Uh, and let's see what that does when we run it on the front end of our website. So if I refresh this, uh, it's just returning category. Uh, oh, there we go. We actually have to put it into our, our double sets of curly braces. And we can save that and run it again. And great, we are now returning news and weather. Now, the last thing that I would like to do before we uh, move on to the next lecture, is actually link the news and weather to, uh, or add the anchor tags to this section. So the way that we would do that is by um, the, the similar way to how we linked our single post IDs. So I'm just going to copy this line of code here, go back into our header file, uh, and then in place of the anchor tag here, uh, and, and maybe what I can do is I can just creates one that's outside of our for loop. Uh, and what this will do is this, if I take this out completely and I just go forward slash, this one should uh, create a link to our home page. So 
I'm just going to make it a forward slash the um, anchor reference and then all the href sorry uh, and then it's just going to link to our home and then after that it's just going to link through loop through all of our um, categories and now what this is this URL uh, method is going to do as we've discussed uh, in previous lectures is it's just going to return the absolute URL um, of our uh, of our site and then it's going to call one of the URL functions so um, I want to call this one category and we haven't created this uh, the URL with this name yet but we are going to do that and then I'm going to call our uh, category dot slug and what you'll remember is that when we uh, return something to this file from our views it's returning the entire a category object um, and the reason that it is only giving us uh, the, the category name there if we if we search this or if we have a look at this is because in our models file we have defined um, our, our, what is returned when we call the entire object as just the title so we could just as easily go into our uh, header HTML and say category dot title well, this may be a better way to do it for us um, and then the last thing that I want to do is just create this category URL so if we open up urls.py um, in our uh, my blog application URLs and it's going to be very similar to the uh, single.py oh, sorry the, the single root um, and the only real difference is going to be one that uh, the, the base root is going to be category we're going to call this variable category and then we are going to name this URL category as well and then this this name um, is is the way that we can reference uh, the, the the URL that is called to our template which we can see here that that is what's called when we call the category um, parameter in our URL function so now let's run this code and see what happens great we now have home news and weather now if I click on news what you will notice is that our, our URL now changes to forward slash category forward slash news if we click on weather it says forward slash category forward slash weather awesome so uh, this, this really completes our basic menu system. In the next lecture, we will be discussing how to link these menu um, items to blog posts that actually uh, are, are categorized by the, the category listed in the main menu and, and what's selected here in the URL. Hi there. In the last lecture, we briefly discussed how to create a menu system and how to uh, pull our uh, categories or blog categories to the front end of our site. In this lecture I want to actually list all of the the categories or all of the, the, the blog posts linked to the relevant category when it is clicked. So the first thing that I'm going to do uh, is I'm going to go back to our views.html.py uh, file and I'm going to create a new function here. And what this function is going to do is it's going to link to our archive uh, category page. And, and basically that archive is going to be a list of all of our posts. So this, this uh, function is going to be very similar to, let's just call it archive because we're not going to archive anything else, very similar to our uh, home function. So again, with all of these, we need to pull in uh, the request parameter uh, and then again we are going to pull in a post list so we can just say post list here and then uh, for the most part the pagination is going to be uh, exactly the same so let's just copy this entire function for now uh, and then we can tweak it as we go along uh, awesome okay so um, if we wanted to really uh, uh, practice dry principles, which is uh, don't repeat yourself, so dry, D-R-Y, then we would actually want to create another function. 
um, that, that was called for both home and archive. Because this code is so similar, it's going to be returning something that is very similar. Uh, but for the case of this example, we are just going to keep them separate for now. So the main difference between uh, these two uh, functions is that the first one, uh, the, the, the first difference being that it's going to, uh, that the archive function is actually going to have a category passed into it. So when this view is run, we want to send it a category. And the second difference is that we don't actually want it to return all the posts. We only want it to return the list of posts that are relevant to that specific category. So within here, we can say uh, category, let's say uh, category, um, instead of saying all as well, we would rather say filter. So I don't know if you've uh, if you've noticed this, but we have used uh, it got uh, posts dot objects dot get all here, and then later on we've said uh, in our next function posts dot objects dot get. So these are two different functions: posts dot objects dot all and posts dot objects dot get. So what all does is it obviously returns every single instance of this particular model. What get does is it gets one instance of the model where this particular condition is met. And what the filter function does is it, it can possibly return more than one result. So the only difference between get and filter really is that get is always going to only look for one result and filter is going to possibly look for more results. So if there's one result, it will turn one result. If, there are more than, if there's more than one result, it will turn, return more. So what we want to do is we actually want to now filter by our category. So we want to say filter the post objects where our category um, is equal to the category that was passed in uh, over here. But unfortunately, this is going to be passed in as a slug. So uh, when we call the archive page, it's not going to return a full category. So um, what we will actually need to do is to create uh, an instance of that category that's pulled in with the slug as a reference. So let me just say uh, cat is equal to category.object. So now we want to actually use the get because you only want to return one result. And we're going to say uh, category.get where our category slug is equal to the slug that is passed in to this view. So we're going to pass a slug into this view through a URL parameter. So now we should have our instance of the category. So we can say post list is equal to uh, post.objects.filter where category is equal to our category. Great. So um, this, this is really cool because it's actually putting in category and category. Now what you'll remember is that when a category is, is pulled in or when an object is returned, um, specifically ones that we have defined here, it's pulling in the title. So this doesn't really help us because we may have more than one category with the same title. So the way that we get around this is we actually want to call the category ID and, and match the category ID. So there's a special um, filter in, in Django where we can say category, so that's the name of our field, underscore, underscore, and this is only if it is a foreign key field. So we are now calling uh, this particular field, our category field, and we can call any attributes on the, the category that matches this. So we can call any of these attributes, including the ID attribute on this particular category from here. Uh, so I'm going to go to uh, back to here, and the way that we call the ID, which would be I think the best way for us to um, for us to distinguish between our categories um, is with the PK. And what PK stands for is primary key, which is the ad identifier that we use, um, which is the, the, the actual incremental um, implicit field that gets created. So when we say category and we create our first category, that'll have an implicit primary key of one, and that'll and that'll keep incrementing. So every time a new one is created, it'll be primary key two, primary key three, primary key four. Um, if we go back to our um, back end of the site, you can see that if we go to our categories, 
and we click on weather. This one's primary key is two. Uh, and then uh, you can assume that this news is going to be one, so one and two. So that's what we are comparing against uh, here in our view. So we are saying where primary, the primary key of our category is equal to the newly created category object, uh, which has matched our category slug. So that dot ID, so it's the identifier. So what you'll notice here is that we are using ID in this case, but we are using PK in this case. Now, the two of these are, are changed around uh, at various points. So don't worry too much about that. Just know that this is a specific um, attributes that that can be accessed and primary key is is just the um, identifier that Django has decided to give it while if we are returning an actual object the identifier for the primary key is ID okay awesome so now what we should technically get is if we call this archive function and we pass in our category slug into it we should technically get a list of posts that are paginated um, that are part of the category that was passed in as a slug. So that is great. That's exactly what we're looking for. So uh, the, the next thing that we need to do is um, make sure that this archive function is actually called. So uh, if we go to our views over here, we don't want to pull in the blog views dot single function. We want to pull in the blog views dot archive function. And because the category has been um, grouped in our regular expression and is passed into the URL, we now have access to our category slug. So if we had to now go back to the front end of our site and refresh it, and we click on weather, for example, it should be listing the categories related to that. Uh, it, it doesn't really help at this point because uh, news and um, weather is kind of um, calling the same thing. And because weather is a child of news, uh, both will get triggered when we call either of them. So we need to explicitly state otherwise. So uh, weather and news are now separate categories. And I'm now going to create a new post. And I'm going to uh, make the admin the author. And I'm just going to say, Lurum, Epsom here. And say uh, description here. And then the category that I'm going to link to for this uh, example is news. So now, uh, hello world is weather, and our other example is news. Let's just add one more here, and we can say another, uh, another post. How do you spell another? Not like that. Another post. Uh, and I'm just going to say text in here. And I'm going to link this one to the news as well. So now news should have two posts and uh, weather should have one post. So when we refresh our front end, uh, you'll see that. Oh, we first need to actually click on one of these. Uh, what is happening here? Why is this not working? You'll notice that all three of them are being pulled in. That is not what we want. Uh, let's go back to our code and see uh, what the problem is over here. So let's let's do a little bit of debugging here. Uh, let's first go to our header.html and make sure that all is in order here. So we have our category.slug. So that is correct, our, our URL that is linking through, that's right. Um, if we go to our uh, views page, uh, here we go, this is what the problem is. We have not yet created our archive category um, template, so it's only ever loading the page template. So I'm going to load archive there, and I'm going to create a new template called archive.html. Great, let's save that. And it's going to be very similar to home.html. So I'm just going to copy that the whole of home.html and I'm just going to paste it. And the only difference now being that um, the posts that are loaded 
are specific to the archive. So if we look at our views here, the posts that come back are, are queried based on our uh, category that we selected. We have as the posts that get pulled in through here are just it are, is just basically every single post. So let's now go back to our, the front end of our site and let's have a look what's going on. If we can go to the weather page and nothing is changing. Why is this? Uh, let's go back. Weather's got everything used. Nope, this is still not right. Um, so, so I mean, this, this kind of stuff can take a little bit of a debugging to get right. Uh, so I'm just going to tinker a little bit more with this. Um, so let's see, this is all looking correct. I just want to make sure that this template, uh, this template here is actually running. So this is actually great. This is something that we can test. So if we now go into our, um, if we go into our view, we can actually pass the, the name of the category into or the slug of the category uh, into our uh, view. So I'm going to say a comma and then I'm going to say category and it might actually be better to pass the title of our category in. So here we can say cat dot title. So now when we call the category variable in our view, it's going to pull in the, the, that specific category's title. Uh, and here we can just go like this and say category. And let's see if that's working. No, it's not. It's still loading the home page for some reason. So so why is this? Let's um, Let's do a little bit more debugging and see what we can do. I'm just going to comment out this uh, home view here and see what happens. And now we are getting weather and news. Great, and this is working exactly the way that we wanted to. So it looks like what is happening is that our uh, home URL regular expression is matching um, the category views regular expression for some reason. So let's just remove part of that regular expression because what we've just said here is is um, is just start and then it's it's kind of just um, it's kind of just starting the regular expression. So let's uh, run this again and see if we click home. Yes. So this this is actually what our problem is here, um, and this is why it's very important to get your regular expressions right. So uh, I'm just going to run start and end and uh, let's put a backslash in there to see or forward slash in there to see if that works and we have an error here so um, let's try that one more time great and now it's working the way that we want it to so essentially what happened here is I forgot to end our uh, regular expression on our, on our home uh, route, and I'm glad that we did it uh, at this point so we could fix it early on. So what I'm saying in this regular expression is the start, if you remember from our regular expression lecture, is the start of our regular expression. And then I was not ending the regular expression at all. So basically everything that came after that matched our regular expression. For some reason, the post um, regular expression didn't pick up an error. It's possibly because we, we may have created these two at the same time and the, the Django system was clever enough to work it out. But then as soon as I created another one, uh, this this well, the rest of this um, regular expression after here was never actually picked up because it hit the home regular expression that didn't have an ending clause and it just thought that we were on the home page. Great, so um, now that I've made a proper fool of myself with regards to this testing, we can now see uh, a, a little bit on, on how to debug uh, issues that come up on our um, on our Django site. Great. Uh, I think regardless of that though, I am very happy with the results that we are getting. So now we actually have a full menu system that is linking through to the categories that we want. Hi there. In the previous lecture, we looked at linking our menu items 
to blog posts that contain the category uh, in the menu item. In this lecture, I want to clean up uh, and make our blog website a little bit more robust. So one of the things that I'd like to do is to change this category uh, field. So uh, if we go back to our admin area, um, so that it can have more than one uh, category attached to a blog post. So the way that we would do that is add something called a many to many field. Now, uh, this is a common database terminology used to describe where uh, one particular model or table has a relationship to another uh, model or table um, where one post, for, in, for this example, one post can have many categories the same way that a category can have many posts. Um, so let's let's add that quickly and then maybe this uh, will become a little bit clearer if you're not entirely getting the gist of what I'm saying. So the other way to do that is to add a many to many field. So now I'm replacing our foreign key field with a many to many field and that is literally the only thing that I need to do here. Uh, just remembering though that uh, we will now need to make a database migration from our models to cater for this. So let's go back to our um, server that's running. Let's stop the server and now we're going to run python, oopsie, python manage.py and then we're going to say make migrations. And what I want to do is actually call the uh, app as well as we have been doing in the past. So make migrations and then the app is blog. Great. Uh, post da, 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 has no effect on many categories. Okay, we don't need to worry about that. It's still successfully um, created the migrations for us. And now we actually want to make the migration. So we go actually do the migration. So my big great blog. Fantastic. And it is um, successfully creating that uh, migration. So now if we had to uh, just remember to uh, run our server again, Python.run server, if we had to refresh our admin area, what you would now see is that we can link our uh, blog post to more than one category. So it says here, hold down control or command on a Mac to select more than one. So I'm going to hold down command and I can now select both blog posts. So if we go to the front end of our site, and we click on, uh, whoa, this is not working. Let's save this and see what happens. I suspect that what might be happening is the many to many relationship might be breaking it a bit. News has got hello world, weather has also got hello world. Um, oh, there we go. It's because hello world has been added to both, but it's reset our fields now. So. If I save this now, another post should also um, fall under both. Great. And this is working exactly how we want it to work. So just to, to give you a, a, a final example, just so that we know this is working, I'm going to add um, news only to our admin post. Um, so now what you need to remember about this is that before you start adding large um, collections of information to your uh, database, first get your structure right because otherwise you're going to need to repopulate a lot of your uh, database. So a uh, weather has not only got two because we, we only added lorem ipsum to um, news and if we go to news you'll see that news now has three posts. Fantastic. That is exactly uh, what we want to do. In the next lecture I'll be discussing how to add images to our uh, blog posts. Great. See you then. Hi there. In the last lecture, we, we covered how to link multiple categories to a single blog post. In this lecture, um, what we're going to do is look at how to add images to our blog posts. So the first thing that we need to do is we need to go into our blogs model and we need to add a new field to our posts, um, to our post class. Sorry, our blog application and our, and our post model slash class. Uh, and I'm going to call this attribute image. Uh, that makes sense. And then I'm going to create this as a file field. Now, what a file field is, is basically um, in the database gets saved as a text field, but, um, or, or a varchar, but in terms of how Django reads it, it can take 
um, in the value of a file field in the admin area when it is uploaded. So there are um, other libraries that you can use. Um, sorry, this is file field. There are other libraries that you can use to um, to, to upload images to Django. Um, the most common one is known as Pillow, uh, which is P-I-L-L-O-W. And Pillow is basically an extension of the file field with a, a little bit of validation um, on it to make sure that it is in fact an image field. We aren't going to go into that depth with our file field because uh, to be honest, nobody's really going to upload something that isn't an image. Um, and just for the sake of this example, we just want to keep it as simple as possible. So again, this file field is going to need some attributes. So the first attribute that I'm going to do is blank equals to true. And that's just going to allow us to um, have the functionality so that it doesn't have to, as we discussed before, it doesn't have to have uh, an image. So this value can be null or can be blank. Uh, and then the second attribute that I want to add is one that is specific to the file field and that is the um, upload to parameter and what that'll do is that'll tell Django where to upload our files to so I'm going to uh, say that's upload underscore to equals and I'm going to pass in a parameter here so usually you would pass something like media uh, or something like that I'm just going to use images for the sake of this example um, so yeah, let's just save that. And uh, now obviously we need to run uh, a migration to, to add this to our, um, to our model and database. So I'm just going to go to, ah, and it's saying here, uh, image, da, 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 name model is not defined. Let's see what that means. Models, that's what we need to change. And there we go, our server is running. Cool, so now we can cancel it and we can run our make migration. So we're going to run uh, python manage.py uh, make migrations. And if you've been following along with us, you should be now getting the hang of how to create migrations. Uh, and now we pass in the application, which is blog. Okay, system, check identified some warnings, blog post, da, 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 da. Null has no, okay, this is the error that we got earlier, but it has successfully created our post image uh, migration. And now all we need to do is run that migration. So I manage that py and then migrate the name of the application as blog. Fantastic. And now our blog has successfully been migrated. Cool. Or, or our image field has successfully been added to the model of our blog. So now, if we go to the admin area of our site and we go into one of our posts, uh, oopsie daisy, let's first uh, run our server, run server, and let's run this. Cool. And now what we're going to do is just, uh, what you can see now is we've got our new image field added and we can just select choose image. Now I've got two images here, one for storm clouds, which will I uh, thought related to weather and one called news, which related to news. So let's just click on storm clouds. It's a really big image. So uh, yeah, I'm not expecting this to look very nice on the front end. Let's choose that uh, and let's just go save. Great, and that was for, uh, I think that was for our hello world post. No, it wasn't, it was maybe for the Learn Epson post. Nope, not giving us anything. Let's try that again for Learn Epson. Select choose storm clouds and save. Learn Epson was successfully saved. There we go. And now we have storm clouds attached to this as an image. Cool. So now um, there, there's, there's no way for us to see this on the front end. Um, and one of the big issues that we're having is that we don't have a root uh, connected to the image. So if we go to our front end and, and, and we, if we look at this root here, it's currently at forward slash images, forward slash um, storm clouds, etc., etc. So if we had to go forward slash images here, there'd be no root to, to call that. So it would give us um, 
a root error, as you can see. So what we need to do is we actually need to create a root for this, uh, for, for specific, specifically for images. So the way that we do that, um, if we go back to our code, and now you'll actually notice that we have our storm cloud uh, JPEG that's been added to uh, the Im in the images folder within our, our applications root or our project's root, so that's great. Um, so now what we need to do is we need to open up our URLs file. So that's in our, our main application under urls.py. And we need to add an additional uh, URL to, to this to, to run a regular expression that matches images. So I'm just going to run a new one and this we can actually just copy the one from above because most of it is going to stay the same. Oopsie, we don't want to format that. Um, Cool, and this is going to be forward slash images because we're looking for it in the images folder. And then I'm just going to say path here because this is just going to be the path to the file. And then uh, these last two parameters are slightly different in the way that they uh, function. So the first thing that we need to do is we need to find a way to link to our project directory because up to this point, we've just been linking to um, We've just been linking to views uh, and things like that, but we haven't actually been linking to our project directory where these images are sitting. So what we need to do is we somehow need to find a way uh, to, to link the absolute path from our server's root to our images folder um, with, with minus the, the Django configuration. So the way that, that we will need to do that is we'll actually need to go into our settings.py file. And in here you'll see a base DR or the base directory. And this, as it says here, builds paths inside the project like this. Uh, and then, and really what it does is it just, it just uses some of Django's uh, core functionality to build the absolute path to, um, to our project folder, as you can see, uh, abs path. So we can actually use this base directory um, if we wanted to, which is really great. So uh, what the first thing we need to do to use this base directory, so, so the assumption will be we will go base directory forward slash images to find that the absolute path, um, is we need to import our base directory into our URLs file. So the way that we do that is we actually, we actually have to call um, a, a special uh, Django library, the same way that these are two special Django libraries, um, and it actually has to import our settings.py file and then all the variables attached to it, because as you can see, this is really just a variable declaration here. So, or, I mean, what we could we could really do as well is we could import OS and then run, and then redeclare this whole variable, but that seems a bit redundant, and we may want to use it in other places in the site as well. So again, we say from, and then this is um, a Django config um, library as well, so similar to that. So we say Django dot conf and it's not within the the urls um, library though so we're just going to get django conf and then import and then we're going to import our settings library and this will now give us access to all of our um, variables defined in our settings.py file um, okay cool and then we just need to uh, import one more file from django which is a uh, django static content file um, and basically what this file does is, is this is just going to um, tell Django that we want to serve a static content in, in the root of our, our folder and we don't want to uh, serve dynamic content such as a view um, or, or an HTML document that's gone through Django's um, temp templating engine process or anything like that. We just want to serve the file. So that's uh, a, a Django static uh, library to tell it to do that. So this is going to be from Django.views uh, tell it's a static view and then we're going to import static and again there are multiple places uh, within the site where we may want to use the keyword static so I'm just going to import this as uh, let's just say Django static maybe uh, cool and now we know to use that, that this is a uh, Django static. Uh, and then what we'll do here for our second parameter is we're actually going to call this Django static uh, variable. So instead of serving a dynamic 
content, which would be like a function found within one of our views, such as blogviews.archive. We want to serve um, static content, so Django is static. And then the function that we want to use within that is the serve function. And all this is doing is it's just telling us that when we go to this URL, we want to serve static content within the root, which will be this content in the images folder. Um, I, I think I've probably over explained that. Um, so, <laughs> so I hope that you understand by now. And then cool, the, the next parameter that we pass in is actually a dictionary. So as we discussed earlier, a dictionary is basically just array, an array. Um, so instead of just passing in the name variable, which is equal to category, we're going to pass in an entire dictionary. So we could pass a dictionary into the library, but it would it would really just get into this uh, function, but it would really just get complicated. So instead of just passing a variable, we're passing an array or a dictionary. Uh, and then there is um, a key and a value field that we need to pass into this specific um, function, the, the Django static serve function. And that is, uh, the key is document root. So we're now setting documents underscore root of our a static serve function. And then the value of that, because it's separated by a colon. And now we can call our base directory, which we're wanting to do. So we can now go to settings. So we can type out settings. And we can call the, the variable that we've used before called base directory. So we can say settings dot uh, base D I R uh, and then we can just append the word images to that so we can just say plus and just make sure it's um, uh, preceded by a, a forward slash and then we can just say images lovely so now what we're doing with this line of code here uh, if, you, if you don't understand it, you can probably just copy it and use it for your for your own purposes. But just for the sake of explanations, which I'll probably over-explained again, is we calling our regular expressions forward slash images forward slash the path of the image. That's great. Then we are calling this function from the Django dot uh, the Django static uh, view, which is just telling that that Django that we don't want to try and um, process anything dynamic. We literally just want to serve the content that's found at this particular root. Um, and then the root that we're passing in, the document root, is equal to um, our the, the, the root, um, the absolute path all the way to our images folder. And we're getting this settings.base directory from the settings file, uh, which we saw here is this long line over here, which is basically just getting the absolute path. Great, cool. So now we can actually save that. Um, and then what I want to do in our um, in our HTML file to demo this is just go to our uh, single.html. And, and what's really cool now is that our post will have a an image attached to it. So that's really nice. So we can just go image and then we can say the source of our image is going to be our post dot image and we're getting that from our model post dot image here great so now uh, we can save that it's always good to have an alt tag on your images so i'm just going to put the post's title in as the alt tag now i don't know um if you've noticed this or not but if we save this and we try and refresh on our front end, the chances are that this is going to break. And this is because Django is looking for an image, but because an image is not a required field, uh, it may not show up and Django will probably throw an error. So what I want to do is I want to put a conditional statement in here, uh, the way that we've always done logical statements inside of our templates and say if, and then I want to say post.image, so if there is a post image, then we want to run that code, and then we want to end our if at the end of that. So end if. Cool, that's looking great. So now let's just go back to our console, make sure we have no errors. Setting object has no attribute bas dir. Oh, and that is because it is not a bas, it is a base with an e at the end. Uh, let's just make sure that's correct. Baster. Great.
uh, and let's refresh this thing. Cool, and we're no longer getting any issues here, so that's great. Let's refresh the front end of our site. Uh, let's go back to front end, and we saved it to our Lurum Ipsum. And it looks like it's trying to find the image, but it's not uh, finding anything. Let's open the image in the new tab and see what happens. Post two images. Uh, okay, so what it's doing here is it's actually trying to append uh, this this image root to the um, to our our post. So obviously it, it can't find anything at post forward slash two forward slash images. So what we need to do is we actually need to go back to our view, um, and we now need to edit this over here. Awesome. And what this is doing is it's because uh, we we've just put this URL straight into here. Uh, it's it's used the uh, entire URL path. So a quick uh, HTML trick to get around this is just to put the forward slash um, in our actual source, and that'll just take us to the root uh, in terms of our um, URL routing. So if we save that, uh, so we just put a, a little forward slash in here. Uh, and we go back here and we refresh our blog page and it's still not giving us anything. Uh, great, you can now see it's, it's removed the post to images. Uh, and I have just realized what our problem is over here, is that our regular expression is not correct. This is because this is looking for any word that has got valid characters in it. This is not a word with a valid character. This is a word with a dot in it. So firstly, this a dot is not a, a valid string character. Um, and then and then you know, the, the dot JPEG after it. Uh, and then there's no forward slash at the end of that. So it's not matching this regular expression at all. So we'll need to alter our regular expression in our urls.py file. Uh, and I think the best way to do this is going to be to remove this completely uh, and to just say uh, we, again we still want to keep it a group so we want to keep that and then I just want to say dot jpeg and what this will do is this will allow this uh, images to match anything dot jpeg cool so let's now refresh our site uh, I think we may need to put the forward slash back at the end Let's just see. Uh, let's just keep it safe and make this a star. So dot star. Oh, and awesome. We now have our really, really massively out of proportion image. So this is really cool. We can now create blog posts with images. Uh, the one last thing that I want to do quickly is to just add a width here. A width. Oopsie, uh, width is equal to, let's say, 250 pixels. And let's refresh this. And there we go. This is really, really nice. Um, and if we go back home again and we go to one that doesn't have, uh, for some reason, it's pulling in, I think our home.html may also have that. Yes, you'll see, here's one that, that doesn't have an image and it doesn't throw in any errors. Uh, so let's just go back to our hello world. I think this was probably a mistake of mine from earlier. Oh, there we, there we go. And you see it does currently have uh, clouds.jpg attached to it. Um, awesome, guys. So this is basically a, a, a blog site that's working not the greatest way that it can. And, and I know that the content has been a bit sketchy here. But all in all, it's it's pretty much giving us everything that we need from a blog post. So there's, there's always other things that you can add to this, such as uh, comments or uh, maybe, maybe a few more categories, maybe fix up your menu system a little bit, add some social media icons, add a bit more of a theme to your to your site. At the moment, it's just the default bootstrap theme. But there, there are a lot of really cool things that you can do to, to make this blog really, really awesome. Now, obviously, it is a lot easier 
to set this up using WordPress. So uh, there's there's no dispute there. Um, out of the box, WordPress is really, really great for just um, installing something and just getting it to run. And that is the whole um, philosophy of WordPress, where it can run on any server and it's really, really super quick to set up. Now, the amazing part about Django is that although WordPress is really quick to set up, we did everything over here ourselves and we have complete control over everything that goes on here. Uh, not only that, but this is a lot more robust than what WordPress has out of the box in terms of uh, database semantics, in terms of how models are created, our use of object-oriented programming. And this is really where you start um, diving into the real hard grinding um, development or web, web developer um, development industry stuff. Uh, and this and this is where the crux of a web development happens with really robust applications. Um, yeah, so in the next section, we're just going to be covering a, a couple of cool aspects of of Django, but in terms of our uh, blog section, we are pretty much done. Hi there. In the previous section, we looked at how to create a blog application using Django. In this section, I would like to show you how to leverage Django's um, a package library to use third party packages to um, take all of the hard work or, or the, the tedious work out of creating um, an awesome web application. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to my web browser and I'm going to search for the Django package. Let's just search for Django packages and see what happens. Um, and then you'll see the Django packages.org loads. Now, Python's uh, package index is known as PyPy or PyPI, which is spelled PYPI. Uh, and then this Django packages website is really just a directory that lists Python packages that are specific to Django. So what I'm going to look for to start us off is a content management system, also known as a CMS, which is basically what WordPress is. So WordPress as a whole is broken up into two separate uh, main elements. The first being a content management system element, which is what uh, non-developers will usually use, and they'll use that to manage the content on their website. So um, whatever kind of, kind of website it is, the most common type obviously being a blog. Uh, and then the other side is the framework side. So WordPress has got a fully built-in framework. So for us now, uh, I'm going to use a third-party uh, CMS, but then Django is going to function as my framework. Where, as with WordPress, uh, WordPress would take care of the CMS and the framework side of things. Cool. So uh, as we can see, if we click on CMS here, uh, it now brings up a list of uh, prerequisites for uh, CMS. So these are all the packages that match these prerequisites. So it needs a, a WYSIWYG editor, which is what you see is what you get editor. It needs to have tags, page depth, revision, page sorting, test, blah, blah, blah. So, I mean, you can you can read through this list at your own leisure, but at the end of the day, uh, yeah, CMS, CMS needs to match these criteria. And then below that, you'll see the different packages that are offered, uh, Django packages that are offered that include CMSs. So if we scroll to the right, you'll see that there are a whole lot of different content management systems or CMSs that, that Django offers. Uh, and then each of them um, have various criteria and, and various versions and release dates and things like that. So this is all very interesting as uh, and below that is a checklist of what each of these offer. So this is really nice. Um, you can go through this and pick one of these at your own leisure. I'm going to pick one called uh, mezzanine just because or mezzanine just because I like the name uh, and because it looks like quite a few people are using this so I think Django CMS would probably be uh, yeah let's go with this one yeah let's go with this one cool and here we have the single page of uh, mezzanine and what I want to do is I want to now figure out how do I actually install this package? So because it is a Django package, we can install it the same way that we installed 
any of our previous Django packages using a pip install, uh, which is the Django, oh, sorry, the Python um, install package, which is pip. Uh, or we could just add it to our requirements.txt file and run uh, pip install on our requirements.txt file, which we covered in the first uh, few lectures of section one. Cool, so let's go to, actually go to PyPy or PyPI uh, website and let's have a look at Mezzanine and let's see what happens here. Okay, cool, and this is this is the actual website where Mezzanine can be installed. Um, and here it just shows you exactly what it looks like. Uh, it gives you a bit of a summary. It tells you uh, most things about it and you can actually download it as a separate package. I don't want to download Mezzanine. What I want to do is I want to actually um, install it using pip install. So if if everything goes correctly, we should be able to go back to our terminal. And now we are not in our virtual environment. Uh, unfortunately, I uh, well, well, fortunate, unfortunately I went out of the virtual environment. But fortunately, what I did do is I just uh, started again from scratch. So you don't have to have anything pre-installed for the section. Uh, so in the next lecture, I'm going to look at how to install Mezzanine using our console and uh, pip install. Hi there. In the last lecture, we looked at, uh, briefly at uh, Django's package, packages website um, and picked out a CMS as well as looked at the uh, Python uh, index package website and we chose a, a CMS called Mezzanine to use. So I think the best thing to do from here is going to actually be to go to the Mezzanine website. So let me just do a quick Mezzanine Django search. Uh, and here we go, it actually has its own website. So that's really great. So uh, if we go into this website, it should give us a little bit of um, uh, an explanation as to how to install it. Ah, great. So you see on the side here, we can actually just follow these commands. So first being pip install mezzanine. So that makes sense. That's how we've always installed things. So we just need to make sure we're in our virtual environment for this. Then we need to create a mezzanine project um, using uh, the new mezzanine project command that we now have access to because we've installed that library. Um, and then we can actually just create our database and run our server. So let's do that and see what happens. So uh, the first thing that I'm going to do is just copy this line of code and let's just go back to our command line and let us first, before we do anything, go into our virtual environment. So we do that by saying source. I hope you guys remember this because we've done it many, many times. Test bin activate. Enter. Cool. And now we're in our test environment. At virtual environment, and then I'm going to paste what's in my clipboard, which is pip install mezzanine. See what happens? Collecting mezzanine. Great. And now we have access to it as long as we're in this virtual environment. As soon as this is finishing, as this finishes downloading, let's just give it a few moments to download. Fantastic. That was surprisingly quick. Uh, okay, cool. And the next thing we need to do is create our mezzanine project. So. We're going to use this next command here, which was mezzanine project. And then, yeah, let's just call it my project for the sake of this example. And it was also very quick. Then we need to CD into that. And then we're going to use, uh, we're going to create our database. So this is effectively creating the migration and running it. So I just want to CD into my project, which is the new uh, mezzanine project that was created. You'll still see that my blog is sitting there. Uh, and then we're going to run this command, python manage.py create db. Fantastic. And you'll see, uh, if you recognize this from our previous lectures, we're actually creating and applying all of the migration. So that's great. Cool. So now what we can do is we can actually start setting up some default parameters for our um, new blog website using mezzanine. So um, hit enter to the default. So we're only going to be using local host, so that's fine. We can hit enter. Uh, username, Rich Lloyd Miles. Let's make the username admin. Email address, I don't think it's required. And then I'm going to enter my password. Enter my password again. So this is effectively running the create super user 
account as we used before. Oopsie, my passwords don't match. Don't match again. This is very, very awkward. Let me type it out slowly. Great, there we go. Finally, super user created successfully. So if you remember in our last lecture, we used to create super user account. Mezzanine is obviously hooking into this at some point and then running its own variation of that. What does it say here? Would you like to install some initial demo pages? Blah, 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 blah. Yes, I think that would be really cool so we can see what it looks like. And it's installing our pages. And that is it. Mezzanine is now installed. So that is really, really cool. Now um, we can run our python manage.py and then run server. Great, and we should be good to go. There are a few things here that still need to be configured, but we should still be fine if we uh, run our server. So now let's go back to our um, web browser. I'm gonna open a new tab, and I'm going to now go to localhost. And oh my goodness, look at this. We have a fully functioning blog already. This is truly, truly amazing. So let's uh, let's go to the back end of this and see if if all is as we think it is. So if we go forward slash admin, as we have done in the past, um, and effectively what Mezzanine is doing is customizing um, and, and automating a lot of the stuff which we would have had to do ourselves. I mean, it's even got a forgotten password functionality, uh, it's site and admin. I mean, this is, this is probably if you, d d depending on what your user account is, uh, where, where you would log into. Uh, so we've set it up as being admin. So this, these are our super user credentials. And then I'm going to enter my password in there. And let's log in and see what happens. And look at this amazing backend. This is super cool. So obviously what Mezzanine has done here is it's hijacked the Django backend and it's created its own um, basically a content management system. And it looks very, very similar to WordPress. Um, if we now go to the front end of our site and we refresh it, we are now logged in, which is really cool. And, and because of this, we see this little arrow here. And what this allows us to do is to do admin functions um, while we are logged into the front end. So if we now go onto the about page, for example, we can now edit any of these things straight here on the front end, which is something that WordPress doesn't offer out of the box. So about us, it's, this is something about us. Let's make it bold and let's save it. And how awesome is this? And now this has done what it looks like to be an Ajax request and it's just updated the database now with us just going to the front end. So as somebody who's managing this blog, we don't even need to log into the back end of WordPress. This is super, super cool. So the next thing that I want to do is just go to the site admin uh, and let's create a blog post. So let's go to blog posts, uh, add new blog post, add blog post, and let's make this one say hello world. And what you'll notice is it already has categories set up for us. So this is really nice. Um, what I would suggest is you go ahead and install this yourself and then you can fiddle around with all of this stuff. Is the hello world blog post uh, and let's save and you'll see um, the, the save and save and add another save and continue editing these are all very very similar to the Django admin commands and obviously they they are running the same functionality but uh, like I said it's just hijacking at some point um, and mezzanine is just taking control and doing its own thing so now if we go to blog and we refresh our blog, we can now see that we have our hello world blog post and we can even add comments to this. So this is really cool. Um, if we go into it, we can take comments off. So we don't want to have comments for that blog post. And basically all of the work that we did uh, in the previous few lectures now becomes, or the previous few sections now becomes completely redundant because Mezzanine has taken care of all of this for us. This is not to say that the work that we did previously was in vain as um, we now have an understanding of how Django works. And you will notice, um, as I've mentioned a couple of times in this lecture already, um, a lot of similarities between Mezzanine and vanilla um, defaults Django. Uh, in the next lecture, I'm going to look at how to customize 
uh, this this front end of mezzanine. Awesome, see that. Hi there. Before we jump into uh, customizing our uh, mezzanine blog, I first want to discuss uh, some of the cool things that mezzanine offers out of the box on a front end and back end level. So the first thing that I found really cool about this is that it has a pre-built gallery section where it pulls in images from the media library and if you click on them it has a JavaScript light box built in where you can navigate through these media um, through, through the, uh, these images. And obviously you can add and remove these as you see fit. So it's got like a little title and it's got like a bit of a pagination thing going on there. And if you if you click off it, then it disappears. So that's really cool. Um, another thing that you'll notice is that um, there's submenus uh, on our main menu already work, and these are mimicked to the sidebar down the side here. Uh, and then our search should work as well. So if we go hello and we want to search through uh, everything, so it should pick up our hello world blog post. If we say go, it does pick up our hello world blog post, and that's really great. So this stuff is all. And uh, comes all all of the stuff comes out of the box with mezzanine, so that's really fantastic. Another cool thing is that there's already a pre-built contact form in uh, the contact page, which we can obviously customize if we need to. So let's have a look at the admin area, uh, and and I've gone to the pages uh, sub menu here, um, and what you'll notice about this is that it looks or well, the pages menu item is that it looks very very similar to WordPress's menu manager. Um, so if you go to the WordPress backend and you go to appearance and menus, you'll notice that the page looks very similar to this. And 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 I mean, so much so that we can drag and drop these menu items, um, we can indent them as sub items as well, the same way that WordPress does. And if we want to expand these, we can see the current uh, child items of these. If you want to add a new item, uh, this will add a child item of the about page and this here will just add a new page in general. So let's say we want to add a new form, click add form and we can have context and then, I mean, this is really great. We can, we can now customize the fields of the form. So that's really cool as well. Um, obviously depending on the type of page that we create, so these fields will be different. Uh, so you can have a title, everything that you would expect of a, a normal content management system page. Uh, we have this is obviously the the email configuration field. So where where the when the where the form gets submitted, where we send it. Um, and we have a little metadata box here, not to be confused with WordPress's metadata. This um, is specifically for uh, SEO purposes. So this is all SEO metadata stuff. So yeah, that's really cool. That can be customized on a per page basis. So that's really nice. And the next thing that I want to look at is uh, the comments. So the important thing about comments to note is that um, you can use the default comment engine of um, Mezzanine, but out of the box, it also offers um, a discuss um, integration. So I don't know if you don't know what discuss is. It's spelled like us like that and basically it's a comment engine so let's just see what it says um, the only reason I'm showing this is because uh, when I first had a look at it I wasn't too sure what it was I'd never heard of it before so so there are a lot of big sites using discuss so you create an account um, yeah and and it just re works really well so you can use that if you want to and um, once you've created um, and set up everything on Discuss. You can literally just add your your keys and your API integration stuff uh, in here. So if we click on settings in the sub menu, uh, and the same thing goes for our Twitter. If we have any type of OAuth stuff that's required, we can we can do it down here, and we can do the same thing with the Kismet, which is um, an anti-spam system which which works really really well uh, I think WordPress has this installed by default and there's all these other awesome um, third-party things that will just work so for example like your Google Analytics ID that will just work and this is very similar to um, WordPress's uh, uh, general uh, account or a general site settings page um, obviously WordPress doesn't have a lot of these third-party um, plugins installed or third-party um, API extensions installed out of the box. 
Uh, cool. The next thing, let's go to, so that's comments, uh, media gallery. So here we can actually create a folder system with our gallery. Um, and then in our gallery folder, we can see all of the images that are created here. And this is within our gallery folder. So inside there. So if we actually had to go back to our gallery page and look at the gallery page, uh, and we scroll down here, you can actually see that each of these images has been loaded. So that's really, really cool. Um, then the next thing, uh, let's have a look at the sites. Okay, so if we want this, um, if we want this particular domain to be served in multiple places, so uh, I don't know if staging would be the best example, but yeah, that, that, is, that is if we want this particular thing to be hosted on kind of a multi-site setup the same way that WordPress does, then we can do that as well. Uh, redirects, we can actually set up redirects. And I think this would mainly be used if you had an old website and you wanted to, to redirect to new links, or if you wanted to edit, edit the custom edit the URL structure of the site, you can do this here. So this would be um, similar to editing the URLs that py file. Obviously this is a nice admin interface, UI interface for that. And we've already looked at settings. And then users and groups are by default uh, already in the, the Django framework. So uh, we've looked at those just with the UI looking a little bit different. Okay, awesome. In the next lecture, we're actually going to be looking at how to edit the look and feel of the front end of our site. Hi there. In the last lecture, we had a bit of a tour on the of the front end and the back end of Mezzanine and some of the basic things that it offers out of the box. Uh, in this lecture, we're going to be looking at how to customize the front end look and feel of the site. So uh, the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm actually going to go uh, look at the project itself. So I'm in Sublime Text now. Uh, and, and what you'll notice is that we've obviously installed our My Project app, uh, the default app as it is before. And you, what the first thing you'll notice is that it looks very, very different to uh, a normal Django app. And this is because Mezzanine um, takes care of, um, of a lot of the heavy lifting. And only when we need something will we ask Mezzanine to give it to us. So that, that keeps this whole folder really, really neat and trim and clean. And, and very similar to the way that WordPress creates a child theme, uh, which has minimal stuff in it. So um, Mezzanine does the same thing. So effectively what we're doing here is we're creating a child theme of a parent theme. Obviously, logistically, it's completely different. Um, but uh, there, there, is, there is a a core theme that exists somewhere. And all we want to do is extend it. So the way that we extend the core theme is by calling uh, templates in the um, in the Python uh, command line, and then uh, it it will actually generate these templates for us, and then we can edit it. And then our uh, child theme open open close inverted commas um, will actually um, the, the files for those will actually be created. So let's go to our console over here, let's give ourselves some breathing room, um, and let's just kill our server. So the way that we do that is uh, the same way that we always run any Django commands, we say python manage.py, and then the command that we want to use is collect templates. And if we want a specific template, we can just go dash t, and then um, the, the way that, that Django works, uh, well, whether mezzanine works, is we actually select which template we want to create and then it will create that template specifically for us and it will mimic what has already been created um, in Mezzanine. So it's copied one template across. It's still giving us that, that error. We can fix that at some stage. So it's copied that one template across. So if we go back to our code now and we're going to templates, we can now see that we have uh, Mezzanine's base.html. So if I wanted to do this to just make 100% sure that we had something in it. I'm just going to say hello world nice and big and bold and then I'm going to run our server and I'm going to refresh this. You will now see that our base template has hello world. So that's that's really really sweet. Um, the next thing that I want to do is uh, actually just import every single template uh, and it's going to make our theme 
quite bulky, but I just want to show you for this example. It's not really best practice to import every single one, um, but let's just do it. So if I take out these parameters here, and I say collect templates, it'll now say, um, it'll now loop through every single template and ask us if we would like to overwrite that template just in case we've already created it. So would we like to overwrite base, yes or no? Yes, we would like to overwrite base. So now what it's done is it's copied 47 templates across um, and because it's noticed that we already have something in base uh, it's asked us that but otherwise it's created every single other template for us already so now you'll see our templates folder has got a lot bigger and you'll notice that because it's overwritten it we no longer have um, our h1 tag with hello world in it another thing that you'll notice which is really cool is um, uh, we have not created any of our static assets yet, so any of our JavaScript or our CSS. So if we look under static, uh, CSS, bootstrap.css, you'll see that it's still pulling in the default um, mezzanine styling and we don't have access to that. If we wanted to, we could create a CSS folder here and our CSS folder uh, and files would overwrite that of uh, mezzanine. So uh, let me just do the example of a bootstrap dash theme.css because I don't want to take out bootstrap uh, from our uh, from our theme and I'm going to go and save that to so bootstrap dash theme.css so one thing that I do want to make a note of um, is that if we look at our base.html and our theme dash css if we take this out completely and we save the file and we go back to our site again and refresh it, you'll notice that there has not been any change. So what that tells us is that this theme isn't really doing anything. So for now, I'm not going to use this theme. Um, I'm going to change this to say theme uh, dash custom. So uh, bootstrap theme dash custom dot CSS. And I'm going to change this file as well. Uh, bootstrap dash theme dash custom dot css okay cool so we don't want to fiddle with that it's not really doing anything so now let's actually add some styling to our custom theme dot css so let's just apply a tag to the whole body and let's say background and then something that's going to be really obvious like blue cool so now it's pulling in our custom theme dot css if we run this file again you'll notice that our background has changed to blue Awesome guys, congratulations. We have we have created our first custom styling on our uh, mezzanine theme. Cool, so in the last lecture we looked at how to apply our um, own custom CSS to this mezzanine theme. In this lecture I want to tackle um, importing custom or fully, um, fully fledged custom themes into our current bootstrap mezzanine theme. Now the reason that we would do this is usually uh, to save time and to give our site a completely uh, different look and feel and obviously uh, give us options with regards to um, the various elements on the page. So the inputs, the buttons, the text, uh, the fonts, the colors, all of that. So what you could very well do is go ahead and target all of the HTML, HTML uh, classes and IDs and create your own theme, uh, which is a very popular thing to do. And I mean, you could in fact go ahead and sell that theme on various online platform, platforms specifically for Mezzanine. So this is very similar to the way that WordPress works where uh, you can buy custom themes uh, for WordPress. Uh, but we dealing specifically uh, now in this lecture with a uh, bootstrap CSS theme. So let's go uh, open up a new tab in our browser and I'm going to go to a site called bootswatch.com. And if you know anything about design, you'll know that the word swatch relates to a color palette. Um, so I'm just going to go to the site and scroll down a bit. And, and here you'll see a couple of custom bootstrap uh, CSS themes that are being created. So I'm going to pick one of these that looks quite a lot different from what we currently have. So let's go with the slate one. Uh, and instead of just clicking download, you'll notice that, um, well, let's preview this quickly, open it in a new tab. Yeah, and this looks completely different to what we currently have. So let's use this one. 
Um, and if you, instead of clicking download button, if we click on the arrow to the right of that, you'll notice that we have a couple of options here. Uh, the first being the minified bootstrap.css, the second being the regular bootstrap.css. Uh, the difference between these two, uh, really, if you're not a, a CSS person, is that um, the minified version has the entire file compressed. So it, it kind of tries to save space as much as it can. And you'll notice that this file will be considerably smaller than the um, regular bootstrap CSS file. And you'll see the regular bootstrap.css has this expanded out quite nicely. Uh, and then the other two, um, the variable.less and variable.scss, and then and these variables and bootswatch, etc., etc. Uh, I want to cover these in the next lect lecture, but basically, uh, these are pre-processes for CSS. So I know that that is not really in the scope of this course, but I feel like it would be a nice tool to have uh, if you would like to start looking at CSS pre-processes. So for the time being, I'm just going to uh, open up bootstrap.min.css, which I've already opened up over here. And I'm just going to go Command A or Control A on a PC, and then Control C or Command C, and just copy everything in this file. And then I'm going to go back to our um, our bootstrap theme dot uh, bootstrap slash bootstrap dash theme dash custom dot css, and I'm just going to remove what's in here and just paste our theme into that and save it. So now if we go back to the front end of our site, so we can actually close out uh, these tabs here, and we refresh the page, we should see what looks like the new theme. Great, and now we've changed the entire look and feel of our theme, and it's actually looking quite nice. There are a few things that um, Mezzanine adds, which isn't part of Bootstrap, so this entire footer section, so we will obviously need to clean this up if we want this um, to look really, really cool. Um, and as I mentioned, the next lecture, we're going to be looking a little bit at pre-processes for our CSS and how to set that up. Cool. Hi. In the last lecture, we looked at how to add a Bootswatch theme to our mezzanine theme. And what I want to do in this lecture as quickly um, as possible, and bearing in mind this is not a quick subject, uh, but I'm just going to, to skim over the surface. Obviously, if you would like to do more research on this um, and make it your own, that's entirely up to you. But but I want to cover um, variable and bootswatch.less and the SCSS equivalent. So um, what do these files mean? If, if you are familiar with pre, uh, CSS preprocessors, then you can uh, skip this lecture, but this lecture is, is really just a filler lecture for those of you who don't uh, know too much about this and want some background behind it. So basically less and SCSS, also known as SAS, um, are two different CSS preprocessors. Now, what on earth is a preprocessor? Basically, what a CSS preprocessor is, is a special type of language, very similar to CSS, uh, which allows you to um, create CSS based off of that. Uh, and the whole purpose of SCSS is to allow you to um, cr create less markup, uh, to create things like variables, um, to nest your selectors, and in general, just just make your life a lot easier with regards to writing CSS. And um, what it does is also takes care of a, a lot of the issues such as uh, minification, so making your files smaller, um, adding vendor prefixes. So, for example, if you uh, need to use a vendor prefix for Flexbox or something like that, so SCSS and Less will add that for you. Uh, you can also do really cool things such as create functions in your preprocessors. Uh, create templates for classes in your preprocessors and create variables, um, which is very helpful for things such as uh, colors that you're going to use often. You can just call that variable instead of actually having, having to um, include the hexadecimal or RGB color code in your uh, file. So uh, the first thing that we need to do with our with our um, CSS preprocessors is actually create a task manager. So a really cool task manager and um, that I like to use is called Grunt. So if we go to if we do a little Google search for Grunt, uh, you'll see it's a JavaScript task runner. So if you're familiar with JavaScript at all, hopefully this will make a little bit more sense. Uh, you can see 
here we have sass that is used with JavaScript. Uh, and you'll also see that grunt is a command line based tool. So uh, you need to be quite familiar with the command line to use this. Don't worry if you're not. Um, I hope by this stage in the series you have a little bit of an understanding of how the command line works and how to navigate it. Uh, but if not, we're going to be covering it in this uh, lecture. So the next thing that we need to look at is how to um, get Grunt to work with SCSS. Uh, and basically what Grunt will do is Grunt will actually handle the, the task manager side of things. So what we are going to do is we're going to create a Grunt watch script. And what that's going to do is it's going to watch our files um, or our SCSS or our less files, watch them. And if any changes take place in those files, it will automatically run our Grunt script and it will create a new CSS file based off our SCSS or our less file. So I'm going to use SCSS just because I prefer that and that's what I'm used to working. So let's do a little Google search for getting started with Grunt and SCSS, also known as SAS. And great, the article that I'm looking for comes up straight away. Uh, the reason that I'm using this article is um, I would like you guys to go to the site and there's a lot of code that you can just copy from the site uh, and, and put straight into your project. So the main things that I want to look at is this command here. So what this command here will do is it will uh, let you install the grant command line interface onto your system. But in order to do that, you need to have what is known as NPM, uh, which stands for Node Package Manager. So this is a node thing. So regardless of what operating system you're on, you will need to install Node. So let's open this up in a new tab. Um, and if you don't already have Node installed, I would suggest going to the Node website and just installing Node for uh, your relevant operating system. Basically what Node is, is a JavaScript engine based off the uh, Chrome uh, JavaScript processor the Google Chrome JavaScript processor. And what it allows you to do is essentially server-side JavaScript processing. So this is a really cool uh, development and there is a lot of work going into server-side JavaScript processes, especially with um, APIs. And this is usually based on Node. Um, we are only going to use Node for its package manager. So we're not going to use it for anything else. So uh, if you haven't already done that, you'll see Chrome's JavaScript engine. Um, if you haven't already done that, just go ahead and install a node onto your system and then you will have access to Node's package manager. Now, the next thing that I want to look at is if you're a Windows user, you will need to go ahead and install Ruby. So you can go to uh, rubyinstaller.org and then find your appropriate download and then just download that onto your system. The reason that we're installing Ruby is because SAS or SCSS is originally written in Ruby. Um, as far as I know, there is a JavaScript version. So SAS has been completely rewritten in JavaScript. But for the purposes of this lecture, um, it would be great if you just go ahead and install Ruby on your system. If you're a Mac user, you won't have to do that because uh, Ruby is built into Mac. So good for you. Um, cool. And once those two things are installed, you should um, be able to go ahead and run npm install global so the g stands for global so you install it throughout your whole your whole system and then grant dash cli which is your uh your grant command line interface great and once you've done that now uh, we should have all of the variables set up for us for us so for future projects we don't have to redo the stuff we can just skip straight on to the next section cool so the next section um basically gives you three options the first option is to um, install your dependencies, which we will be installing. Uh, we need the watch dependency to watch our um, files to change. And we obviously need the SAS dependency as well to actually compile our SCSS into CSS. Um, NPM init will, will try and automate this process and put it onto your command line. And the third, you can have a, a template file set up and then you'll just need to run NPM install and it will um, run all of this for you really. So I'm going to go with option number three because it's really nice to have a, a little template that we can use on all of our projects and we can obviously edit this on a per project basis uh, and we can um, use this to 
to uh, every time we create a new project, we can use the same file. So I'm going to set up a package.json file and put this code into that. So I'm just going to copy this and go back to our code. And then uh, let's just do it within our static folder for now. This is not really best practice, but you can put your, um, uh, uh, ideally would be in an assets folder, but you can put this anywhere in your project that you want. So I'm going to go into our static folder and create a new file called package.json and save that. And I'm going to paste the code in there. So under project name, I'm just going to say my project because that is the name of the project. You obviously want to put your project's name in there and the version. And then we need to look at the dependencies and put the dependencies in here. So if you've worked at all with JavaScript, uh, you'll, you'll notice that we are using a JSON here, which is obviously package.json. And what this is doing is this is creating a JSON object, which our grunt file will have a look at and will attempt, well, actually it will be our node package manager. We'll have a look at and we'll attempt to install these dependencies uh, and create them in a folder called um, node modules. So that's obviously node for node package manager. Um, so you'll so this this you can kind of see is uh, just regular JSON. So now we actually need to put our dependencies in here. So let's uh, scroll down a little bit on our page, and you'll see that it already gives us our dependencies. So let's copy those three dependencies. Obviously, we need to have the grant dependency installed. Uh, we need to have the SAS dependency installed, and we need to have the watch dependency installed. Uh, so let's go back to our file, and we can save this. Um, and now our package.json file has been successfully created. And what we should be able to do now is just go back to our command line, uh, go to the file in which this package.json is sitting and run npm install. Um, and that should just install all of these packages in a node modules folder. So let's go back to our command line. I'm going to open up a new tab with a uh, command D or uh, well, obviously, well, obviously the equivalent on a Windows machine if you're using that. And I'm just going to go LS and I'm going to go into uh, CD into my... I'm already in my project. I need to CD into the static folder. And we'll see our package.json is here. So now we should be able to just go npm install. And you'll see it's now going to uh, the node package manager online and it's pulling in all these dependencies. Obviously, again, if you would like to investigate this stuff yourself, you can do that, but um, I'm, I'm using uh, the example code here. So this is really, really minimal. And you'll see that all of our libraries have successfully been installed. So now if we go back to our code, what you'll notice, uh, as I mentioned before, that a nodes module um, folder has been created. You do not ever need to touch this folder. There is a whole lot of dependency stuff um, for our watch and our SAS and our uh, grant dependencies that have been installed. You'd never ever need to touch this. All you need to know is that it is here. Um, if you're using something like version control, it might be better to just include your package.json file and not and, and, and add your node modules folder to your git ignore. And then whenever somebody is setting up your uh, your repository or the project on, on their computer so they will just be able to download this themselves instead of having a whole lot of extra uh, stuff in your uh, repository. Cool, now the next thing that we need to do is actually create our grant file and this is the file that's going to be run and it's going to call these dependencies and is going to tell us, tell our files what to do at various points. So I'm just gonna copy this example grant file uh, you don't have to worry too much about how this works um, besides a couple of small tweaks that we will need to make. So uh, inside of the same folder, in our static folder, I'm going to create a grant file.js. Now, obviously the naming conventions of these files, package.json and grant file.js are very important because grant and node package manager are looking for those files specifically. So let's uh, save this, grant file.js and paste our grant file in there. And what you can see now is it's actually creating some JavaScript. Um, you can see it's loading our uh, libraries in here and um, it's, it's, it's calling our watch task by default. So the default task, if we just had to run grant in this folder would run the watch task. So where is our watch task? Here is our watch task here. And it's looking for files, anything, uh, so any file, 
uh, in a folder, any folder that has a file, anything.scss will run the task sass. So if anything here changes um, while our watch is running, so this task will run. And this task we can find up here, uh, and it's obviously looking for uh, packages in our package.json file, um, which is here, and then that references them back to the node modules folder and all the files inside there. So here we're calling our SAS task or SCSS task, um, and then this is the distribution that's going to happen. It's going to run our SAS file. So this is the CSS file that it's going to create. And this is the, uh, the file that it's going to look for to find as a reference. So obviously what we need to do then is create a folder called SAS. And we can edit this however we want to. So we've got a SAS folder. And then I'm just going to name it the same way that we've done before. So um, in WordPress, it has a default style that CSS, so we can actually just leave that. I'm going to create a um, file inside of here and just call it style.scss. So we can add our custom style to that. Um, and we don't need to call this at all in our actual project. We're only going to be working with the, the minified CSS file. So um, we can go into, we can change this to CSS. Uh, and then you'll see once we've created this, a style.css file should appear in here. Um, so just for the sake of this example, I'm going to actually create a link to our style.css file here. I'm going to run it after our custom theme. So if our custom theme applies any styles, so our um, custom style that CSS or SCSS file will overwrite those. So we're going to find that in CSS and then it's going to be style.css. So we're not, we don't ever pull SCSS into our project. We only use it for uh, pre-processing reasons. Cool. So now we have that set up. Um, you can now see we have our, uh, it's watching anything dot um, SCSS. So the anything could be the SAS folder and then style.scss is watching that. Um, obviously, it takes up processing power the broader you make this. So we can just change this to, oopsie, we can change this to file. And this is obviously relative to our um, grant file.js. So we can say SAS and then we can watch uh, style.scss. And at the moment, it's pulling in a string. If we wanted to watch more than one file specifically, obviously we can use the, the special star command. Otherwise we can actually put this into a JavaScript array uh, and then list multiple files here. So if we had another SAS file called custom, we could put that in there. So, so that's really cool. So it can watch multiple files. And this is also nice if we're doing something like a JavaScript um, uglyf uglyfication or minification uh, that works nicely with that. Uh, and then we can we can do the same thing here. We can add multiple files that need to be uh, processed from SAS into SCSS. Awesome. So this should all work great. So I'm going to leave this blank for now. I'm going to go back to our terminal, um, and um, because we're in the right file now, you can see we have our grant file.js. So if we run the grant command, which is the default command, you can see that it's running our watch task. And that is because we've made the default task watch. And watch is obviously a, a stateful task that's, as soon as we change something, we'll see that this actually processes that file. So the only time it's ever going to change something is if we go into our um, SCSS, style with SCSS file and actually change something in there. So let's do that. Let's go ahead and make, again, let's make our body background blue as we did before. And if, as soon as we, so you'll notice nothing's happened yet uh, here. So let's give ourselves a bit of breathing room. So nothing's happened yet. It's waiting. We can add a bit of space here to see that nothing's happened. And as soon as we save this, you will notice that we get a warning, a warning. That's fantastic. Um, so it's telling us that our SCSS isn't valid. So error generating source map, couldn't, da, 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 no file name, there's nothing source map linked to it. Uh, let's just go back here and see if it's actually added anything. It actually has gone ahead and created our file here, but it's giving us an error. And it's saying there's an, 
a syntax error. Couldn't determine the public URL for the source style sheet. So I suspect our issue with regards to this is because our um, version of SAS is obsolete. Um, this uh, version here that we pulled in, sorry, our, our version of the, the SAS compiler. So the latest version uh, from what I can see is around about version one of the time of recording this. So uh, let's change the version over here. So, th so this um, little squiggly line here means roundabout version one. So let's save that. And then what I want to do is I want to uh, cancel this and then rerun our npm install. So let's just let that happen. And yes, our, our new version has now been created. So now we can go grunt, normal grunt, run that and watch. And now if we go ahead and save this, we are not getting any errors. Great stuff, guys. Cool, so now you can see it. What it has also done is it's generated a CSS a style.css.map file. And basically what this is doing is this is allowing us to map our CSS to our SCSS. Um, and if we go to our style.css, it'll actually give us the, the route to our source map. So don't worry about this. This is completely valid. And this is really nice for debugging. So we can see um, even though we're only pulling in the CSS into our project, the source map will allow us to actually uh, to, to, to trace whatever issues we have back to our style.scss. Uh, another cool thing about this is if we just went ahead and uh, refreshed the front end of our site, so let's go back to the front end of our site, we should see now that the background color has changed to blue. Awesome, guys. Uh, this is all that I'm going to be covering with regards to uh, task management, uh, specifically for um, SCSS. If you want to go ahead and go into the, the boot swatch, um, you can actually go ahead and, and download the SCSS file uh, if you want to. Copy that and you can paste it into your uh, style.scss. We also need to load another file before this. So what you can do with SCSS if you want to is actually import files into other files. Um, so if we go to variable, because variable is also what we need. Um, and for the sake of this example, I'm just going to paste it before this. So ideally we divide these into two separate files. Go ahead and save this. It's giving us an error. Uh, what is it saying? Uh, undefined mix-in. Okay, and what it's looking for here is for a mix-in that can only be found in a bootstrap.scss um, uh, setup. So I don't want to get into the logistics of bringing in the whole of Bootstrap into an SCS file, SCSS file, but essentially what this means is that in our um, base.html, we would then need to take this out, this bootstrap.css, and pull this in as an SCSS file. And you can see how something like this could get really complicated really quickly. Um, the way that we would look for our uh, bootstrap.scss is if we open up a new tab, uh, and the chances are that we're going to find a git repository that comes up. Here we go. So inside of here, uh, let's do a quick search for this and see what comes up. Uh, and you'll, and you, what you will find is that um, this is actually a mix-in. Here we go. That's being created under asset style sheets, bootstraps, mix-ins, gradient.scss. So what this is, is a bootstrap function. Um, and this is pulled in when, like I say, the entire uh, bootstrap um, SCSS library is pulled in. And then what you'll notice as well is that if we actually go to the base of our uh, bootstrap style sheets section, uh, you'll see that bootstrap.scss is pulled in with this uh, folder here. And then the assumption is that all of these are pulled into bootstrap.scss eventually. 
And if we load this file, you'll see that it's importing all of these mixins, which is another name for functions and variables, etc., etc., etc. So I'm not going to go through the whole process of pulling this in right now. So as a quick fix or a bit of a hack, uh, I'm going to actually just remove uh, the, the place where it's looking for this uh, gradient vertical three colors. So I'm just going to remove that from our style.scss file. Uh, and you'll now see that we don't have any issues. It says OK. So let's just uh, reload that again, just so that you can see that it is in fact OK. So I'm going to cancel uh, my grunt and I'm going to run it. You'll see everything's OK. Uh, we actually need to make a change here, save it. And it's successfully working. So the last thing that I want to do before I we, we pull this off is, well, well, to finish this section off, is to actually just um, undo the changes that we've made here. And I actually want to go ahead and create this mixing. So we can do this just before. Uh, if we go to back to our bootstrap uh, GitHub repository, and we go to the place where we found this mixin. Uh, which is here, and we pull in this entire mix in, which is uh, SCSS or SAS's um, way of saying a function. We go back to our code and we just create this mix in, so now it can find this mix in. So if we save this, it should successfully run everything, and we have not removed anything from our code. So, as I mentioned before, this is not really ideal. Uh, but it is one way to, to get around not having to pull in our entire bootstrap.scss into this uh, particular setup. So um, what, you, what you ideally would like to do is actually pull um, this whole uh, bootstrap repository into yours and then obviously only take from it what you need, um, this bootstrap.scss repository. Uh, and, then, and then set it up as kind of like a template. Uh, in terms of the file structure, so you would have a folder called uh, Bootstrap, and then your everything in here would work according to that folder structure. And then when you finished um, saving it, all of those files, so every single one of the files here, are found in the style sheets. All of these compass, compass, mincer, sprockets, all of that. Um, obviously, you can take out the ones that you don't need. Everything in here will be compiled into a single um, CSS file which you can also modify um, and what you'll what you'll notice as well is that like uh, SAS does a very good job of um, kind of taking out the gunk that you don't need and only giving you um, what you do need to to make the the modified file as efficient and as small and as neat and as clean as possible cool so that covers the uh, task manager section of this um, series. Uh, in the next few uh, lectures I'm going to be looking at some of the other plugins that uh, Django offers, third-party plugins that Django offers. Awesome, see you then. Hi there. In the last section we looked at Mezzanine as a content management system built on top of Django as well as how to customize it. We also looked at how to uh, create a task manager and um, a node package manager setup so we could process um, SCSS files um, as well as, as any other tasks that we would like to have automated on our system. In this section, I want to look at e-commerce for Django. So why am I bringing up e-commerce for Django? Well, the first thing being that if you are a WordPress developer, e-commerce is uh, probably not a new term for you and something that you're probably familiar with and use on an everyday basis. Uh, this is because uh, WordPress as a platform is very, very easy to set up. And especially for aspiring uh, entrepreneurs, setting up an online store with WordPress is a very, very straightforward uh, process and you really don't need to have any coding knowledge to do this. Um, and because of this, some major um, household names have emerged, such as Easy Digital Downloads or WooCommerce, and these are really 
big giants in the industry that have capitalized on um, the the WordPress ethos of uh, being able to set something up out of the box and, and having to do minimal configuration and not having to have any uh, prior coding knowledge. Uh, for Django, obviously, this is slightly different because Django's approach is not one um, where a Django site can be run by somebody who has no Python or Django knowledge. Um, and it's very difficult to, to be a complete uh, curator of sites built on Django without some knowledge of the how, how the inner workings uh, operate. So um, I can completely understand your hesitance with regards to, to using Django for an e-commerce solution because of this. Uh, but hopefully I'll be able to put your mind at ease within the next few lectures uh, where I'm going to be looking at some really, really nice um, Django uh, plugins that have been written specifically for e-commerce and just show you that it really is not um, the, the giant beast that it seems to be um, and that e-commerce for Django can actually be a really, really pleasant experience and there have been some really well-written plugins and extensions for Django that make e-commerce uh, really nice and simple and at the same time give you the uh, robust control that uh, WordPress e-commerce or, or WooCommerce doesn't necessarily uh, give you out of the box. Hi there. So the best way to look at what the options that are available to us are with regards to Django e-commerce packages is to go to the Django packages.org site. Then I'm going to click on the e-commerce tab and scroll down to uh, our various packages. And as you'll see, this is very similar to when we were looking for uh, the mezzanine content management system. So down here, you'll see we have quite a few e-commerce options. If we scroll to the right, uh, there are really, really a lot. So there are three e-commerce platforms that I would like to focus on in this section. Uh, specifically re with regards to setting them up. The first is Django Oscar. Now for me, this is one of the uh, biggest e-commerce stores that offers a lot out of the box uh, and gives you a lot of options. The next one that I'm going to be looking at is called Sale Or or Sellior, and that is closely linked with Sketchless. So I'll be discussing these two together. And then the third one that I'm going to be looking at is Cartridge which is an e-commerce uh, extension for the mezzanine CMS. Awesome, see you in the next lecture. Hi, so in this lecture, we are going to be looking at the e-commerce platform called Oscar. Uh, some things that I want to discuss with regarding to Oscar is first, how to set up Oscar. Um, I'm going to walk you through this because I know that this can be a bit of a pain. Obviously, if you are using a different operating system, then you will need to use that operating system's equivalent with regards to uh, package management and installing external libraries. Um, as far as I know, Django um, and Oscar doesn't have anything uh, that is that is different to the way that we've currently been working. And if you have successfully managed to install Python and you've been following along with the rest of our projects, you should have no problem following along here. So. Let's click on the Django Oscar link. Uh, and then the best place to go from here would be the documentation. Obviously, if we want to set up a new project, so let's go into documentation. And then I want to look at the latest version of the documentation. Yeah, let's go with latest. Uh, and then here we've got all of our Oscar documentation. So what we want to do is we want to build uh, our own shop. So you will go ahead and click on build your own shop. And then it will give you quite a comprehensive list of how to set up Oscar. Now, Oscar um, inherently is not just a plugin. Um, it is what you would call middleware, and you'll notice that there are middleware settings in this. And what middleware does uh, within the Django context is, instead of just being a plugin that you install, it actually hijacks the core functionality of your, of your Django framework the same way that mezzanine would do. Um, this is not really my preferred way of doing things. I would rather uh, build something um, from scratch and then have a plug in 
that you you can use a, you, a, you may or may not want to use it and, and it operates as a separate application uh, this is what a sail or does and we're going to be looking at that a little bit later but just for the, the purpose of this this example we are going to follow these instructions um, bearing in mind that it is going to hijack some of our core settings in Django so the first part that I want to look at is this section here, uh, we do not have make virtual the uh, virtual env installed, so I'm just going to use our usual way of creating a virtual environment, uh, and then I'm just going to go to my terminal and I've created a directory called Oscar on my desktop. So I want to cd into Oscar, uh, and then I'm going to paste this line of code, which is as we've done many times before, creating created a, vir a virtual environment for us. So you'll you will now see when, once this is done that our virtual environment be created. Next thing we want to do is activate our virtual environment. And you'll notice before we use the word source and then went to that environment, you can actually just use a dot character here. So this is a nice shorthand for saying source. And this should activate our virtual environment. So we've created it and now we've activated it. Great. And the next thing we're going to do is we're actually going to create our Django project. So initially when you create your a Django project, it won't be a um, a uh, Oscar project, but what, what we will do is we'll edit our settings file so that it does um, end up being an Oscar project and we'll import all of the relevant libraries. So the first thing that I want to do uh, when we've just created it and, and went into our virtual environment is actually install Django Oscar. So let's go back here and then let's just install Django Oscar into our virtual environment. You'll notice that this is quite quick for me because I'm caching it. You probably wouldn't have done this before. So this may take a little bit longer to download everything. Uh, what you will notice as well is that um, I don't know if I'll be able to find it here, but Django itself is actually a dependency of the Django Oscar framework. So it will make sure that you have Django installed. So you don't need to install Django as a, a separate library over and above this. There we go, collecting Django. So Django is actually a library that is required. So we don't really need to, inst we don't need to install Django again. Um, if we go back here again, so now we have Oscar installed. The next thing we want to do is actually go ahead and create our shop. So this is a documentation that was written for an old version of Django uh, where you would need the Django admin.py. We don't need this .py here. We can just say Django admin start project uh, from shop as we have been doing before. So let's give ourselves a bit of space and I'm just going to take out the .py. Cool. And now we can probably see the into that. And you'll notice that we have a normal um, Django installation here. So the first thing that I want to do, um, as if we did have a normal Django installation, is just make all of our default migrations. So um, actually, let's let's leave that for now. And and because I, I'm almost certain that Oscar is going to try and create its own uh, data sets as well, so we can do all of our migrations at once. Cool. The next thing we need to do is we need to ensure that Pillow is installed. And Pillow is an image. Uh, library, so you see a, a Python imaging library, and this helps us a lot with uh, creating images. As we discussed in one of our previous lectures, all it really does is, is it allows you to, um, it will gives you access to a new type of model field known as image, uh, where before the default would have just been file field. So this is obviously has some sort of validation that's specific to images. Um, if I'm not mistaken, I think Pillow was installed as one of the dependencies um, here. Well, let's let's just go ahead and install it anyway, and let's see what happens. So, pip install Pillow. Requirements already satisfied. Yes. Okay. Awesome. And now what we need to do is we need to pull the um, whole of our um, our Oscar library into our settings.py file. So we're going to say from oscar.default import star, which is everything. So I'm going to go ahead and open up Sublime Text. I've already done that here and you'll see this is our virtual environment we've just created and here's our project. I'm going to go into settings.py and underneath import OS, 
I'm going to import uh, the defaults from Oscar and just go ahead and save that. Um, we won't be able to run our site straight away because there's quite a lot of setup that we need to do. Um, now it says modify your templates to include the main Oscar templates. So I'm going to go ahead and, and copy this whole thing and replace our uh, templates section in our uh, settings.py. So templates is down here. I'm just going to go ahead and replace the whole thing. And don't forget to uh, import this to add this line as well. So from Oscar import uh, Oscar main template directory, and that obviously gives us access to all of um, Oscar's templates. Uh, let's go back here again. Uh, before Django, the setting was flipped between. Okay, so we don't actually need this at all. Uh, the next thing that we're going to do is uh, modify our installed apps um, section. So again, this was written for an older version of Django, so this won't all be the same. So we may need to just tweak this a little bit to fit in with our current settings file. If you're using a later version of Django than I am, then you may need to go above and beyond to get this to work properly. So let's go to our installed apps, and I'm going to try and mimic this as best as I can. So obviously the first thing that we need to do is from uh, Oscar imports the core apps that Oscar has and what's really nice and I think we did discuss it before is if you want to append list values to a list you can just say plus and then this function obviously just returns a list value so we're really just adding more items to this list of installed apps so the only difference here really is that we have the admin um, uh, installed app here where we didn't have it on this one and then we have a, a few extra um, uh, install apps that we need to add. The first is flat pages. So what flat pages is is basically a, a management tool that allows you to put flat HTML into your database and then it handles that for you. Uh, flat pages is probably going to throw us an error so um, we need to install this as another package. So let's just go back into our console again and say pip install Flat pages. Great, and now we're downloading and installing flat pages. Uh, I'm not sure why it's giving us that issue, but I suspect that it may be a um, dependency of another um, app that is already installed. Let, let's carry on from here and we'll possibly come back to this. Um, so We've, we've put flat pages in, let's just see. All right, we're over here, yes, and then we need to install, we need to add two other apps, the one called Compressor and the one called Widget Tweaks. Okay, and let's just get our formatting right. And these are all basically matching each other. And then the last thing we need to do is just say, site ID is equal to one. To, um, one. I think this is related to when you have a multi-site installation. Cool. One thing that I know for a fact that we are going to have to install is Compressor. And what Compressor does is it, it is just a special library that handles um, compressing and caching your um, inline JavaScript and CSS. So let's go and install the Compressor package. It's, it's not called Compressor in the Django library. It's called Django underscore Compressor. So we'll have to go. Um, we can possibly press up and see what happens. Yes. Pip install. And then let's say Django, and then it's underscore compressor. Let's see, yes, okay, cool. So I've already installed this previously, so it's cached it and it's just adding it to our virtual environment. Again, uh, if you do this, it, it will take a little bit longer, but it's it's my environment is inherently not any different from yours. Cool, so uh, we're happy with that. Um, next thing we need to do is go back to here, make sure that's all the same. Okay, and it says here, note Django Contra flat pages, which isn't included by default flat pages, also requires Django Contra sites. So I think we are probably going to have to use that Django Contra sites. I don't think we've used it in our, aha, here we go, Django. Contrib sites. I 
think you may we may have to use this before we call flat pages. If not, then let's just do it to be safe. Okay, cool. So installed apps needs to look something like this. Okay. Uh, which won't be enabled by default. More info about installing flat pages in the Django docs. So let's go ahead and open that. I think that's probably a good idea. And what does it say here about installing flat pages? Okay. Um, install, added to your installed apps. Perfect. Make sure we've set the site ID. Perfect. Add Django contrib flag pages, flag pages to your installed apps, done. And then we need to add this to our URLs. So either do that or add Django, um, add this to our middleware setting. I've got a feeling that um, this is going to come later on when we add our middleware stuff. So let's just see. And if not, we can come back to this. So let's go into here. Uh, Default Django compressor and tweaks is optional. Yeah, so compressor we've already installed and tweaks. I think let let's see if it throws us any errors. We may have to install that as additional library. And then here we go. We need to install the Django middleware, which is going to hijack our core stuff, and the flat pages middleware, which is also going to hijack our core stuff. So let's copy these two lines of code. Go back to our settings.py file. Go to our middleware section, and now we need to add these additional lines over here underneath that so that takes care of our flat pages hopefully um, and then we just need to add a whole lot of um, kind of like constants or settings that that um, uh, off oscar requires out of the box so there's some authentication stuff so we can just let's just go to the bottom of our file underneath there let's add some space paste our authentication Great stuff. Uh, we need to go into our URLs file. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to replace my whole default URLs file with what they've given us. Um, so let's just do that. Replace. Let's just save this. Great stuff. Search backend. Okay. So um, we're going to be using uh, basic search here. So again, this is just more configuration stuff. So we just add that to the bottom of our file. I don't want to fiddle with this. This is a special uh, backend search. We're not going to be using that. Database settings, I'm pretty um, confident that our database is set up and is fine. And then we should just be able to run these two commands here. Now, something that I know is going to, uh, it's not here is going to give us issues is our is the setting up of our um, our static and our uh, media paths. So let's just go have a look and actually see if it gives us anything here with regards to it. Maybe we missed it. Here we go. Cool. So we need to ensure the media files are set up correctly. So um, this means that we need to have these URLs and we also need to set these are these are constants so media URL and static URL which are constants and media root and static root um, and this is and this is um, here specifically because we may want to use something like Amazon AWS uh, Amazon S3 to actually serve our content for us and function as a CDN so in order to get this whole configuration stuff right let's just open the sandbox settings that um, that Oscar says to us. Uh, so what I want to do is I want to just copy all of this from here down to the end of static file finders. And we're just going to put that at the bottom of our URLs. The static URL I think is in here as well. Yeah, so we can just replace that. It's exactly the same. And what we are using here is a location which we, which we haven't used before. So we, we obviously need to import location from somewhere. Um, so let's have a look here. And it's probably going to be one of our imports things that we need. Uh, here we go. This section here is what we're going to need. 
So we need to import uh, our system, which basically um, what it is is just a whole lot of, of system libraries that relate to the current um, uh, hosting that we've got set up. So we can do some things such as um, like create an actual project directory to get the absolute path of our our files and then use system to help us get our version info and things like that. So let's just import this. I don't even think we need to use system because it looks like version info is on system, but we're not using it at all. We're really just using project directory and then we're using um, the project directory here. I don't even know if we're using that. Let's keep it in and then you'll see that we're creating our location variable using our operating system library that we've imported. So let's just import both of these to be safe. Uh, I've got a feeling that we may not even need project directory. Great, so location has now been created. So um, let us now actually just go ahead and well, what we'll need to do is run our migrations and I suppose that'll be the true test as to, let's close this tab, as to whether or not our, um, our setup has been successful. So let's run python manage.py migrate and this should take care of all of our default migrations as well as our uh, our new oscar migrations so let's see if this works uh, and oh my goodness this is actually working we get a couple of deprecation notices which i'm not too worried about um, but really it's just migrating all of our stuff and this is just so, so awesome to see. Uh, once this is done, what I'm going to do is actually go ahead and actually run the server and see if we have successfully set up Oscar. More deprecation notices and congratulations guys, we have a, a successful a version of Oscar up and running. So let's go here to our local host. Yuck. Okay, so what does this error mean? It really doesn't give us uh, much explanation at all. Uh, it doesn't doesn't really give us anything helpful in terms of line numbers. So I think the best thing to do is to go back to our Django documentation and have a little look here. So. What I, what I have noticed, um, and this is after a little bit of investigation, is that the middleware that's being called, and this is really just sparks from my, um, from my thinking that when something like this breaks, it's probably a core Django thing that's processing middleware incorrectly. Um, and you'll notice here that the constant that's being defined is called middleware underscore classes. So, up until Django 1.10, this was the standard to call uh, when you create a new project, it would be called middleware classes. But in Django 1.10, this has now changed to just be middleware. Uh, so the classes has fallen away and it's become redundant. But obviously because it's deprecated, middle, middleware classes will still work on Django 1.10. Um, it looks like Oscar is still working on an older version of Django. Uh, so hopefully these deprecations will be sorted out soon uh, in terms of this documentation. So let's just go back to our, um, our app quickly and, and see if this is actually what it is. So I want to find the middleware section and change this to say middle under, middleware underscore classes. And we can now go ahead and save that. Uh, and then it looks like our issue has gone away. Let's refresh. Yes, and you'll now see that we have successfully logged into our storefront and we can now select our language. We can now browse a store for all products. Obviously, no products have been created. View cart, and there's quite a lot of cool stuff that comes with Oscar out of the box. Hi, and welcome back to uh, this section. Uh, in this section, I'm going to be looking at how to set up cartridge. So let's just uh, go back to our Django packages, e-commerce, and then go to the cartridge um, package. And then I'm just going to click straight onto the cartridge documentation. 
uh, and then click installation here and it will give us a brief overview how to install Cartridge. So some key things that we just need to do, which we have been doing in previous lectures, but obviously the more that we do it, the better we'll get at this. So let's just go to our uh, console here, give us a little bit of space. And not that it looked like there was anything there anyway. This folder is empty, so we're going to go virtual env and we're going to create a new virtual environment to call it cart. Um, and again, it's very important to keep our uh, virtual environments separated. So we haven't gone into that, so let's just go uh, dots as we did before cart, cart, uh, bin, activate, create, and our cart. Um, virtual environment has been activated. So now we're actually going to go ahead and install Cartridge. So this is really great because um, a lot of the libraries that we would usually use, such as uh, Django, Mezzanine, Pillow, these already, um, are, are these are requirements of, of Cartridge. So these will install automatically. So that's really cool for us. I've got a lot of the stuff cached, so you might need to wait a bit longer for yours to install. Uh, and great, Cartridge has now been installed. And what's really nice about Cartridge and Mezzanine, as I mentioned um, in the previous lectures, is it actually has its own command line tool that comes with it because Mezzanine, like Oscar, is a middleware and kind of likes to hijack um, various uh, parts of Django core. So the same way we would create a Mezzanine project as we did before, except we're going to add the Cartridge keyword in as a parameter here, and that will um, Bear in mind that we wanted to create a cartridge mezzanine store and not just create a, a mezzanine uh, e-commerce, or sorry, a mezzanine uh, CMS um, instance. So I'm just going to call the project project name, but when in fact you would obviously want to name this the name of your store. So mezzanine create project, and then we can cd into uh, project name, and you'll see this has already been set up for us. So that's really great. Let's see what else we need to do. Uh, okay, cool. So what no input does here, so we want to create our database. What no input does is when we create a kind of user section um, or any other sections that require input, it will it will just skip that and give us a default value. So I don't really want to do that because I want to create my own um, uh, user input. So let's just, what am I missing here? Did I not copy this correctly? Copy, paste. Okay, so instead of going dash dash no input, I'm just going to take it out um, because I wanted to ask me to create username and password. Um, and it's giving me an error here saying no module name sanitizer. Uh, I suspect that what I'll need to do here is actually just go pip install sanitizer. Great, and sanitizer successfully been installed. Uh, let's try run the previous command again. And it's giving us the same error. Let's see, warning you not have allowed host setting. That's a warning, so we don't have to set that. Um, Okay, so after a little bit of research, I found that uh, Sanitizer has got a bit of an issue with a package called Bleach. So I just need to needed to install the Bleach package. So I just went pip install Bleach and then just installed this package for me. Um, so it, it uninstalled the current one and then just uh, reinstalled it again. And that seemed to have fixed the problem. And then I ran um, uh, python manage.py create db and it now ran all of our uh, database migration. So that's really nice. And this is what I was talking about uh, when I said the no input. So now it's now it's allowing us to enter input input. So obviously it is our um, local host for now. So we're going to hit enter. Uh, admin username, admin, email address, nothing, password, my password, password again, my password. Uh, would you like to yes, let's create these, uh, these mezzanine demo pages. Uh, would you like to install the initial demo project and sell for, I assume for, sorry, product and sell for mezzanine. So let's do that. I mean, for, for a cartridge. Yes, let's do that. And great. It should have successfully set up everything. So now if we go manage the py run server, 
it's giving us this haven't set domain name. Great and mezzanine is up and running. So this is significantly easier to set up than our um, Oscar project. And if we go back to our uh, site and we go to our browser and we go here, you can now see that mezzanine has successfully been set up and we have a demo product already created for us that's got these variations. So if I was wanting to set up a very basic a default e-commerce site, I would definitely go with cartridge um, and mezzanine if I wanted to integrate that with the mezzanine CMS. Um, and again, the back end of mezzanine, let me just enter the, um, obviously because it's now hijack Django looks a bit different. Um, the, the, the back end cartridge part is a lot more straightforward than that of Oscar. So you'll see under products, you, you can just add a product here and it's really just a lot less um, options and, and a lot less um, like extra fluff. So so what this does allow you, to, or does, doesn't give you a lot of stuff out of the box, but does allow you to create a basic e-commerce store uh, relatively quickly. Um, and because you've installed the demo product, you can now see some of the, uh, the demo things that have been created with that. So if we go into products and we look at our Django Pony, you'll, you'll now be able to just see all the different things that are being created. So my suggestion would be to go through this, just experiment with it and see what is offered here. Um, there are a couple of packages that you can install for, um, or in fact, a lot of packages that you can install for Cartridge that will give you that extra functionality that Oscar offers out of the box. Um, but obviously if you don't want it, then you don't have to install it. And um, this can be a bit of a pain if you're wanting to install things such as payment gateways, because you'll obviously need to find the specific ones that you want and install those uh, the way that you need to for that. Whereas once you've got Oscar set up, Oscar already has all of that offered to you out of the box. And then again, the rest of this mezzanine is exactly um, as, we, um, as we covered in the uh, previous section. Uh, so this basically does it for um, mezzanine and cartridge. Uh, a lot of this is self-explanatory. I don't feel like I need to go into any more detail than this. Um, so yeah, once you've got this installed, you can obviously fiddle around yourself and, and just see what's going on here. Try try do like a checkout. Um, I'm going to just go by, go to checkout and see what happens. Awesome. See you in the next lecture. Hi, in this section I want to look at um, Sketchless and Sailor. Uh, and I'm not going to go really go into Sketchless because what Sketchless is, is a um, e-commerce system for Python, so not specifically for Django. And Sailor is a framework built on top of the principles used in Sketchless. So essentially these are the same things. Um, if you'd like to go more into the um, the core development of how e-commerce works, then Sketchless may be a better option and that will allow you to completely create your own um, e-commerce setup based off a basic um, Python e-commerce framework. Uh, this is not really what we're going to be going to in this section because um, I don't feel that we're at the level to develop our own e-commerce framework. So for that, I feel that Sailor is a better option um, just between Cartridge, Oscar, and Sailor, I kind of feel like Sailor is the best for me. Uh, it's probably not the most popular, um, although there is a lot of active support, which is really nice. I've actually personally managed to contribute to some of the documentation on this, so that was really cool. Um, and I, I feel that it gives me exactly what I need um, for the um, the workflow that I have. So let's go into the Sailor package. Uh, it doesn't have a documentation link here. What it does have is a link to a GitHub repository. So what I found with Sailor is a lot of this, um, a lot of the, the activity uh, is, is based from and around GitHub. So a lot of the bug requests or the documentation um, all of that is directly linked to GitHub. So let's open up the Get Sailor site. And this is great. So if you do a Google search for Sketchless, Sailor will actually be one of the things that come up because it is um, actively maintained uh, by, by both uh, Sketchless and Sailor uh, developers. Um, so this doesn't really help us. It just gives us a good overview of the product. So feel free to go onto this and just have a look at it. Um, what I do want to do though, 
you see the cello docks. Here we go, this is what I'm looking for. Uh, and then we're going to go to getting started. Lovely. So uh, when I was trying to install Celo initially, um, I noticed that this whole setup is very much um, structured around having Docker set up. So I don't really want to get into what Docker is right now. But one thing that Docker does offer, um, which makes life a lot easier, is uh, Postgres SQL, which is actually a typo here that I made myself, um, which, which still needs to be fixed. But uh, what Postgres SQL is, is just a nice way of doing SQL. And this is required by one of the Python uh, packages that need to be installed. So um, these are some prerequisites that you'll need. So um, Python we have, we know we've got that installed. Pip, we've got it installed. Um, Python package if we're using pip older than that, so we, we don't need this. We have npm, so node, so that's fine. Um, we don't have webpack installed. If, if you have it on your, your PC or your Mac, then that's great, but I just want to go ahead and install webpack globally. So this dash g um, parameter here will just install it globally. So if I go back to my terminal, I've created a set of folder and it doesn't really matter which folder I'm in because I'm installing this globally. Um, so this is nice. So now I'm installing uh, Webpack, which is very similar to uh, the task manager grant that we use. It is also kind of like a task manager, uh, except obviously Sailor has specifically been built with Webpack in mind. And the final thing is Postgres SQL. So uh, there are many different ways that you can install this. I've actually got an app running on my system uh, called Postgres app. And, and that will just just allow me to, to have Postgres. It's, it's very similar to if you had to install MySQL onto your system. Uh, I'm not going to go into how to install that, but it may, might be a good idea to go to this website and then just download the latest version for your operating system. So that's postgresql.org. Cool, great, and here are all, all your options. So let's just go, let's close this tab, uh, close this tab. And let's just go through uh, the requirements for getting started. So we've, we've installed all of these things here on our side. Um, and let's go ahead and install this. So this is very different to the way that we've usually done our installations. Usually we've done it via a pip package. Whereas what this is doing, as I mentioned earlier, is installing a, a git download. So for me personally, I prefer to work on Git because it's something that's actively maintained and the community can contribute to it. Um, and it's very easy to see everything that's going on within it. And at the same time, you can do things like use your own fork of Git so you can actually edit Sailor's code if you want to. And so that's really nice for me. So um, if you don't have Git installed, so it may actually uh, need to be added to this requirements, uh, this prerequisites list, but uh, you can just go ahead and install the git command line tool. So you'll need to actually install that as a um, external package uh, to your command line tool. So um, I'm just going to open up a new tab here. Uh, I'm not going to go to GitHub, I'm just going to go to git. Um, and then uh, maybe downloads is better, so let's go to the downloads on Git, and then if you don't already have it installed, you can follow the installation instructions uh, and just install it on your relevant operating system, and then close out your terminal and then open it again, and then you should have access to the Git uh, command. So I don't really want to get too much into version control right now, uh, but, but essentially what I'm doing is I'm just creating my own version of the code that can be found here. Um, and if we want to actually have a look at that code in our browser, we can just take out the dot .git and go here. And I think we may have opened this earlier. Yes, and now we, we can have a look at this, um, all the files that are included. Yes, you'll notice we've got Docker files, we've got git ignore files, all of this stuff. Cool, so let's go ahead and clone that. So I'm just going to copy this line here, go back into our terminal, and git clone. Uh, dot and what dot is is just the current directory so nothing's in here just yet let's wait for this to finish cloning uh, and then obviously we need to cd into that directory 
and then we do, we need to do our pip install for our requirements. So what if we go back to the uh, GitHub repo here, you will actually see that we have a requirements.txt file. And if we go into that, it will give us a list of all the requirements that we need. So the one that I was talking about where you do need Postgres is, um, starts with a P, P, Y, let's see where it is. No, it doesn't. Um, it's not too, here we go. Oh my goodness, no wonder I couldn't find it. Yeah, so this requires Postgres to be installed. So if you try and run your uh, pip install requirements.txt without um, Postgres installed, this is going to give you an error, which is very confusing. Cool, so yeah, just, just so you know, you do need to have that installed. Okay, fantastic. So now we open up our Sailor uh, file and we can see we have all of the things that uh, Sailor has given us. So if we just had to uh, clone to something else, so we just went like Sailor, it would clone to that file because we did a dot, it now clones it into the actual directory. Okay, lovely. Um, let's go back and let's look at our next instruction that we need. We need to set our secret key. So this is a command line um, command that we'll need to run. So let's just copy that. And my secret key can be anything that I want it to be. So I'm just going to make my secret key hello world. Nobody will ever guess this. And this should be something that nobody can guess because it is related to uh, the security of your site. So that was a terrible secret key that I just created. Cool. And we know how this works. Python migrates a managed up UI migrate. Um, and this is going to run all of the migrations on our site. We are getting a, oopsie, we need to run our pip install requirements.txt. We haven't run that yet. Well, that is awkward. Um, let's just run that. Um, and the, the reason I know this is because it says no module named DJ database URL. And if we actually just go to our requirements file here, we can actually see um, that that DJ database URL is here in our requirements file. So I hope you're kind of getting the hang of how Python works and how uh, all of these things work. A lot of the stuff is being installed from cache for me, so it's gonna take a lot quicker. It's obviously gonna take a lot longer for you. Um, things like Django um, and all the other libraries that we've been using should be prerequis prerequisites for this requirements.txt file. Yeah, there we go, there's pillow. And here's the one that would fail usually if we didn't have Postgres installed. Um, and then our next, we need to run our migrate. So we haven't done that yet. So let's just wait for this to finish installing. Hopefully it is done in the next. Oh my goodness, what on earth is all of this gunk? Okay, so what I suspect this is, is related to the fact that we have not activated our virtual environment, <laughs> as you can see. So that really, really sucks. So let's just, let's just do that quickly. Um, we haven't actually created our virtual environment yet, so I'm going to go virtual env and I'm going to go sal, cool, to creating our virtual environment. And then what I want to do is go ahead and run that. So dot sao pin activate for the thousandth time. Oopsie, it's sao, not sla. Cool, and now we have that running. So now we can run our pip install requirements.txt. And thank goodness for Django uh, caching, because otherwise this would just take forever. Um, and then let's not forget to run this once that is complete. Okay, let me just set my, actually, I think that the export secret key uh, remains active. So this, this command stays constant, even though we've got all those errors. Just wait a few more seconds. 
Great, and this is now successful. I'm very happy with this. So let's paste our manage.py. Should do all of our migrations. Blah, blah, blah. Fantastic. I am super, super happy with that. So uh, just, just the rule, guys, don't forget to activate your virtual environment. So when you're installing this, yeah, it's, it's very, very important. Okay, and then what we're going to do is we're going to run npm install, which um, I, I don't know um, exactly to what level this is right now, but what I'm looking for is a package.json file. Great, and now this is what we fiddled with um, in the last section when we looked at installing SCSS. So obviously these are all the JavaScript and CSS dependencies that, um, that are being used by uh, Sailor. So you'll see things like um, uh, there's Modernizer, there's SAS, which has actually been installed. There's different versions or different, different uh, parts of jQuery. So this is all really, really nice stuff that um, no package manager is using. And usually we would use this with uh, Crunt, but in this case it's going to be Webpack. So instead of a Crunt.js file, we've got a Webpack.config.js file. And again, this is going to run all of our watch, um, all of our builds and all of that. So this is really cool. So let's run our npm install and that's going to target our package.json file. It's going to install all the dependencies within there from the node package manager uh, system. And then we are going to run build assets. Just having a little look at this file here. Uh, while we wait for this to finish downloading. Great, and after a few minutes, it's finished downloading everything. So that's really cool. Uh, let's just go back to our uh, list of requirements. And now let's run our server and see if this actually works. taking a little bit longer. And great, it looks like Sailor is up and running. So this is really cool. Uh, we now have Sailor up and running. Um, what I think we, we may want to do, let's just uh, go back to our browser. I'm gonna, in this tab here, I'm gonna go local, local host. And it's telling us there's a webpack error. So. Um, are you sure webpack has generated the file and the path is correct? No, I'm not sure because we haven't run the webpack command. So let's run our webpack command the same way that we would run our grant command. Another really cool uh, task manager is called Gulp. It's also written in JavaScript the same way that uh, webpack and uh, grant are written in JavaScript. And let's see what this gives us. I'm just going to go back to the site quickly and see if there's anything else that we need to install. Let's let's actually populate our database with some dummy data just to see uh, what it looks like when it has been populated. Cool, and it successfully run our webpack. It's told us how long it's run uh, for 16 seconds, so that's quite a long time, or 16,952 milliseconds. Um, and I. I think we may be able to, I don't know why I copied that. Let's just run our populate DB quickly. And it's populating our database with some dummy data. So that's really nice, creating some dummy products, some dummy users, some dummy orders. And the last thing that I would like to do actually before I try to run the site is we're going to go and create a super user. So manage.py creates super user and email I think that email address is required uh, which uh, because that is the system that uh, Sailor uses to log in great and now let's actually go ahead and run our server so this was a fairly a painless process to set up. Obviously, it had a few more dependencies, and because we were using uh, GitHub as opposed to um, the the regular Python uh, way of doing things, it it was a little bit different, and there were a few more steps. But all in all, it was quite straightforward. 
cool and we successfully have a store up and running and this really looks a lot cooler than the other stores in my opinion just because there's dummy data uh, installed on it so we can go into this and we can have a look at this stuff uh, we can add it to our cart so a lot of this has been set up for you uh, by Sailor so that's really really nice um, and I feel that this is a, a really nice middle ground between Oscar which gives you a lot and um, cartridge which doesn't really give you anything and you need to, to do it yourself so this this gives you enough to to get by but not so much that it becomes overwhelming so uh, let's actually just open up our back end of the site and have a little look at that so I'm going to log in with my credentials that I created uh, oh you need to log in with your email address Cool, and this is a lot simpler than um, than what can be found on the um, on the Oscar one, and it, it, it looks a lot cleaner than the mezzanine one, obviously because it's um, it's not middleware and it's actually just a, a template project, um, so to speak. So you'll notice under products here, we don't have any products. Now this was the first thing that threw me. So you can create categories, but you can't create products. But what I did notice was that when we were running our um, template data install, here are all of our requests that we've made, it did actually create products for us. So what is going on over here? So this relates to uh, one of the earlier issues that we had when creating a Django site. So what's really nice about this as well, like I mentioned, is because it's a template, it's got everything here out of the box. So you can have a look at all of the models. You can edit anything you want to over here. Uh, I wouldn't recommend editing any core stuff. Uh, and again, because it's on GitHub, we're currently sitting, uh, if I open a new tab, you'll see we're currently sitting on a GitHub branch. And we can go ahead and create our own branch off that, push it to GitHub if we've got uh, GitHub set up, a GitHub account. And then we can have template projects set up for ourselves, um, which are kind of extensions um, for uh, Sailor. So what I want to do is I want to go to the product model. Um, so so this, this works very similarly to the way we set up our Django when we first installed it. So opening up the uh, Sailor folder and here are the list of all of our models. So I'm gonna to go to the product model and I'm sure you recognize some of these files, views, uh, URLs, utils, etc., etc. Uh, and then there's actually a models folder, so that's great. Um, and I actually just want to go into the admin so this is one thing that I'm going to need and then the other thing that I'm going to need is I'm looking for a product class great so that's going to be based on py and then product so we want to see where category gets pulled from so uh, from models import product image category and then product so we can actually so it has been created we just haven't been able to see it on the admin side of things uh, and then all I'm going to do is I'm just going to say the same thing, comma product here. Uh, I'm also going to add product image as well because product images are also a separate model to products. Uh, let's we've saved this and let's go ahead and refresh this page. Uh, I think it may be because our server died. Let's check if we've got any typos. Uh, register at most three arguments given five. So Let's take these out and let's just create a new arguments specifically, a new call specifically for that. So I'm going to call product on its own line and I'm going to call product image on its own line. Great. And because our database has been pre populated with this information, uh, we should just be able to see that information sitting there. Fantastic, and now we can see all of our products. So this is really cool, and like I mentioned, it doesn't show this to you. Um, I don't know why uh, Sailor assumes that you don't want to see this out of the box, but um, it, does, it doesn't show it to you out of the box. It only really, really shows you the bare basics, and the same with product images. We can actually go ahead and uh, add and remove images here. And again, because, um, so it may, maybe just an exercise, it's returning product image object. We don't really want to return that we would rather return 
Um, I can see actually why they're doing that because they don't have a title field for this, but image may be a, a better option for that. So um, if we now go into our um, models, our product models, and we have a look at images and product image, and then we had our special string method that we used, which was, I can't spell df, and then underscore underscore str underscore underscore, and then we can say return, I think you need to pass self in here, we can return self dot image. And save that. And let's see if anything breaks. Uh, we probably are because image is not a text field. So let's maybe call something uh, that is a text field. So alt. Let's go to products with images. And because there aren't any alt set up here, we can't actually click on them. So I think that sucks even more. Um, I'm now beginning to understand why they decided to do it the way that they did. But let's just uncomment this for now. Load this again. Go into our short description. Uh, that's not what I want to do. Go to our short description and say, short description of product, save it. So this is obviously now a short description. So I'm just looking for the short description. It's, there we go, short description there. So it is alt. I'm going to use alt here. A very, very roundabout process to try and prove my point here. And there we go, we can now see that what is being returned is short description. So we can edit this as much as we want to. And I feel like the flexibility that Sailor offers you is much greater than that of, um, of Oscar and of um, the other one, which is Cartridge and Mezzanine. Congratulations on completing the Django for WordPress developers course. I hope that you feel more prepared to take on the world of Python and Django. I'm really excited about the future of the framework, and I feel that the current trend that Django and Python is moving towards is one that will only continue to grow from a popularity and accessibility perspective. The basic knowledge of Python and Django that you now possess will give you a competitive advantage in the web development industry. If you would like to find out more about Django or have any questions relating to the framework, the Django users Google group, as well as the Stack Overflow group have active, helpful communities that are sure to orientate you to where you need to go. With that being said, thanks again for taking this course, and this is where I leave you. Cheers.